Audiobook title, Matt, 038, 000 to 91, by Matt Chu 07 Part 01. This work belongs to author, Matt Chu 07. Source, Wattpad.com. Prologue It's a Boy. This is my first time writing a story, so please don't hate this story or my writing. Since this is my first story, this will have mistakes in it, and I apologize in advance for that. All of this story is unedited. If you see any mistakes, please do not hesitate to tell me. Quick A slash N before the story begins, I would like to give a very special shout out to Amarsh1999. Go check out his stories for making the cover page of Matt038. Thanks so much, man. If you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Now on to the story. I hope y'all enjoy. Prologue It's a Boy. Location Soul System. Planet Earth. February 19, 2511. 0420 hours. Chief Petty Officer Tom Preacher Walker was pacing around the waiting room, where he could hear his wife, Lena, giving birth to their first child. Will you calm the fuck down, Preacher? Voodoo asked. You're making my head spin and I'm getting a headache. No, Preacher murmured. I want to be inside that room with her to comfort her. Here her screaming is making my heart break. Lena will be fine, Tom, mother told him. This is what happens when a woman is giving birth. Preacher spun around and snapped, what the hell do you know about what happens when a woman gives birth? You've never even had a child. Mother just simply shrugged. I read up on it in case me and my wife could have kids of our own one day. I wish Rabbit could be here, Tom said as he continued to pace around the waiting room. He would have loved to see this moment. Jack Rabbit Pravden was the only member of their team who was not in the room. He had been Kia on a mission a few months ago. His wife, Claire, had taken the news of her husband's death hard. And now that Claire was expecting her first child in four months and the child would have no father, her husband's death was affecting her a lot harder. Rabbit's remaining three teammates kept visiting her frequently to check on her and the child. Voodoo sighed. Yeah he would, but he would also tell you to calm the hell down and force your ass to sit in a chair. Unfortunately, he's gone and there's no way to bring him back, mother said sadly. Preacher pulled out Rabbit's lucky rabbit foot out of his pocket that he always carried with him. You still have that thing? Mother asked. I thought you gave it to Claire. Preacher looked Mother straight in the eye. I tried to give it to her, but she doesn't want it. She told me that she cries every time she sees that rabbit foot and she couldn't stand to look at it. Claire told me I could keep it. Mother opened his mouth to say something, but decided against it pretty quickly and closed his mouth. Instead, he just nodded his head sympathetically, indicating that he understood. Finally, the doctor came out of the operating room and preacher barreled by him. He entered the room to see his wife holding a baby wrapped in a blue blanket in her arms. It's a boy, Tom, said Lena. A boy. What shall we name him? He asked his wife. I'm thinking. Matthew James Walker, she replied. Matthew that's perfect, honey. Matthew, it is. Tom said as he leaned down and kissed his wife on the cheek. Tom then leaned down and whispered to his wife. I'll be right back. I'm gonna tell mother and voodoo about the baby. Why can't you stay? Lena asked. You know they'll want to know the name and sex of the baby, my love, he said. Lena sighed. Yes, you're right. But please don't be gone too long. Tom leaned down and kissed the baby and then his wife. I won't be gone long. I promise. You better keep that promise, Tom, she scowled at him. You know I never break my promises to you, my love, he said as he exited the room. When he entered the waiting room, mother and voodoo leaped to their feet. Well, Voodoo asked impatiently, what's the name and sex of the baby? It's a boy, he answered. And what's the boy's name? Mother asked, Matthew, Matthew James Walker. Authors note this story was originally posted and started on fanfiction.net, but I decided to move it to Wattpad. Did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 1 Back from the Dead. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 1 Back from the Dead. Location Unknown System. Planet Variant. June 15, 2511. 1,300 hours. 
Petty Officer Jack Rabbit Pravden surveyed the road as he drove. He'd just come home from the hospital. Eight years as a special forces operator and this was his worst time in. He'd been brought into the hospital in critical condition, shot and left bleeding out for hours, he was declared dead. Luckily he was able to be brought back, for his heart has stopped. This wasn't the end of his death however, he was declared dead by ONI, Kia, it rang in his head as he drove on. He was told that he was Kia, according to ONI, after a mission where he and mother, the team leader of AFO Neptune, went to rescue their two teammates, Preacher and Voodoo, from some insurgents. They found the two AFO team members, but Jack was severely injured and passed out from blood loss and everyone thought that he was dead. The truth was, his heart had stopped and he was in a coma for several months. Everyone, including his wife, Claire, and his friends believed he was dead. When he returned to home in Verand after several months in the hospital, his wife was shocked and didn't think it was really him. His wife told him that she had heard what happened to him on that fateful day several months earlier. He sat her down in the living room and told her how he was in a coma and how he had been in the hospital for several months healing. His wife asked if his friends in AFO Neptune knew that he was alive. No, he replied sadly with a shake of his head. Why? His wife asked. Oh and I classified that I'm Kia and I'm not allowed to tell my friends that I'm alive, at least not yet, he told her. Oh honey. I'm so sorry, she said, oh, I just remembered something, come with me, she said taking his hand and dragging him upstairs to the second floor. Right before they entered a room his wife said, shhhhh, be quiet or you'll wake her. Her? He asked. He remembered that right before he left to fight insurrectionists his wife had told him that she was pregnant, but she never told him what gender the baby was. Yes, she. It was a girl, she answered. Remember the names we talked about when we said that if the baby was a girl? She asked him. Yes, if I remember correctly, we wanted the girl to be named Linda, he replied. Claire opened the door, and in the corner was the crib and inside the crib was a baby girl. Claire picked her up and handed her to Jack. She's beautiful, Claire, he said. Yes, she is. She has your green eyes and my red hair. His wife put the baby back in the crib and they silently exited the room. Downstairs, the communicator chirped. Claire went and picked up the communicator. Hello. Dusty, it's been a while. Listen, I have someone here who I think that you would like to talk to you, she said. She handed the communicator Jack. Hello, he said. He heard a gasp on the other end. Jack exclaimed Dusty, we thought you were dead, buddy. Dead? Not even close, he answered. Tell me how you're alive, Dusty told the same story that he had told his wife an hour ago. Damn, that's crazy a story, man, Dusty replied when he was finished. Listen, Dusty, you can't tell anyone that I'm alive. Yeah I know, the AFO Wolfpack member said, sometimes I wanna go and punch every single person at ONI in the face. I hear ya, man, he chuckled, no one knows I'm alive except you and Claire Dusty, he said, can you keep a secret? I trust you. Of course I can, rabbit, he answered. Can you keep me informed on Neptune's missions for me since I can't talk with them? He asked. Sure, glad to, Dusty replied. Okay thanks, man. I knew I could count on you, he answered. No problem bud. Isn't that what friends are for? Dusty said with a chuckle. Jack laughed, yep, sure is. All right, I gotta go. I'll talk to later, Dusty said. Yeah, we sure will, bye. Good to hear from you again. I'll keep you updated on Neptune's missions for you. Talk to you later Dusty replied. Jack hung up the communicator with a smile on his face. Authors note I want to give a very special thank you to Amarsh1999 for helping me edit the beginning of this chapter. Thanks so much, did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 2 Lone Survivor Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 2 Lone Survivor Six years later Location Soul System, Planet Earth, August 19, 2517 1435 hours now, six-year-old Matthew Walker or better known as Matt was walking home from school after a long day at school. The year was 2517, and in 2514 his sister, 
Rachel Luara Walker, was born. In 2516, his second sister was born, Sarah Allison Walker. When he arrived home, he was immediately assaulted with a hug from his sister Rachel. Hello big brother she said. There's the best sister in the world, he replied as he gave her a kiss on the forehead. Oh, there you are, son. You arrived just in time to start dinner, his father said. Matt looked up to see his father standing in the doorway of the kitchen. Hi dad, he said. He walked over to his father and gave him a big hug. After that, he went and washed his hands and sat down at the table waiting for dinner to start. His mother had cooked roast beef and veggies for dinner. The entire family sat down to eat. Little Sarah had to mushy baby food since she was only a year old. So, how was school? His mother asked. Good mom. We learned math today, he replied. Excellent, his mother said cheerfully. She flashed Matt's dad a broad smile, then went back to eating. After dinner was over, he went upstairs to start his homework. He finished just in time it was time for bed. He and Rachel both brushed their teeth and got into bed. His parents put Sarah in her crib. Later that night, 2,200 hours, Matt was sleeping in his bed when he was abruptly awoken and taken to the kitchen where he saw his father, mother, and Rachel tied to chairs, their wrists tied behind their backs. The men who had woken him quickly tied him up before the surprised family could object. What the hell do you want, Major? His father asked the men, staring pleadingly at his son. Oh, nothing really, the men answered. I just want you dead. Why? His father asked again after a short period of silence. Simple, the Major replied. When you die I'll move up and take your spot. Matt knew what was going on. His father was a colonel in the UNSC military. You're trying to take power, aren't you? His mother said. Yeah, you can say that. You can also say that I'm very thorough. I don't leave witnesses, the men said. Go to hell, Major. And if you want my kids dead, you'll have to go through me, his father spat. You're in no position to help your kids, Colonel the men replied smugly. He then pulled out a handgun and put it against Matt's stomach. Don't you dare pull that trigger, his mother growled. If you do, I'm gonna kill you, his father hissed. Too late, the major said simply. He pulled the trigger and Matt screamed in pain. He then aimed at Rachel and fired. The bullet hit her in the forehead, sending brain matter and bone all over the wall and floor. You son of bitch, his father shouted. You a dead man, you hear me? A dead man. The men laughed maliciously and shot Matt again in the chest. No, his mother yelled. He then shot his mother in the leg and she howled in pain. How dare you, his father yelled. The major strode over to Matt, making sure to take his time, and shot him in the back, right where the bullet in his chest had exited. Don't you see? The men asked, if you talk, someone is going to get shot. If I survive today, bitch, his father hissed. I'm coming after you and putting a bullet through your fucking head. I don't think so, the men made a sound Matt recognized as something only an insane person would make. He then again shot his mother in the same spot as he had shot his sister. He came back to Matt and shot him in the leg. Matt winced in pain but didn't scream. This is what you get for calling me bitch, Colonel, the men said. He went over to his father and shot him right between the eyes, killing him instantly. Matt's vision began to blur. The last thing he remembered before blacking out was his body hurting in severe pain. Then he felt himself being thrown to the ground. He turned his head ever so slightly and saw the unidentified men doing the same thing he had done to him with his parents and sister. The men turned around and walked out of the room. He came back a few minutes later with what looked like a red gasoline can, at least from what Matt could distinguish, it looked like a gasoline can. Matt then heard the pop of the can opening and the men pouring the liquid from the can onto his body. He then heard the men say, now there is no one that can stop me from getting this position. It is mine. Have a nice stay in hell, Colonel. The men lit a cigarette and flipped it onto the gasoline-covered bodies. The last thing Matt heard was the unidentified men mutter, well, that's one less loose end. The last thing Matt felt before passing out was the insane amount of pain he was experiencing, was the flames licking his body and slowly killing him. Several days later, Location Soul System, Planet Earth, Hospital on Earth, August 22, 2517, 1,030 hours. Matt woke up in a hospital room several days later. He saw a woman that looked familiar standing over him. The woman had red hair and blue eyes. She gasped and shouted, Dr. Nurse, he's awake. A doctor and a nurse came in. How are you feeling? The doctor asked calmly. Ugh, 
It hurts everywhere, Matt groaned. Well, you were severely burned when you were found and you had been shot in four locations, the doctor said. You were in bad shape. Someone shot you four times and then threw gasoline on you and lit you on fire, said the nurse. You had to be given a special medication to help you heal your wounds, especially from the third-degree burns that covered your body when we found you. Matt thought about that in silence as the doctor checked him out and the nurse asked him politely if he wanted anything. Some water would be nice, he answered. Okay, I'll be right back, she replied. She came back a few minutes later with a cup of water. Thank you, miss, he said. You're welcome, honey, she said as she smiled at him. He drank the water and then fell asleep for a few hours. When he woke up, a man and a woman were sitting in chairs beside his bed. Oh good, you're awake, the woman said. Who are you? He asked. We're friends of your parents, the man answered. Did you know my parents? He asked the man. Yes, the woman said. Very well, as a matter of fact. We're sorry for your loss. The woman then gave him a silver coin. Thank you, miss, Matt murmured quietly. He looked at the woman again and then suddenly felt a sharp prick on the side of his neck, then everything went black. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 3 Now the training begins. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 3 Now the training begins. Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, September 24, 2517, 0530 hours. Wake up recruit a voice in his ear shouted. Matt groaned and rolled over on his cot. Suddenly, he yelped in surprise and tumbled to the floor. I said wake up recruit do you know which way up is? The voice said again. He looked up to see a man in a camouflage uniform standing over him. I am Chief Petty Officer Mendez. A voice to his left boomed. The rest of these men are your instructors and you will follow everything we tell you at all times. You will now head aft to the showers and then return and dress. The instructor above him opened a trunk at the foot of Matt's cot and pulled out a pair of gray sweats. Matt looked closer and saw his name marked on the chest Matthew 038. On the double Mendez cried, move 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 the instructor tapped in between his shoulder blades with a baton. Matt then realized that the baton contained electricity and double-timed it to the showers, Wash then returned to his bunk and put on underwear, thick socks, and a pair of combat boots that fit his feet just right. After, they were filed outside into five rows of fifteen. They did one hundred jumping jacks, one hundred sit-ups, and leg lifts. Finally, they got water bottles and he gulped down the warm and slightly salty water. Then, they all ran to a building that said Naval Officers Academy stenciled over the entrance. A woman was standing at the top step waiting for them. She had a white sheet wrapped around her body, but then he realized that the woman was an AI. Welcome. My name is Deja and I will be your teacher. Please come in. The class is about to start, the AI said. Several kids groaned and grumbled, but Matt didn't complain. He actually liked school. If you prefer to skip class, you continue morning calisthenics, Deja said. They all double-timed it up the stairs and a tray was set up for each of them that held a carton of milk and crackers. Matt wolfed down the stale crackers and gulped down the milk. Deja began telling them about a battle where 300 had fought against thousands of Persian infantry. A holographic countryside popped up in the classroom and the children walked the miniature mountains and watched the illusionary sea lap their boots. Deja then explained that the narrow strip of land between the steep mountains and the sea was known as watched as thousands of soldiers marched towards the 300 soldiers, who guarded the pass. Deja said that the 300 soldiers were called Spartans and they had been the best soldiers who had ever lived. The Spartans had been trained to fight since they were children and that no one could beat them. That's it for today, Deja said. We'll continue tomorrow, but now it's time for you to go the playground. Playground. Hooray, Matt thought as the kids all ran outside. Outside, Chief Petty Officer Mendez and the trainers were waiting for them. Time for the playground. It's a short run. Fall in, Mendez said. The short run was actually turned out to be two miles. Mendez then instructed them to form three lines, which they formed without comment or fuss. The first person in each row will be team number one, Mendez said. The second person in each row team number two, and so on. If you do not understand this, speak up now. 
No one said anything. Matt looked to his right and saw a boy with black hair and brown eyes and gave him a weary smile. The name on the sweat top was William 043. In the row beyond William was a girl. She had red and green eyes. Linda 058 and she didn't look happy to see him. Today's game is called Ring the Bell, Mendez explained. There are many ways to get to the bell. I am going to leave it up to each team to find their own way and when every member of your team has rung the bell, you are to get ground side double time and run back across the finish line. The bell sat atop the highest pole on the playground. Mendez then grabbed his baton and scratched a straight line in the sand. Mendez then said that the winning team gets dinner tonight, which was roast turkey, gravy, and mashed potatoes, corn on the cob, brownies, and ice cream. Mendez then explained that there are winners and there are losers. The last team to finish goes without food, Mendez said. All the kids looked at each other warily. Make ready, Mendez said. I'm Will, the boy whispered to Matt and the girl on their team. She said, I'm Linda. Matt just looked at both of them and said nothing. Go Mendez shouted. All the kids started running. They came in third. In the end, only team three didn't get to eat, which consisted of John 117, Sam 034, and Kelly 087. In the morning, they did more calisthenics and running the entire morning. Then class until the afternoon. Today Deja taught them about wolves. The wolves worked as a pack when they hunted. After, they went outside to the playground again, but there were fewer bridges and more complicated ropey ampoli systems. The bell was now placed 20 meters higher than any of the others. Same teams as yesterday, Mendez announced. We did great yesterday, Will said. Yep we sure did, Matt replied. Same plan as last time, Linda asked. Yeah, same plan as yesterday, Matt said. Go Mendez cried. All the kids took off. This time they finished in second place, just in front of team three. Awesome job guys, Will said, if you want we can be friends. Linda shrugged and answered, sure. Okay, Matt said. Friends. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 4 Marksman Training. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 4 Marksman Training. Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, en route to Reach Military Base, October 22, 2519, 0630 hours. Matt held on tightly as the dropship accelerated towards a military compound. Chief Mendez walked in the passenger compartment of the dropship. When Matt, he rose and saluted. When the chief saw him he said, at ease number 038 and sit down. We have a lot to discuss. He snapped off a, yes sir, to the chief and sat down once again. When he had sat down the chief finally spoke, today trainee, you will be traveling to a military compound to train you to become a marksman. You will also learn how to use a sniper rifle, as well. Sir, may I ask why? He asked, certainly. You have very sharp and clear eyesight. This can enable you to shoot long distance targets, the chief replied. Sir, is a marksman the same thing as a sniper? He asked. It is similar in the fact that a marksman is more suited to staying with a squad and providing fire to medium to long range targets. A sniper, on the other hand, carries a rifle and will stay in a position to watch over his or her team from afar and provide fire from long range. Does that answer your question, trainee? Mendez said. Matt was silent for a moment, comprehending what he had just heard, then he spoke, Yes sir, it does thank you. You're welcome, the chief replied. As they flew over the flat land, he looked out the window of the dropship and saw a military compound in the distance. He asked, Sir, who am I meeting with? Mendez hesitated for a split second then replied, A marksman. He'll teach you how to become one. Is he good, sir? He asked. Mendez was silent for a moment then said, Oh, he's more than just a good trainee. He's one of the best marksmen, if not the best that the UNSC has ever had. Reach military base. Thirty minutes later, Lieutenant Jack, Rabbit, Pravdin stood on top of the landing pad waiting for the incoming dropship to drop off its passenger. According to ONI, he was supposed to a Spartan to become a marksman and sniper. The Spartan's number was 038. From what Chief Petty Officer Mendez had told him, 
This particular Spartan had incredible eyesight, the best out of all of the 75 Spartan II candidates. A few minutes later the dropship landed and Chief Mendez and a young boy hopped out. He saw the boy's face. His eyes widened slightly when he saw the face. The boy had Lena's eyes and Tom's hair. He remembered Dusty telling him that Tom had a son and two daughters. Tom's first daughter was killed just over two years ago with a bullet hole in her forehead. Tom's other daughter was missing. No one knew where she was. Tom, Lena, Rachel, and their son Matt were all said to be killed when their house was burned down by unknown persons. There were reports of one person surviving the fire and that was a young male. The chief and the young boy looked so much like his friend and his friend's wife walked over to him. Mendez saluted, Lieutenant. He returned the salute, Chief. He looked to Mendez's left and saw the young boy. The boy saluted him, Lieutenant, Sir. Again, he returned the salute, Spartan, it's good to finally meet you. Mendez said, it looks like you're in good hands here, trainee. Good luck. Thank you, Chief, the boy replied. Mendez then spun around and boarded the dropship. It took off and flew back to where it had come from. Jack looked at the young boy and said, I am Lieutenant Jack Pravden, Spartan. I will be training you on how to become a marksman and sniper. Is there a particular name that you prefer to go by, Spartan? The boy replied, Matt, sir. It's what my friends call me. Okay, Matt, he replied. First off, though, I need to tell you some things. I'm listening to you, sir, Matt said. First thing, there is no need to call me, sir. I prefer Lieutenant or as my friends call me, Jack. I'm also sometimes called by my codename, Rabbit. Second thing you don't have to salute me, he said. Matt nodded then said, fair enough Lieutenant. Okay, we'll go now for a tour of the compound. Follow me, he said. He showed Matt the barracks, showers, mess hall, and the other things that the compound had. After that, they went to the mess hall to eat lunch. Okay Matt after lunch we will begin your marksman training, he told the young Spartan. Okay, yes I mean Jack, the boy replied. He nodded then said, good you're learning. In time you will learn how to snipe, how to stay with a team and be a marksman like I was, and I will teach you stalking. The boy looked confused, stalking lieutenant. I've never heard of that. Would you mind providing me with a definition? Jack looked at the boy and smiled, no I don't mind. Stalking is where you approach an area stealthily so that no one can hear or see you. Stalking can be a very hard process to learn, so I will teach you in steps. Okay, Lieutenant, I'll try my best to follow what you teach me, the boy replied. Good, he said. After lunch, he took Matt into a classroom and taught him about the different close, medium, and long-range weapons that the UNSC had currently. The weapon he taught Matt the most about though was the sniper rifle. The sniper rifle is main long-range weapon used by the UNSC, he said. He picked up a sniper rifle sitting on a table near him and he handed the weapon to the young Spartan. Reach military base armory. Five minutes later, Jack led Matt into the armory. This building housed a collection of weapons, ranging from assault rifles to sidearms. Jack walked over to where the sniper rifles were held and picked one off the rack it was on and showed it to Matt. This here is the SRS-99. It is an anti-material rifle that is semi-automatic and gas-operated, which fires 14.5 by 114 mm rounds. The rifle has a four-round detachable box magazine. This is a very powerful rifle and this is also the sniper used by the UNSC Defense Force, Jack said to Matt as he handed the young boy the rifle. Matt took the rifle from the LT, turning the rifle every which way and inspected it. I assume you know how to dismantle, reassemble, clean, load, and fire a firearm, am I correct? Jack asked. Yes, Lieutenant, he replied. Now show the where the scope is, the LT said. Matt pointed to the top of the rifle where the scope was located. Good. Now where do you grip the rifle? The LT asked. Matt pointed to the trigger handle and the place under the scope. Excellent work. Now show me the muzzle. He pointed out every part that the lieutenant told him to. Now remember, there are advantages and disadvantages to every firearm, Jack said. Lieutenant, if you don't mind me asking, what are the advantages and disadvantages to the SRS-99? Matt said. Yes, certainly, the LT replied. The advantages for the SRS-99 are as followed extremely high stopping power, the ability to take out almost any target at any range and the ability to take out targets at medium to long range. The disadvantages are as followed slow reload time, small magazine size, 
heave recoil, slow rate of fire, it is a terrible weapon to have in close quarters, and last but not least, there is a bullet trail that could be traced back to a sniper's location. Does that answer your question? Matt nodded and said, yes, lieutenant. Good you're learning quickly, Matt, perhaps maybe too quickly. Jack chuckled, now follow me. We're going to the range to how well you can fire the rifle. Matt followed the LT outside to an area of flat land. In the distance, he could small shapes that looked like human bodies. Those aren't real human bodies, are they, lieutenant? He asked. No, they're not. They are plastic targets, Jack replied, now set up and get ready to shoot. I will call what target to shoot and what the range is. You can usually tell the range by using the electronics programmed into the scope, but the purposes of this exercise, I disabled it so that you get a feeling of having to shoot a rifle if the electronics are disabled or perhaps broken. Oh, and Matt. Yes, Lieutenant. The young boy replied as he looked back at his trainer. One last thing. Remember that a sniper rifle like the SRS-99 has a slight travel time over greater distances, which means that you may have to aim above or below your target to make sure the bullet land in the place you want it to land. And sometimes if your target is moving, you may have to lead your target if the target is on the move. Now lay down prone by the sandbags and wait for me to call out targets. You got it, lieutenant, the young boy said. Matt lay prone by the sandbags and waited for the lieutenant to call out targets. First target, 500M, 11 o'clock. Jack called out, hit excellent shot. Matt waited for another bullet to cycle through the rifle. Next target, 750M, 12 o'clock. Jack said, hit again. Matt waited for the LT to call out the next target. Next target, 900M, 2 o'clock. The LT cried out, hit. Matt hit the remaining seven targets with incredible accuracy. Holy shit, Jack murmured. What is it LT? He asked. Jack turned the datapad towards him and Matt saw that he had hit all ten targets dead center and got a bullseye every shot. Son, I think you've got the best goddamn sniping skills I've ever seen in my entire life, Jack said with a big smile on his face. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 5 The Silent Type Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 5 The Silent Type Location Beta and Terry System, Emerald Cove, December 9, 2520 1,700 hours, 9-year-old Matt 038 surveyed his team of 74 other 9-year-olds, scattered around the beach on the island they were hiding out on. He was sitting around a fire with his two best friends, Will 043 and Naomi 010. They had come to the island after ditching Chief Mendez. They were originally on an underwater training mission, but the chief had sabotaged half their air tanks. In return, the Spartans had taken his tanks and they swam out to this island. Fred had gathered some clams from the bottom of the ocean and some fish he had killed using an improvised combat knife he made from one of the air tanks. When was the last time we relaxed like this? Naomi asked as she pried open a clam she was holding. I think this is the first, said Will. Let's hope it isn't the last, said Matt. He took another look around his fellow Spartans, most were gathered around the other fires, but then Matt noticed someone sitting near the palm trees, alone. Matt instantly recognized it was Linda by her close-cropped, blood-red hair. She always stood out in front of the others because of this feature. She was cradling in her arms an SRS-99 CS2 that she had swiped from one of the crates at the chief staging area. Why is Linda all by herself? Matt asked Will. She's been like that for a couple of weeks, ever since that last capture the flag exercise, Will replied. I'm going to talk to her, said Matt. Don't, warned Naomi. I heard that Sam went to talk to her once and she got so mad she hit him. Matt dismissed the rumors and promptly stood up and left the warmth of the fire. Even though she was on the same team with him and Will when they first met, Linda was still the one he knew the least. He always hung around Will and Naomi, but he didn't talk much. As he approached her Matt realized he didn't know what to say so he started with something simple. What are you doing out here all alone? He asked. What does it look like? Linda answered without even looking up at him. You can barely hold the thing you know, said Matt as he sat down next to her, and I bet the scope fried and it's so waterlogged it won't even fire. Yes you're right, the scope is fried, 
said Linda confirming Matt's suspicions, but the rest is perfectly airtight. It can still fire provided I had any ammo for it. So, I was wondering, why are you out here all by yourself? Matt asked. I like being by myself, she replied. Matt knew her better than that. She was hiding something. I heard you've been by yourself since the last Capture the Flag game, said Matt. Did something happen? No, she answered harshly. Just tell me, he said. Let me help you. No. Please? Ugh, fine, she grumbled as she set the rifle down in front of her. During the Fajad and I were on the same team. He and I slipped past the line and Kelly saw us, you know how fast she is. She was about to get me so I pushed Fajad into her and managed to grab the flag. Later when I was alone Fajad confronted me. It got into a fight really quickly and he ended up pushing me into the side of one of the bunks, and that's how I got this, she pointed to a fresh scar on her left jawline. As soon as I got cut he suddenly started playing nice, but I smacked him the stomach and ran off. I started crying and Dr. Halsey found me and stitched me up. Matt noticed she started to cry a little so he went to put an arm around her shoulder, but Linda shoved him away. I don't need your pity, she said. Deja said we should put our feelings aside, and how am I supposed to be a Spartan if I cry like this? It's just normal, Matt replied. So if you cry a little, it shows that you're a person. Linda finally met Matt's gaze and she smiled. Thanks, she whispered. You're welcome. I'll look after you and make sure Fajad or anyone else doesn't bother you, said Matt. Promise? Linda asked. Promise, Matt replied. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 6 Augmentation Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 6 Augmentation Location Epsilon Eridani System, ONI Medical Facility, in orbit around planet Reach. March 9, 2525, 1130 hours. Matt was pacing up and down in his room at the ONI Medical Facility on Reach. He was wearing his black uniform which had told everyone his rank and number, Petty Officer 2nd Class, Matt 038. The Spartans were told that something special was going to happen today but they had no idea what was going on. Finally, after a few minutes, Dr. Halsey entered the room. How are you Matt? She asked. Fine doctor, he replied. Are you ready? Ready for what, ma'am? For your augmentations. Today you will become a true Spartan. Ma'am, is this the final stage? Yes, it is indeed. Are you ready? Matt closed his eyes for a brief moment, let out a breath. This is it. The moment of truth, he thought. He then said, ready as I'll ever doctor. Excellent follow me, Dr. Halsey said and motioned Matt to follow. They walked down the hall to an elevator and took it to the medical wing, where Halsey escorted Matt to a surgical bay. Put this on, she said holding a hospital gown in front of him. Yes ma'am, said Matt as he took the gown and went behind a curtain and changed out his black uniform and put on his gown. He came out and handed the uniform to Halsey before he laid down on the surgical bed. Matt winced very slightly as the doctors inserted an four into his arm which held a sedative inside. How are you feeling? Halsey said after a few minutes. I'm fine ma'am, Matt answered groggily. The nurse said the sedative should take effect soon. I'm fighting to see how long I can stay awake. His eyelids fluttered slightly. It's not easy. Matt spotted Chief Mendez coming up behind Halsey and he struggled to sit up and raise his arm to salute the chief but failed. I know this has to be another one of the chief's exercises, but I don't know what the twist is. The chief always told me I'll win. Can you tell me, Dr. Halsey? Just time. How do I win? Matt saw Chief Mendez look away as a breathing mask was put over his face and a horizontal laser started moving across his whole body. Dr. Halsey leaned down closer to Matt as he closed his eyes and started to breathe deeply. I'll tell you how you win, Matt, she whispered quietly. You have to survive. That was the last thing Matt heard before the sedative took effect. Before he fully he lost conesiousness, he thought what did Dr. Halsey mean by, I have to survive. Only later would Matt find what Dr. Halsey truly meant by that attainment. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 7 First Mission 
Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 7 First Mission Location UNSC Destroyer Pioneer, en route to Eridina System, September 12, 2525, 0605 hours. Matt was one of the lucky ones to survive the augmentations months ago. He was one of the first to wake up from his augmentations. Others though weren't so lucky. A total of 30 had died from the augmentation procedures and another 12 were discharged after failing the augmentation procedures, most becoming severely crippled. Matt heard that the majority of these former candidates were later reassigned to ONI. Now it was time for their first mission as Spartans. Linda was sitting in the Spartan barracks room meditating, practicing Zen, and preparing herself for the upcoming mission in which she was selected to go on. She opened her eyes and saw Matt sitting across from her doing the same as she was. She glanced at the clock that was resting above the doorway. The clock read 0605 hours, almost time for the first mission to start. The Spartans had been briefed and John had selected Sam, Kelly, Fred, Matt, and Linda on a mission to capture Colonel Robert Watts, an insurrectionist leader. Linda got to her feet and touched Matt on the shoulder. Time to get ready for the op, he asked with his eyes still closed. Yep, she replied. Matt stood up and stretched. They then met up with the others and they all walked to Weapons Locker. Inside, they found an array of combat equipment. On a table in the room, there were guns, knives, communications gear, body armor explosives, medical packs, survival gear, portable computers, and even a thruster pack to make maneuvering in space easier. Fred sat on the ground and started twirling a combat knife, which was razor-edged sharp. Kelly walked around the table and held up a pair of Gria's stained overalls that had her name on it. Are these our new uniforms? She asked. Oh and I gave them to us, Matt heard John reply. They're supposed to match what the crew of the Laden wears. They don't give a girl that much to work with, Kelly said as she held up the overalls and inspected them. Here, try this on, Linda said. She held up a black bodysuit to Kelly's long slender frame. The bodysuits were form-fitting, lightweight polymer body armor. The suit could deflect small caliber rounds and had a refrigeration slash heating units that would mask infrared signatures. The helmets had encryption and communications gear, a heads-up display, and thermal and motion detectors. The helmets were also sealed tight and the unit had a 15-minute reserve of oxygen to let the wearer survive in a vacuum. All the Spartans disliked the bodysuits because they were uncomfortable and they were also tricky to repair in the field and the suits always needed repairs. What weapons do we use? Matt asked. 390 caliber, Fred said, but from the tone of his voice, he didn't sound very confident. Yes, John answered. Everyone take .390 caliber ammunition so that we can share clips if we have to. Except for Linda and Matt. Linda saw Matt walk over to the crate. She followed behind him. He popped the lid off of the crate and he reached in and pulled out an SRS-99 CS-2 AM. He smiled and reached into the crate and pulled out another of the matte black long-barreled rifles and handed her the rifle. Here you go, he said. Thanks, she replied. The sniper rifle weapon system had a modular selection scopes, stocks, barrels, and even the firing mechanism could be swapped. Matt picked up a sniper rifle for himself and started to modify it for the mission. He attached a flash and sound suppression barrel. He also increased the ammunition caliber to .450 to compensate for the lower muzzle velocity. He and Linda both settled for an integrated link to their helmet's heads-up display instead of using sights and scopes. Linda pocketed five extended ammunition clips. Linda saw Matt grab seven extended ammunition clips and she asked, Why are you grabbing so many? Matt looked at her and shrugged. In case we need to share clips. You can never be sure sometimes. I like to come prepared in case I do need extra ammo and if something goes wrong. Nothing will go wrong, Linda replied. Matt shrugged again. You never know what could happen during the mission. He wanted to bring the two handcrafted cookery knives that Jack had taught him how to create, but decided against it because he wanted to remain inconspicuous and blend in with the rest of the team. The rest of the team took an MA-2B, a cut-down version of the standard issue MA-5B assault rifle. It was tough and reliable, with electronic targeting and an ammo supply indicator. It also had a recoil reduction system and could deliver an impressive 15 rounds per second. John picked up a 20-centimeter knife and the panic button. It was a tiny single-shot emergency beacon. 
It had two sets, a red and a green setting. The red setting alerted the pioneer that things hit the fan and come in guns blazing. The green setting marked the location of the base for later assault by the UNSC. Kelly took a small computer with IR links, and she also had their field medical kit. Fred took a standard issue lock breaker. Linda picked up three NAV transmitters, each the size of a tick. The markers could be placed on an object and could broadcast the location to the Spartans' heads-up displays. Sam hefted two medium-sized backpacks that were filled with enough C-12 explosives to blow through three meters of battleship armor plate. You have enough? Kelly asked him wryly. Sam replied and smiled what? Do you think I should bring more? Nothing like a little firework to celebrate the end of a mission. Matt chuckled. I think he has plenty, but a pack or two more wouldn't hurt. Everyone ready? John asked. Sam wiped the smile off of his face and slapped a clip into his MA-2B. Ready. Kelly gave John a thumbs up. Fred, Linda, and Matt all nodded. Then let's go to work, John said. Location Eridanus System, Eridanus 2 Space Dock, Civilian Cargo Ship Laden. September 14, 2525. 1,210 hours. As Matt lay on his rig of support nets inside the Laden's water tank, he couldn't help but remember and reflect on all the things he had learned from Jack, Rabbit, Pravden over the past five. Almost six years that the young Spartan had been trained by the skilled UNSC soldier. He had told Matt that he could call him Rabbit if he wanted to. Over the years Matt had called him that several times, but he mostly stuck to Lieutenant or Jack. Jack had also told him that a certain Spartan with blood red hair and green eyes, Linda, was his daughter. He told him when she was born, where she was born, and a bunch of other stuff. He took him to see his wife, Claire, and his kids. Matt enjoyed meeting his mentor's wife and kids. They were all very nice and friendly, but they were also very protective of each other. Matt became friends with all of his mentor's kids. He also made Matt promise to keep a secret that Linda was his daughter, and Matt said he would not tell a single soul, which he hadn't since the day he found out and probably would never tell unless Jack gave him permission. A sniper doesn't get much sleep when in the field, he had told him, grab it whenever possible and always be alert. Matt had learned to sleep with one eye open to stay alert, and that was how he was sleeping now. Linda saw Matt sleeping with one eye open and wondered why he was doing that. She tapped him on the shoulder. Matt felt a tap on should and turned to see who had tapped him. It was Linda. You need something, he whispered. Yes, she replied. I was wondering why you sleep with one eye open. Matt figured someone would ask him that question one day and answered, I sleep that way to stay alert in case I need to react quickly. In training with another sniper, I learned that sleeping with one eye open can increase your state of alertness. Also, some UNSC snipers have been killed on missions for falling asleep with both eyes closed, with their throats slit open. I don't want to be killed at all, especially at night, so that is why I sleep the way I do. Is that all you wanted to ask? Linda thought about what he had just told her. Interesting, she thought to herself, I wonder who trained him. Linda said, who was this man who trained you? Matt opened his mouth and shut it and thought, what would Jack want me to say to her if she asked me this? He answered with a smile, someone special, a very good sniper, maybe even one of the best snipers the UNSC has ever had. He trained me personally for five years, almost six years. I learned a lot from him, possibly more than Chief Mendez and the trainers taught us. He has been fighting rebels for a long time. Linda thought for a second then said, he must have been a good trainer. Matt gave her a small smile and replied, oh, he was more than just good. He was the best. Now, we better get some sleep. We have Overwatch later and then the mission. He rolled onto his back and fell asleep instantly with one eye closed. You're right, Linda whispered. She then rolled onto her back and tried to sleep with one eye open, but failed. She settled for sleeping with both eyes closed. Maybe Matt could teach me how to sleep with one eye open. I'll have to ask him after the mission, she thought before she fell asleep. A few hours later, the team left the water tank with Kelly leading the way. They had donned their helmets and walked out of the Laden's water tank and into the rebel base. Look over there, said Sam as he pointed to the public showers and everyone followed him inside. John led the way to the farthest locker room. Linda sat on the bench closest to the door and watched their six and would warn them if anyone was coming. Why are we in here? Matt thought. He then asked, what do we do about this place? I say we make this the fallback point if shit hits the fan, Sam said. I agree.
John said. Now when we grab Colonel Watts, there's no way we're going to be able to smuggle him back to the Leyden's water tank. How about the pelican out there? Fred and Matt said in unison. Linda resisted the urge to laugh at how the two guys thought the same thing at the same exact time, and then said good idea, but what about the doors? Sam hefted his pack of explosives and said I've got that covered. Matt held back the urge to smile and thought to himself, you've always got our back, Sam. John put on his helmet and checked the location of the cigars. He then stowed it away in his duffel and they began to move out into the main city. They found the cargo tram carrying the cigars and followed at a discreet distance. Matt studied the way the team was moving and said, we're too close together, we're drawing too much attention. I suggest that we spread out. They all followed his directions and Linda took a position next to Matt and the others kept a good distance apart from each other. The tram finally stopped at the entrance to a large hotel. John gave Kelly the signal to move through the doors. Kelly incapacitated the first guard and John got the other guard. Matt, Linda, and Fred followed them inside and took off their overalls. Linda pulled out the NAV marker and saw that the market was moving up and said NAV marker moving. Mark 270, elevation 10 meters, 20, 35 and holding. I guess that would be the top floor. Sam came in and closed the door behind him. All clear outside, he said. Kelly finished picking the lock. Doors open, she said. Go, John ordered. Kelly opened the door and she, John, and Linda eliminated the guards by the front desk and the elevator. Fred went to all and bodies and searched them, then dragged them behind the counter. Matt assisted him. Meanwhile, Kelly went to the stairwell, opened the door, and gave the all-clear signal. A few floors from the top, John had them move to the elevator shaft. Before going inside, John had them activate the cooling units in their suits and then Sam Pride opened the elevator doors, revealing the shaft. When they had all made it to the top floor, John and Sam took up positions on either side of the elevator door. Kelly and Fred got on the other side of the shaft facing the door, Linda hung upside down above the elevator door, with Matt hanging upside down next to her. John was hanging onto the cable with one arm and holding his MA-2B in the other. John gave Sam the signal to open the doors and he complied. What happened next was so fast that the guards didn't have any time to react as Linda, Matt, and the others all opened fire with their weapons and all the guards dropped the floor, dead. As they were excited the elevator shaft, Matt reflected on what had just happened moments ago and didn't feel remorse or guilt and neither did any of the others. When they reached Watt's apartment, John kicked the door in and entered the room with Kelly right behind him. Fred and Sam entered right after them. When Matt heard a single gunshot and prepared for the worst. When he entered, Matt saw the three dead guards and saw John collapsed over a strangling Watts. Linda walked in, covering their six and saw what had happened. She saw John collapsed on the ground and she heard Fred say no exit wound, the bullet's still in there and he's bleeding internally he told Kelly as she walked over to him. Here Kelly, give me the sedative. I'll inject him Matt said. Kelly handed him the sedative and he walked over and sedated Watts. Have a good nap, asshole, he thought. This is going to sting, Kelly said as she inserted the nozzle of the biofoam into his wound and filled it with polymer. Sam came back and said that men were entering the building. Get Watts into the crate, John said as Fred helped him up. Kelly rigged a decent line on the balcony and after fastening the crate to it they lowered it down to the alley. They then all rappelled down the line to the alley, changed into their coveralls, then Sam and Fred picked up the crate and they proceeded down the streets to the docks. They made it back to the public showers, thankfully, without incident. They then removed their coveralls and donned their helmets. I'll go ring the doorbell, Sam said as he lifted with the packs of C-12 explosives. We need to get to the Pelican, said Matt. John's suit is breached, he won't make it if Sam blows his explosives. Okay, Kelly said as she helped John to his feet. John triggered the beacon and tossed it into an empty locker as they left the showers and made their way to the Pelican. Just as they got inside the Pelican with the crate, they heard a thunderous explosion and they could see people and crates flying around towards the breach doors telling them that Sam had rung the doorbell. Kelly quickly closed the Pelican's hatch and Fred made his way to the cockpit and took the pilot's seat. Fred activated the Pelican's engines and brought the dropship around towards Sam. He cycled through the emergency airlock and once everyone in the crate were secure, Fred flew the Pelican through the hole and into space. We all did good for a first mission. Linda thought to herself. Once Fred had set in the course for the rendezvous point, 
Matt said good job Fred. Thanks, you too, he replied. Matt nodded and looked over at John and saw that his face looked a little pale from all of the blood loss and he asked, you all right, John? I'm fine, he answered. Matt nodded and went to sit next to Linda. When he sat down Linda said, well, mission complete. She then thought about what Matt had told her earlier and said get some sleep. Matt glanced at her and chuckled slightly. Mission complete, he thought. He then said, what are you doing now? Quoting me. Linda answered with a small yawn, no. Just telling you that you need some sleep. You look beat. I am beaten, he replied. But then again, you need sleep too. I think we all need some sleep. Linda smiled and nodded. Agreed. She then started to doze off and the last thing she remembered was her head hitting Matt's shoulder. Matt looked over at his mentor's daughter and smiled. Have a good rest, he thought, and good job on the mission today. He then settled into the best comfortable position in his seat without disturbing Linda and looked out the front window and stared off into space. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 8 New Threat. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 8 New Threat Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, UNSC Military Complex, November 2, 2525, 0600 hours. Matt and the rest of the Spartans wondered who had died. They were called to muster in their dress uniforms only one time previously funeral detail. John was awarded the Purple Heart because of his injuries that he got from the mission to capture Colonel Watts. All the Spartan filed into the amphitheater and sat down. Matt sat smack dab in the center of the third row, with Linda right beside him on his right and John on his left. All the Spartans sat quietly and Matt looked back on the last time he and the other Spartans had been in Reach's secure briefing room where Dr. Halsey had told them that they were going to be soldiers. This was where all of their lives had changed forever and they were given a purpose. Chief Mendez entered the room and marched to the center platform. He, like the Spartans, wore his black dress uniform as well. His chest was covered with multiple silver and bronze stars, three purple hearts, the Red Legion of Honor Award, and a rainbow of campaign ribbons. He had also recently shaved his head. All the Spartans rose and stood at attention. Dr. Halsey entered the room. She looked at Matt, the wrinkles at the corners of her eyes and mouth were more pronounced, the streaks of gray in her dark hair. But as ever, her blue eyes were sharp. She wore gray slacks, a black shirt, and her glasses hung around her neck on a gold chain. Vice Admiral on deck Mendez announced. The Spartans all snapped to attention and stood straighter. A man six years Dr. Halsey Sr. strode into the room and onto the center stage. His short silver hair looked like a steel helmet. His gait had a strange loop in it, what crewmen called spacewalk, from spending too much time in microgravity. He wore a simple, unadorned black dress UNSC uniform with no medals or ribbons. The insignia on his forearm of his jacket, however, was unmistakable the rank of a vice admiral. At ease Spartans, he said, I'm Vice Admiral Stanforth. The Spartans then took their seats in unison. Dust swirled on stage and collected into a robed figure. Its face was obscured by the shadows of its hood. As far as Matt could discern, he saw no hands at the end of its sleeves. And this here is Beowulf, Vice Admiral Stanforth said as he gestured to the ghostly figure. Stanforth's voice was calm, but distaste was evident on his face. He is our AI attaché with the Office of Naval Intelligence. He turned away from the AI. We have several important issues to discuss this morning, so let's get started. The lights in the room dimmed. An amber sun appeared in the center of the room, with three planets in close orbit around it. This is Harvest, he said. Population of approximately 3 million. Although on the periphery of UNS-controlled space, this is one of our more productive and peaceful colonies. The holographic view zoomed in on the surface of the world and showed grasslands and forests and a thousand lakes swarming with schools of fish. As of military calendar February 3rd, at 1,423 hours, the Harvest Orbital Platform made long-range radar contact with this object. A blurry object outline appeared over the stage. Spectroscopic analysis proved inconclusive, Vice Admiral Stanforth said. The object of materials unknown to us. A molecular absorption graph appeared on a side screen, 
spikes and jagged lines indicating the relative proportions of elements. Beowulf raised a clocked arm and the image darkened. The words classified eyes only appeared over the blackened data. Vice Admiral Stanforth shot a glare at the AI. Contact with Harvest, he continued, was lost shortly thereafter. The Call Military Administration sent the scout ship Argo to investigate. That ship arrived in Zstam on April 20th, but other than a brief transmission to confirm their exit slip space position, no further reports were made. In response, Fleet Command assembled a battle group to investigate. The group consisted of the destroyer, Heracles, commanded by Captain Varady, as well as the frigates, Arabia and Vostok. They entered Epsilon Indy system on October 7th and discovered the following. The holograph of the planet Harvest changed. The lush fields and rolling hills transformed, morphing into a cratered, barren desert. Thin gray sunlight reflected off a glassy crust. Heat wavered from the surface. Isolated regions glowed red. This is what was left of the colony. The vice admiral paused for a moment to stare at the image and then continued. We assume all inhabitants are lost. Three million lives lost, Jesus Christ, Matt thought. He couldn't fathom the sheer amount of raw force it had taken to kill so many for a moment he was torn horror and envy. He glanced out of the corner of his eye to see if he could see a reaction from Linda. She had a similar look on her face. He then glanced at John as well. He was looking down at his purple heart, no doubt remembering his lost comrades, but Matt could tell he had similar thoughts. And this is what the Heracles battle group found in orbit, Vice Admiral Stanforth told them. The blurry outline that was still visible, hanging in the air, sharpened into crisp focus. It looked smooth and organic, and the hull possessed an old, opalescent sheen. It looked more like the carapace of an exotic insect than the metal hull of a spacecraft. Recessed into the aft section were pods that pulsed with a purple-white glow. The prow of the craft was swollen like the head of a whale. Matt thought that it possessed an odd, predatory beauty. The unidentified vessel, the vice admiral said, launched an immediate attack on our forces. Blue flashes strobed from the ship. Red motes of light then appeared along its hull. Bolts of energy coalesced into a fiery smear against the blackness of space. The deadly flashes of light impacted on Arabia splashed across its hull. Its meter of armor plating instantly boiled away, and a plume of ignited atmosphere burst from the breach in the ship's hull. Those were pulse lasers. Vice Admiral Stanforth explained, and if this record is to be believed some kind of self-guided, superheated plasma weapon, the Heracles and Vostok launched salvos of missiles towards the craft. The enemy's lasers shot half before they reached their target. The balance of the missiles impacted, detonated into blossoms of fire, that quickly faded. The strange ship shimmered with a semi-transparent silver coating, which then vanished. They also seemed to have some reflection shield. Vice Admiral Stanforth took a deep breath and his features hardened into a mask of grim resolve. The Vostok and Arabia were lost with all hands. The Heracles jumped out of the system, but due to the damage she sustained, it took several weeks for Captain Varady to make it back to reach. These weapons and defensive systems are currently beyond our technology. Therefore, this craft is of non-human origin. He paused, then added, the product of a race with technology far in advance of our own. A murmur broke out within the chamber. We have, of course, developed a number of first contact scenarios, the Vice Admiral continued, and Captain Varady followed our established protocols. We had hoped that contact with a new race would be peaceful. Obviously, this was not the case, the alien vessel did not open fire until our task force attempted to initiate communications. He paused, considering his words. Fragments of the enemy's transmissions were intercepted, he continued. A few words have been translated. We believe they call themselves, the Covenant. However, before opening fire, the alien ship broadcast the following message in the clear. He gestured to Beowulf, who nodded. A moment later, a voice thundered from the amphitheater's speakers. Matt stiffened in his seat when he heard it, the voice from the speakers sounded odd, artificial, strangely calm and formal, but laden with rage and menace. Your destruction is the will of the gods, and we're their instrument. Matt was awestruck. He saw John stand up. Yes, Spartan. Stanforth said. Sir, is this a translation? No, the vice admiral replied. They broadcast this to us in our language. We believe they have some kind of translation system to prepare the message, but it means they've been studying us for some time. John took his seat. Matt then stood up. Yes, Spartan. Stanforth asked again. Sir, 
Do we know how long they've been studying us? No, the vice admiral said. They could have been watching us for weeks, months, maybe even years, but as of right now, we do not know. Matt then took his seat. As of November 1st, the UNSC has ordered to full alert, Stanforth said. Vice Admiral Preston Cole is mobilizing the largest fleet action in human history to retake the Epsilon Indy system and confront this new threat. Their transmission made one thing perfectly clear they're looking for a fight. Only years of military discipline kept Matt rooted to his seat otherwise he would stand up and ask to volunteer on the spot. He would have given anything to go and fight. This was a threat he and the other Spartans had been training for all of their lives was certain of it. Not scattered rebels, pirates, or political dissidents. Because of this UNS quiet mobilization, Vice Admiral Stanforth continued, your training schedule will be accelerated to its final phase project Mjolnir. He stepped away from the podium and clasped his hands behind his back. To that end, I'm afraid I have another unpleasant announcement. He turned to the chief. Chief Petty OFFIC or Mendez will be leaving us to train the next group of Spartans. Chief. Matt clutched the riser in front of him. He saw John do the same. Chief Mendez had always been there for them, the constant in the universe. Vice Admiral Stanforth might as well have told them that Reach was leaving the Epsilon Eridani system. The chief stepped up to the podium and clasped its edges. Recruits, he said, soon your training will be complete, and you will graduate to the rank of Petty OFFIC or second class in the UNSC. One of the first things you will learn is that change is part of a soldier's life. You will make and lose friends. You will move. This is part of the job. He looked at his audience. His dark eyes rested on each one of them. He nodded, seemingly satisfied with what he saw. The Spartans are the best group of soldiers that I have ever encountered, he continued. It has been a privilege to train you. Never forget what I've tried to teach you. Duty, honor, and sacrifice for the greater good of humanity are the qualities that make you the best. He was silent for a moment, searching for more words. But finding none, he stood at attention and saluted. Attention, Matt heard John bark next to him. The Spartans rose as one and saluted the chief. Dismissed, Spartans, Chief Mendez said. And good luck. He finished his salute. The Spartans snapped their arms down. They hesitated, and then reluctantly filed out the amphitheater. John and Matt were the only ones that stayed behind. They both wanted to talk to Chief Mendez. Dr. Halsey spoke briefly with the chief and the vice admiral, then she and the vice admiral left together. Beowulf backed toward the far wall and faded away like a ghost. The chief gathered his hat, spotted John and Matt, and walked to them. He nodded to the hologram of the scorched colony, harvest, still rotating in the air. One final lesson petty officers, he said. What tactical options do you have when attacking a stronger opponent? Sir, they replied in unison. There are two options. Attack swiftly and with full force at air weakest point take them out quickly before they have a chance to respond. Good, he said. And the other option? Fall back, they said. Engage in guerrilla actions or get reinforcements. The chief sighed. Those are both correct answers, he said, but it may not be enough to be correct this time. Sit, please. John and Matt sat, and the chief settled next to them on the rise. There is a third option. The chief turned his hat over in his hands. An option that others may eventually consider. Sir? They asked. Surrender, the chief whispered. That, however, is never an option for the likes you two and me. We don't have the luxury of backing down. He glanced up at Harvest, a glistening ball of glass. And I doubt that an enemy like this will let us surrender. I think we understand, Sir John said. Make sure you do. And make sure you don't let anyone else give up. He gazed into the shadows beyond the center platform. Project Mjolnir will make the Spartans into something, new. Something I could never forge them into. I can't fully explain that damned O&I spook is still here listening, just trust Dr. Halsey. The chief dug into his jacket pocket. I was hoping to see you two before they shipped me out. I have something for both of you. He set two small metal discs on the riser between the two of them. When you two first came here, the chief said, you two fought the trainers when they took this away from both of you broke a few fingers as I recall. His chiseled features cracked into a rare smile. John and Matt both picked up a disc and examined it. It was an ancient silver coin. They flipped it between their fingers. It has an eagle on one side, Mendez said. That bird is like the two of you fast and deadly. John and Matt closed their fingers around the quarter that they held in their hands. Thank you, sir, they said in unison. 
Matt wanted to say that he was strong and fast because the chief and Jack Pravden had made him so. He wanted to tell the chief that he was ready to defend humanity against this new threat. He wanted to say that without the chief, he would have no purpose, no integrity, and no duty to perform. But Matt didn't have the words. He just sat there. Mendez stood. It has been an honor to serve with you. Instead of saluting, he held out his hand. John stood. He took the chief's hand and they shook. Then Matt did the same. It took a great deal of effort. Every instinct in Matt's body screamed at him to salute the chief. Goodbye, Chief Mendez said. He turned briskly on his heel and strode from the room. Just as the chief was about to walk out the door, Matt called out, Chief. The chief stopped just before the doorway and turned around to face him. Yes. Matt saluted and said, Sir, it's been an honor to serve with you. And thank you for everything you taught us. Mendez gave him another rare smile. You are most welcome, Spartan, he replied. He then saluted and said, Goodbye Spartan and good hunting. He then turned around and walked out of the room. Matt didn't know it then, but he would see the chief again. Six years later. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 9 Project Mjolnir. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 8 Project Mjolnir. Location UNSC Commonwealth, en route to Chi Seti System. November 26, 2525. 1750 hours. Matt bolted awake suddenly and banged his head on the inside of his cryopod. Arg motherfucker he swore and rubbed his head. His chest was also hurting from breathing in the cold air of the pod. The pod's emergency release activated and the lid raised allowing Matt to get out. He went over to the lockers across from the pods and removed a set of underwear and put it on. One of the technicians had come in and begun running a series of tests on Matt, standard procedure for someone who wakes up early. This was the first time for Matt. After the tests were completed, the technician allowed Matt to go to the barracks where the Spartans had been assigned to and he went to work preparing the revival process for everyone else. When Matt arrived, he went to his locker and grabbed a set of fatigues and went over to his assigned bunk and sat down. He rubbed his temples and groaned at the dream he had before he'd woke up in the pod. Why do I always keep seeing the same fucking nightmare? Why do I keep seeing the ghosts of my parents and my sister all screaming at me that their deaths were my fault? It wasn't my fault, it was that unidentified man who killed them, not me, he thought. Matt groaned once more, got to his feet and put his fatigues on and went to over to the food dispenser and got a breakfast meal. Once he got back to his bunk, he tore open the breakfast meal and started eating. After he finished his meal, he laid down on his bunk to actually try and get a few hours of actual sleep with both eyes closed and prayed to God that no nightmares came. When Linda and the other Spartans arrived in the bunk room, Linda looked around for Matt. When she was revived, she didn't see Matt anywhere in the crypt chamber. A technician told her that he'd woken up from his cryosleep prematurely and after being checked out, he came down here. Linda was a bit worried for Matt because this was the first time something like this had happened to him. Cryosleep always seemed to agree with him, but this time it didn't. Linda, along with Kelly, eventually found both Matt asleep on one of the bunks on the far side of the room with both eyes closed. Sam joined them a few minutes later. I think we'd better let him sleep, said Sam. I heard he had a pretty rude awakening. Good idea, Linda replied and Kelly nodded her head in agreement. All three of them then went over to the food dispensers. Matt had the same nightmare he experienced so many times before about his parents and his sister when Linda shook him awake. John just got called to the bridge, she told him. He wants everyone ready to go just in case. Okay, Matt said as he got up and rubbed his eyes, the other Spartans were scattered around the room eating their equipment in order. Suddenly the alarms began to blare and the flashing red lights came on, suddenly John's voice came in over the intercom. Sam muster the team in Bay Alpha. I want that pelican ready to drop in 15 minutes. We'll have it done in 10, Sam replied, faster if those long swords interceptor pilots get out of our way. Okay you heard the men, people, said Kelly. Let's move it. The Spartans doubled time on the equipment and began filing out. Matt and Linda were some of the last to leave and they grabbed their equipment. But just as they exited the rock the ship was rocked by an explosion no suddenly the hallway erupted in flames. 
Matt managed to push Linda away from the door just as the flames tried to force their way into the room but were stopped by the safety doors sealing them in. You all right? Matt asked Linda. I think so, she replied. Okay, stay here, Matt said as he made his way towards the other side of the room to use the other door, but when he got there it didn't open. He pressed a hand against the door and it was hot. He pulled away and walked back over to Linda. Any luck? She asked. No, there's a fire on the other side of that one too, Matt replied. So we're trapped, said Linda. Looks like it, Matt replied. Matt look, Linda said pointing to the air shaft, there was smoke pouring in. Over here, he said as he sat against a wall farthest away from the vent. Linda sat down next to him and pulled her knees up to her chest. Do you think we'll die here? She asked. Don't say that, Matt responded. I'm sure Sam will get a rescue team. But truthfully, he was having doubts about whether or not they would be rescued. Suddenly, the whole ship shuddered and Linda jumped, startled by the vibrations. Matt put an arm around her and said to her, Calm down that was the Mac gun. It means we're fighting back. But against who? She asked. Probably the Covenant, Matt responded as the ship shuddered with the firing of the Mac gun again. Linda moved a little closer to Matt. Suddenly the whole ship shook harder this time and in a blaze of sparks the main lights went out. Matt toppled over and Linda landed on top of him. When the emergency lights came on, Matt saw Linda's face only a few inches from his. This is awkward, he thought to himself as Linda got up and he did the same. It had grown hotter in the room and Matt immediately realized it was the plasma eating through the ship. Over here he said, leading Linda to the emergency respirators. He took one and handed it to Linda before removing another one and putting it on just as the decompression alarm sounded. They both felt a rush of air as the ship's atmosphere was vented on all decks. It grew cooler in the room and the smoke was gone. A line of sparks began to form on the main door as someone was using a blowtorch to cut it down. A few minutes later, the door came crashing in and on the other side was Sam with an engineer. You guys okay? Sam asked. Yeah we're fine, Matt replied as he and Linda left the room. So, what now? Linda asked. Now, we get to Mjolnir, Matt answered. Location Chi Seti 4, Damascus Training Facility, November 27, 2525, 1845 hours. The Pelican ride down to the surface of Chi Seti 4 was thankfully uneventful, but Matt still felt uneasy. He had a suspicious feeling that something bad was going to happen soon. Soon as in like later today. Matt pushed away the suspicious feeling had in the of his mind when they reached their destination, deep within the planet of Chi Seti 4. Inside the room on the far side, there was a mannequin with some kind of armor that Matt assumed was Mjolnir armor. Dr. Halsey explained that the armor was called the Mjolnir Mark IV. She began giving an overview of the armor systems. After she finished, Dr. Halsey asked for volunteers. Everyone stepped forward. She selected John to try on the armor first and they began fitting him with the armor. After 45 minutes he was suited up and Halsey asked him to demonstrate the speed of the armor. John moved his hand at lightning speed to his chest. The other Spartans were amazed at his speed, even Matt. Damn, I can't wait to wear one, he said quietly to Linda and she nodded in agreement. As John started the obstacle course, the techs began fitting everyone else with the MK. 4. Finally, it was Matt's turn as they started attaching the leg plates and boots, eventually. After a half hour's work, they had the chest section on and it was time for the helmet. Matt picked it up, started to inspect it and stared into the reflective visor. Well, here goes nothing, he said as he slid the helmet over his head. There was a hiss and a click as it made contact with the neck seal, and his suit became pressurized. So how does it feel? Halsey asked as she came over. Pretty weird, Matt responded, but otherwise fine. Good, now how about you try the obstacle course, said Halsey. Matt complied and made his way through the course, he had no trouble leaping over the wall or going through the razor wire. Matt hardly noticed the difference between his body and the suit, when he was done he joined the other Spartans. Can you believe these things? Linda said over a private comm channel. I think I'm in love, said Sam over an open channel. He later corrected himself. Suddenly, Captain Wallace's voice broke in over the comm channels, we have contact with the Covenant ship ma'am, extreme range. Their slip space engines must still be damaged, they are moving towards us via normal space. What's your repair status? Halsey asked. Long range communication system inoperable. Slipstream generators are offline, we have two fusion missiles and 20 archer pods intact, 
Wallace reported. If you need more time, we can try and draw them away. No, Captain Halsey replied as she looked over the rest of the Spartans, we're going to fight them, and this time we have to win. John ordered everyone to the lift and the Spartans proceeded to the lift, a few carried the spare suits. As he was getting in, Matt made a decision. If he was going to die today, he would take as many covenant bastards as he could with him and this decision would stay with him for as long as he survived. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 10 Up Close and Personal Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 10 Up Close and Personal Location Chi Seti System, Pelican, in orbit above Chi Seti 4, November 27, 2525, 2037 hours. Matt sat anxiously in the passenger compartment of the Pelican. He hoped he could make it past the Covenant ship's shields and get inside and he prayed to God that this plan didn't get any of the Spartans killed. Suddenly, the Pelican came to stop and Sam spun around. Okay, John wants the missiles removed immediately and cut down for transport, he said as he opened the hatch. He, Kelly, and Fred went outside and came back a few minutes later with armfuls of missile warheads. Matt and Linda went over and helped them inside, then helped distribute the warheads to the other Spartans. When he had received his warhead, Matt strapped it to the pad on his thigh and then donned a thruster pack, grabbed an MA-5B, and attached it to a slot on his pack. We'll only have one shot at this, said John as he came out of the cockpit. Plot an intercept trajectory no fire your thrusters at max burn. If the target changes course you'll have to make the best guess correction on the fly. If you make it we'll regroup outside the hole if you miss we'll pick you up after we're done. And if we don't succeed, then power down your systems and wait for UNSC reinforcements to retrieve you. Live to fight another day. Don't waste your lives. Matt went over to the rear hatch and wasted beside Linda until John showed up. Nervous? John asked. Sort of, Linda replied. A little nervous, Matt answered, but in reality, he was scared shitless. I am too, but I don't know what we'll face either, John replied. Matt didn't know what they were going to face, but he was ready to fight to the death and sacrifice his own life if he had to. Everyone ready? John asked. There was a chorus of yes sir but Matt gave a nod and Linda gave a thumbs up. Matt watched as John left the ship and into engaged a full burn. He followed Kelly and Linda out because he has no idea how to get in, and he didn't want to risk getting hit and blasted out of the sky. Kelly moved towards the back of the ship and managed to slip under the shields, apparently, they had diverted their field coverage of the front of the ship. Matt and Linda followed Kelly. On his descent, Matt nearly slammed into her. You got here fast, Linda said as the trio made their way along the hull breach. When they got there, they found Sam already waiting for them. I guess we wait and see if anyone else shows, Sam said. They only had to wait a minute or two until John showed up. What took you so long? Sam asked. I think we're the only ones that made it, said Kelly. Well what are we waiting for? Said Matt. Let's go fuck up a Covenant ship. Agreed, Linda said. I've got our six. John led the way through the hull breach and he collapsed on the first deck as he entered the ship's gravity field. Gravity? He asked. Must be artificial, said Matt as he made his way down to the deck with Kelly, Sam, and mate right behind him. Weapons check, John ordered. They examined their rifles which thankfully made the trip intact, much to Matt's relief. Matt slammed in a clip of shredder rounds and his helmet system synced with his rifle. They proceeded through the corridor until they came upon the pressure doors. John and Sam forced them open without difficulty and they continued through the ship, the group arrived outside another set of pressure doors. Over there, said Linda as she pointed to the control panel. Matt walked past the others. I got this, he said. He began typing in random controls and he managed to get the pressure equalized and then the doors opened. On the other side was a sinewy and slender alien creature. The creature had avian features, a beaked head with teeth, and clawed hands and feet. Matt didn't waste any time and peppered the alien with bullets. Ah, what the hell was that? Linda asked. Whatever happened to first contact scenarios, said Sam. Fuck first contact, said Kelly. I consider this second contact, and it's going well. Hey, I'm not complaining, said Sam. 
Matt walked up to the creature and shot a burst from his rifle into the alien to make sure it was dead. Then he said, neither am I. I'm getting a radiation reading this way, Kelly said as she took point down another corridor. They eventually arrived outside another set of doors and Matt went up the panel and punched in the same combination. When the doors parted, Matt saw the same creature that the team had encountered earlier, except this time, the creature had some sort of energy shield in front of it. John darted into the room and before the creature could raise its weapon to fire, John knocked it over with the butt of his rifle and shot the creature dead. Nice going, Sam said to John as he entered the room. Matt nodded his head in agreement and said to John, yeah, nicely done. Thanks, he said. That has to be the source of the radiation, said Kelly as she looked over at the reactor. Right then, said Matt as he took aim with his rifle and blasted the viewport apart. They all removed their warheads and John set the timers and dropped the bundle into the reactor chamber. Okay then, said Sam. Let's. But he suddenly stopped when they heard something. Behind them stood a small alien creature with a stocky, round head, an exoskeleton with wrinkly skin, and stubby limbs. The creature held what appeared to be a plasma pistol charging up in its trembling hands. Fire John ordered. The team raised their weapons and prepared to shoot, but the creature's weapon discharged, the bolt of plasma heading straight for John. Sam tackled John out of way, but the plasma bolt hit him in the side. Matt bolted over to the grunt, grabbed him by his methane rig me slammed him into the wall. He dropped his rifle, brought up his fist, and slammed it as hard as he could knock the creature's head and he kept pounding until there was nothing left of the creature's head up the stump of its neck. The rest was pounded into the wall in a mixture of blood and bones. Matt dropped the body and retrieved his assault rifle then went over to Sam's side. While Matt was destroying the creature, Linda ran to Sam's side along with John and Kelly and examined his injuries. Linda saw that the plasma shot had burned through his armor, compromising it. It penetrated his skin and Matt could see melted bone, it was his spine. John rolled him over Sam had raised his reflexive visor they could see his face. Linda heard a thud and looked up and saw Matt drop to his knees beside Sam. I can't feel my legs he said through gritted teeth. It's no good, said John. He's paralyzed from the waist down. He can't walk. No. I can still walk, Sam grunted out as he shakily stood up. I won't be able to leave with this hole in my armor. My suit's compromised. No, Kelly growled. No, everyone gets out alive. We don't leave teammates behind. You've got to leave me, Sam said softly to her. I'll hold off these aliens from trying to disable the bombs. I have to agree with Kelly in this one, Matt said. We don't leave anyone behind. Suddenly the bomb timer activated and a three-minute countdown appeared on their HUDs. There, it's decided, said Sam. Now go, you four. John grasped his hand in his and pulled Kelly to the door. Matt took Sam's hand and placed his own assault rifle in it. You take these motherfuckers straight to hell, said Matt. Sam gave him a weak salute with his free hand before picking up his weapon. Don't worry, I'll give these bastards what's coming to them, he replied. Sam turned to Matt and reached into his suit and pulled out his dog tags, snapped it off his neck, and held them out to him. Here Matt, take them, he said. No Sam, I can't, he replied. Yes, you can. Remember them and remember my sacrifice, Sam said. Matt gulped and answered, okay Sam, thank you. I'll never forget you. Sam smiled softly at him. Good, he said, now go. Matt and Linda got up and sprinted for the door and just as John and Kelly closed it, Sam whispered, goodbye. 235. They quickly retraced their steps and made it back to the airlock, and pumped up the atmosphere. 105. They climbed through the hull breach caused by the Mac round and back onto the hull. 033. There John said as he spotted a pulse laser building up a charge, the four moved toward it and waited for the discharge. 012. They crouched and held onto one another as they kicked off the hull and made it through the shield just as the timer hit 000. They watched as the hole in the hull began to spew fire and debris, then it rippled across the entire ship as it broke apart in a tremendous explosion. John, Kelly, Linda, and Matt still clung to each other for an hour after the explosion. A pelican finally located their beacons and it happened to be the one flown by Dr. Halsey. What happened? She asked after they were aboard. Where's Sam? I thought he was with you. He was, John replied grimly. Kelly, Linda, and Matt stood there expressionless as the pelican made its way back to the Commonwealth.
When they docked, the four of them proceeded to the bunk room. It had been repaired while they were away. The Commonwealth's pelicans were still retrieving the Spartans, so they had the room to themselves. Matt took off his helmet and threw it against the wall in a rage, then sat down on his bunk. It groaned under his weight. Linda removed her helmet and sat down next to Matt. She leaned against his shoulder plate and started to cry. Do you think it would be that hard to go through again? She asked him. I don't know, Matt replied. I just don't know anymore. Kelly meanwhile took off her helmet, sat on the side of his bunk, and said to Matt, Don't blame yourself, Matt. It wasn't your fault he died. Yes, it was, he answered. No, it was that grunt who killed him. The same thing could have happened to any of us, including me. Do you think Sam would like us to blame ourselves got his death? Kelly shot back. No, I certainly wouldn't blame any of you guys for my death if I was in the same situation Sam was, and neither should you guys. No, Matt groaned. It was my fault. Linda knew Matt was wrong from the moment the words left his mouth. Whatever you say, Matt, Kelly said. But just remember this, Sam's death was not your fault and it never will be, got it? Yeah, Matt replied back glumly. I got it. Good, Kelly said. Then she got up and laid down in her bunk, closed her eyes, and tried to get some sleep. All the while, she could hear Matt and Linda crying softly over the loss of their close friend. She then turned away from them and shed quiet tears over Sam's death and sacrifice. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 11 Friends Come and Go. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 10 Friends Come and Go Location UNSC Bunker Hill, en route to 111 Tory System April 28, 2531, 1,200 hours Matt was sitting on the floor in the Spartan barracks room, meditating and practicing Zen. Linda was right across from him. Suddenly, Linda opened her eyes and tapped him on back of his hand. Hey do you want to go to the gym? Linda asked. Matt opened his eyes and answered. Yeah, sure. I need something to do to release the boredom. Linda chuckled. Same here. Matt got to his feet and offered a hand to Linda to help her up, which she took. Come on, let's go, then, Matt said. They exited the room and navigated through the corridors of the bunker hill until they reached the gym. When they got to the gym, they saw John and Kelly practicing on a mat. Kelly had a practice knife in her hand and was sparring with John. They saw Kelly pin John to the mat and pressed the practice knife to his neck. Kelly helped John to his feet and turned to the duo when they entered the room. Well, it looks like she won again, huh? Matt said. Yeah, she did, John answered. Well, what brought you guys here? Kelly asked. We wanted to release our boredom, Linda replied. Zen getting boring for your guys? John asked. Nah it's not boring, it's just boring without not much to do, Matt said. Kelly chuckled and said, figured you'd say that, Matt. You guys practice Zen practically 24-7. Well it's nice seeing you guys, but I'm going to bench press, Matt said and walked off. Linda looked after him and said, you know it's dangerous to lift without a spotter. He looked back at her over his shoulder and said, yeah I know. You want a spot for me, Red. Linda blushed very slightly and replied, yeah, sure. See you guys later. John asked as he and Kelly walked towards the doorway. Yeah we'll see you guys later, Linda said as John and Kelly walked out of the gym. The two waved to their friends as they exited the gym and went to God knows where. All right, let's go, Matt said. They walked over to where the weights were at the far side of the room. Matt went to one of the bars and starting putting weights on either side of the bar. He put an easy in amount that he could lift, 300 pounds. Then he would increase by 50 pounds after doing 200 reps. By the way, I saw that blush, he said as he put the last 50 pounds on the bar. Was I that obvious? She asked. To John and Kelly, maybe not. To me on the other hand, you were pretty obvious, he replied. How do you see that? She asked. Matt sat down and prepared to grab the bar off of the rack just above his head. He laughed. I have a lot better eyesight than you think I do, Red, he replied. He then grabbed the bar and started bench pressing. Well, obviously your eyesight is sharper than mine. Why'd you call me, Red? She asked. Matt did about 10 reps before he responded. 
It was just a slip of the tongue. Just forget I ever said that, okay, he said. No, I won't. Why do you call me that? She asked. Linda could be very persistent at times. Matt did about 15 more reps before he said, well, let's just say that I called you that because of your hair. Is there a problem with my hair? She demanded. Matt suddenly out the bar back on the rack and sat up. He looked at her with a shocked expression on his face and raised his hands like he was surrendering. No, there's nothing wrong with. I, uh. I just like your hair, that's all, he said. Linda blushed at that statement and said, oh, okay. I just never thought that someone would tell that at all. Yeah, well, I just did, he said. Well, thanks for the compliment, she said. He nodded. You're welcome, he replied. You know now that I think about it, I remember someone calling me red when I younger, she said. Matt waited for her to continue. She shook her head. He was a man. I think maybe my father, but I'm not sure, she said. Well, do you mind if I call you red? I'd understand if you felt uncomfortable about me calling you that, he said. She smiled. No, I don't mind. It can be our little secret nickname, all right. Yeah, all right. It'll be our little secret nickname, he said as he laid back down, grabbed the bar, and finished all of the reps he was doing. Then he kept adding more weight until he finally stopped at 1,000 pounds. Location 111 Tory System, Planet Victoria, Camp New Hope, May 1, 2531. 1,647 hours, blue team crept towards the perimeter fence hoping to slip in and retrieve the nukes they'd been sent to seize from rebel forces. Linda took up a sniping position in the tree line, and John neutralized the perimeter guard. Matt and Kelly moved towards the delivery gate with John and Kurt following behind. When the pair reached the house, they leaped to the roof in one jump. Kelly quickly opened the vent sand Matt dropped a pair of flashbang grenades on into the room. After John and Kurt had swept the room, Matt and Kelly jumped down from the roof and joined them inside. Security system, John whispered to them. Kelly sat down at the terminals and removed her datapad complete with ONI infiltration software. Ah, uh, Kelly, said Matt, pointing to the post-it note it's the password on it right next to her. Okay, Kelly muttered. We can do it the easy way too. I'm running the monitor looping program now, said Matt. Kurt had come over and was monitoring the real-time displays. Linda and Fred had also arrived and they secured the door. No alarms raised, Kurt reported. Okay, the rebels are watching reruns, said Matt. We have 15 minutes while the guards and dogs are rotated, said Kelly. Move, John said. Matt, Kelly, Fred, and Linda moved outside and waited until John and Kurt joined them. They blended into the shadows and made their way through the camp. After crawling under several barracks and sneaking around corners they arrived at a warehouse at the center of the camp, outside was the modified warthog. John took out a mini Geiger counter and sure enough it spiked. Josh ordered them to take up sniping positions and they complied. Matt took up position on the roof of a nearby warehouse. He lifted his sniper rifle to his eye and looked through the scope. There were two guards by the warehouse door. I see two guards by the door, he said. I see them, Linda said. Take the one on the right, Linda. I'll get the one on the left. Whenever you're ready, he said. Matt took aim at the guard to left side warehouse doorway and waited for Linda's shot. About two seconds after he had acquired his target, Linda fired and dropped the guard on the right side. A split second later, before the other guard to call out for help, Matt dropped him with a perfectly placed shot to the head. John gave them the go-ahead to move inside and they complied. They quickly made a sweep of the building as they entered. In the center of the room was a rack holding three warhead casings. John gave him and Kelly the signal to get warheads out to the warthog, but suddenly a red light acknowledgement light winked on, it was Kurt's. Abort, back out now John said. Suddenly, Matt started to feel dizzy and he began to collapse. Oh shit, he muttered before he lost consciousness. When he woke up, he had been flipped on his back and a technician was standing over him with a camera. He saw an older man standing over John talking about how he'd successfully captured them. He recognized him from the intelligence photos, General Graves. Hey, General Asshole, Matt called out. He startled the technician taking pictures, but Graves was curious and came over. Well, it seems another one is up, he said as he taped Matt's faceplate. Why don't you take off the collar and we'll discuss the situation, Matt said. Graves chuckled a bit, well you got some guts, but I'm no fool. Okay. Then we'll just have to do this the hard way, 
Motherfucker Matt said as he summoned all of his strength and tried to lift his right hand. You can't move your body, said Graves. Who said anything about my body, said Matt as he pushed and managed to get his hand up which startled Graves, but he quickly regained his posture. What do you expect to do with one hand? He asked. Just this, said Matt as he put up his middle finger. Fuck you he yelled just as an asteroidia mine came through the doorway and detonated. Because of his position, General Graves bore the brunt of the shrapnel and it sliced through him, nearly dicing him. His body fell in front of Matt and Kurt busted through the doors in the hog. He jumped out and removed Matt's collar, then went over to John. Matt got up and removed Linda's collar and helped her to her feet. You okay? He asked. Yeah, she replied. I heard what you said to Graves. Matt turned back to Graves' body. Who's bragging now? He said to the corpse. We can forget about stealth now, John said as he got up. Kurt, drive the warthog. Everyone else, load the warheads. They managed to get the three warheads loaded into the armored section of the hog. When everyone was in, Kurt drove it away from the warehouse. Unfortunately, an alarm had been tripped and the hog soon came under fire. Everyone into the center, John said, and get behind the warheads. They moved behind the three casings as they heard the bullets ping off them. Isn't it ironic that we're using nukes as shields, Matt said. Hang on Kurt said as he drove the hog through the fence out onto a bumpy road. Drones he told them. Fred and Kelly removed the roof panels and sure enough, two hunter drones were following them. Take them down, said John. Matt and Linda brought up their rifles and began firing at them. Both of them were dead on as always. Linda managed to hit the lead drone, but the other one shot off its missiles. Matt shot the missile that was flying towards them, but his shot only skinned the missile and his shot didn't destroy the missile. Linda's shots didn't do a thing to the lead drone and it continued streaking towards them. PZ, 300 meters, said Kelly consulting her datapad. Welcoming committee has us in its sight. Tell them we have the package and we need a hand, said John. Roger that, she replied. Suddenly, a pelican rose from the swamp and peppered the missile in depleted uranium rounds, destroying it. Stand by for pickup, blue team. We have incoming bandits so hang on tight and go vacuum protocols, said the pelican pilot. Check suit integrity, said John. A quick integrity check on Matt's HUD came back green. He still remembered what happened to Sam, six years earlier. There was a thud and the pelican latched onto the hog and then they were airborne. Matt felt a tugging sensation as they cleared the atmosphere and suddenly he became weightless. Kurt left the driver's seat and joined everyone else in the back with the nukes. So how did you know it was a trap? Fred asked. I saw the crates they were loading were marked AP rounds, said Kurt. Now I figured that you wouldn't need much that much ammo unless you were facing a line of tanks. Or some Spartans, Linda said. I should have figured it out sooner, Kurt said. I nearly got you all killed. You saved us all, said Matt. So don't get so worked up over it. They docked with the bunker hill and immediately jumped to slip space. There was a nest team waiting in the hangar to take custody of the nukes. When they were finished, the Spartans went straight to the bunk room for some rest before they went into cryo sleep. Matt removed his helmet and set it on the chair next to him, then leaned his head back in the chair and breathed out a long sigh. He then leaned his body and closed one eye, trying to get some sleep. Location Groombridge 34 System, near Construction Platform 966A, November 7, 2531, 0940 hours. Matt took a deep breath as he exited the ONI Prowler and engaged his back. The small ONI ship reminded him of a show he last saw when he was five years old, but he couldn't remember the name. The ONI personnel on board made him feel uneasy and he felt a little on edge because of it. Kurt was leading them on a recon mission to an abandoned construction platform beloved to be used by rebels. Matt had a feeling that something bad was going to happen on this recon mission. He ordered a check of their thruster pack systems. Matt's came back normal so he winked his status light green. ETA three minutes, said Kurt. Something wrong? Kelly asked. No, said Kurt. When you say no like that, you mean yes. Fred said. Just a feeling, Kurt said. Matt had come to trust Kurt's gut feeling and he removed his MA-5B. Kelly and Fred did the same. Coming up on the twilight zone, said Kurt. Go radio silent. Matt winked his status light green as did Fred and Kelly. There was a blinding flash of light in Matt's faceplate, but it polarized to compensate. He also got his first good look at the shipyard. It reminded him of oil refineries at night, back home on Earth. 
Check this out, said Fred as he uploaded an image of what appeared to a new ship under construction. Kelly uploaded an image of some kind of stealth ship. Matt knew it had to be a special ship of some kind or it wouldn't be under construction at an abandoned construction platform. Hotspot, said Kurt. I've seen this before, said Fred. When they repaired the slipspace drive on the Mage Lien, those things weren't meant to be taken apart once go active. Update your mission logs and beam them back to circumference, said Kurt. We're going in for a closer look and if it is what Fred thinks it is, we'll pull out and call in a hazmat team. Matt flashed his acknowledgement light and followed Kurt in. I'm getting static, you three hold back. I'll scout it out, said Kurt as he went on ahead. All they received was a broken transmission from Kurt, and then nothing. What do we do? Kelly asked. Do we go in after him? No, Matt said. We don't want to be caught up in whatever to him. We'll go back to the prowler then get a search going. Sounds like a plan, Kelly said. Sounds good, said Fred. They all came about and engaged their tpacks, but Matt turned back to the station and thought about the bad feeling he had experienced earlier. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 12 Reassigned. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 12 Reassigned Location UNSC Point of No Return Location Classified November 29, 2531 0600 hours Matt sat cross-legged with his eyes closed on the floor of his quarters. He had arrived on the UNSC Point of No Return a few weeks ago, but he was never told why he was here. He was practicing Zen as he usually did most of the time whenever he had spare time or if he wasn't on a mission. Suddenly, he saw something. He saw the same nightmare he'd been having since he was six years old. He snapped his eyes open, gasped and leaned back against the bunk behind him, breathing heavily. He had sweat dripping down his face. What the hell? Why do I keep seeing that same fucking nightmare over and over again? He thought. He sat there for a few minutes before getting up and going to the refreshers a few meters down the corridor. Once there, he pushed the tap on the sink and water came out. He took his hands and cupped them together, put them under the water spray, then splashed water on his face. He stared back at his blear-eyed and tired face for a few minutes as water droplets fell from his face. He then took a towel off of a nearby towel rack and dried his face off, shut the water off and returned to his sat on his bunk with his face between his legs. He sat there for what felt like hours until he heard a knock on the door. Come in, he said. The door opened to reveal a balding man dressed in a UNSC army uniform. The man wore the eagle insignia of a colonel. His dark eyes were trained straight on Matt. Sir Matt stood and saluted. At ease, soldier, the colonel said. Matt frowned. He started to open his mouth to correct the colonel's error, but he closed it and fell silent. Naval NCOs were never called soldiers, but in Matt's experience, officers, army or otherwise, never appreciated correction unless their lives were at stake. The colonel's continued stare started to make Matt feel uncomfortable and uneasy. For some unknown reason, this army officer looked strangely familiar. Also, a few things more were contributing to the unease he felt. He was on a UNSC ship, but he didn't know why he was on the ship, and why was an army colonel interested in him. I am James Ackerson, the colonel said. He then did a strange thing he held out his hand, indicating that Matt should shake it. This was a rare occurrence. Usually, no one wanted to touch a Spartan, let alone shake their hand. Matt took Ackerson's hand and gently squeezed it. Ackerson. Matt knew that name. There had been conversations between Dr. Halsey and Chief Mendez. Ackerson's name had come up a dozen times, and from their influence and body language, Matt had concluded that he was not their friend. Matt was aware that everyone in the UNSC has the same basic goal protecting humanity from all threats. Not everyone, however, agreed on how that mandate should be executed, which led to internal conflict. Matt understood this the way he understood basic precepts of a Shafujikawa translite engine. He grasped the underlying theoretical principles, but the nuances and the actual application of that knowledge remained a mystery to him. Most likely this colonel was on permanent loan to ONI as a liaison officer. They often recruited civilians, officers from other branches of the military, or anyone they needed to get their job done. 
An army colonel was approximately the same rank as a navy captain, so while Matt was wary, he had to be polite, and even take orders from Ackerson as long as they did not conflict with previous orders. If you are well enough, follow me. Colonel Ackerson turned and started walking towards the door. Matt followed right behind him. Spartan 038, what is your name? Ackerson asked. Matt, sir. Yes, but Matt what? What is your family name? Matt knew he had another name before his training. That, however, was part of a life that seemed more dream than real life. And that other name was just a shadow in his mind, as was the family that had gone along with it. Still, he struggled to remember. I don't remember my last name, sir, he said. It doesn't matter, Ackerson said. For the time being if asked, use the last name. He considered for a moment. Armstrong. Yes, sir. Follow me, Ackerson said as he moved out the open door into a narrow corridor. He led Matt through three intersections. Many naval officers passed them, but none saluted. They kept to themselves, for the most part, eyes down. And while a few nodded to Matt, no one so much as glanced at Ackerson. Matt's unease at this odd situation grew palpable. They halted at a pressure door guys guarded by two marines who saluted. Matt crisply returned their salute. Ackerson only gave them a half-salute gesture. The colonel set his hand on a biometric reader and face, retina, and palm was simultaneously scanned. With a hiss, the door opened. Matt and Ackerson stepped into a dimly lit 20-meter wide room filled wall-to-wall -wall with monitors. Spectroscopic signatures, star charts, and slipstream space pulses strobed across the screens. There were several officers and two holographic AIs consulting with them in whispered tones. One gray AI was a gray-robbed figure without a body, a wraith. The other was a collection of disembodied eyes, mouths, and gesturing hands what Matt vaguely recalled from one of Deja's art lessons as an example of cubist art. Ackerson whisked him across the room and to another door. A second biometric scan and they entered an elevator. There was a downward motion, then a moment of zero-g free fall, and the sensation of gravity then returned. The doors opened to a catwalk that extended over the inky darkness to a blank wall. The colonel approached the blank wall, a seam appeared, and then the two sections pulled apart. This room is called Odin's Eye by the junior staff, Ackerson said. You have been temporarily granted a code word top secret clearance to enter. Whatever is said inside is similarly classified and you will reveal none of our conversations unless the proper code words are provided. Do you understand? Yes, sir, Matt replied. Matt's instinct, however, was to not enter this room. He, in fact, wanted to be any place but in this room. But he couldn't refuse. They entered. The doors closed behind them. Matt didn't see the seam. The room had white concave walls, and Matt's eyes had a hard time focusing. Your classification code word is Viper 6, Ackerson said. Now, speak freely in here. I certainly will. He gestured to a black circular table in the center of the room and they both sat. Sir, where am I? Why am I here? Of course, Ackerson murmured. You were brought here without any reason you are on this ship in the first place. My team leader, Matt said, is he? Fine, Ackerson replied. He's in the infirmary. We had to go to considerable lengths to extricate him from normal NAF spec WEP operations. We made sure his pack malfunctioned, and then we brought him on board the SIP and treated him for injuries. Matt breathed out a quiet sigh of relief upon hearing that Kurt was alive and well. Something changed in the colonel's expression. The dark stare and hardness softened almost an imperceptible face. In a lowered voice, Ackerson said, Section 3 has issued you new orders. He pushed a reader across the table to Matt. Matt thumbed the biometric and the screen warmed. There was code word classified warnings and then he saw his transfer orders under Colonel Ackerson. The usual fields for assignment location, routing protocols, and record verification were reduced. You are now a part of a subsection of Beta 5 Division, Ackerson said, a top secret cell within Section 3. Now it all made sense why he was here. He was being assigned a new mission, but what was the mission? Even though you didn't have a malfunctioning pack like your team leader, Ackerson said, you have been classified as reassigned. Matt felt something was wrong about this whole reassignment. What's this new mission, sir? Ackerson stared at him for a moment, then seemed to look through Matt, past him. I want you to help train the next generation of Spartans. Matt blinked, taking in what Ackerson had just said, to quite understanding. Sir, 
I was under the impression that Chief Petty Officer Mendez had been reassigned years ago to carry out that mission. The effort to train additional Spartanias was postponed indefinitely by Dr. Catherine Halsey, said Ackerson. There were other candidates within the gene pool, but they were out of sync with her age restriction protocols. And with the continuing war, her program funds diverted. Matt had always assumed other Spartans were being trained, that he and his fellow Spartan twos were the first in what would be the first line of Spartans. He'd never considered they might be the first, and the last, of their kind. Ackerson said, Mendez will, of course, join you. Along with your team leader on the Delphi recon mission, Spartan 051. It would be an honor to serve under Chief Mendez, Matt replied. One of Ackerson's eyebrows quirked up. Indeed. He motioned at Matt's secure tablet. Read. New training protocols have been outlined as well as an improved augmentation regime. We've learned much from the unfortunate medical processes Dr. Halsey had at her disposal. Matt balled his hands into fists, remembering the pain of the bone grafts like glass breaking inside his marrow and the fire that had burned along every nerve as they had been, re-engineered for enhanced speed. As he read he started to grasp the opportunities and challenges of this new program. The new bio-augmentations were a quantum leap ahead of those he and the other Spartan twos had received. There were less projected washout rates. There was, however, only a fraction of the original Spartan program training time and budget. Mjloner armor was to be replaced with something called semi-powered infiltration, SPI, armor systems. With this new SPI armor and these new candidates, Matt said, you're trying to, to do more with less and you're going to be using this armor made of special photoreactive panels and have these new Spartans take high-risk stealth ops. Ackerson nodded. They'll be sent on missions with higher strategic value but correspondingly lower survival probabilities. That's where you come in, Matt. We need you training as a Spartan, and all of your field experience passed along to these candidates. You need to make these Spartans better and train them faster. This program may be the key to our survival in the war. I know I'll be helping Spartan 051 and Chief Mendez train these new Spartans, Matt said, but is there anything specific I'm supposed to train these new Spartans, sir? Actually, yes there is, Ackerson replied. Some candidates may be taken out of the normal training regime and trained specifically in a certain area. That is where you come in, Matt. In addition to train G these new Spartans, your job is to take candidates you think that would be good in a certain area and teach them. These candidates you choose will not wear SPI armor, they'll wear Mjloner armor. Matt nodded. Yes, sir. I understand. Good, Ackerson replied. Matt scanned the reader again. The new generic selection protocol expanded the pool of candidates, but there were disturbing references to behavior problems in these less-than-ideal potential Spartans. But this mission was vital to the war, Matt sensed that. SND there would be CPO Mendez and Kurt. It would be good to be working with his old teacher again, as well as, under his close friend. Could three of really train a new generation of Spartans? In ten years, Ackerson said, with your guidance and a little luck, there will be a hundred new Spartans in the war. Employing several of these new Spartans to help train the next classes, there will be thousands in twenty years. With projected improvements in technology, perhaps a hundred thousand new Spartans will be created in thirty years. A hundred thousand Spartans fighting for humanity. The image swam through Matt's mind. Was this even possible? While Matt didn't understand all the training ramifications, he now understood the importance of the end result. His initial of unease, however, remained. How many of the new Spartans were going to die? He steeled himself. He'd do everything he could to see that they had the best training, the best equipment, be the best soldiers humanity had ever produced. Even then, though, would it be enough? He took a deep breath. When do we begin, sir? Ackerson said, new training facilities are being constructed. You will help oversee the operation, along with Spartan 051, when he out of the infirmity. Also, you will begin screening candidates that you would like to personally train. I have an ample supply of willing recruits for you. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a tiny box, pushed it across the table to Matt. One last thing. Matt opened the box. Inside was the single silver bar insignia of a lieutenant junior grade. These are yours now. A faint crease of a smile appeared in Ackerson's face. I am not going to have my second right hand when taking orders from NCO drill instructors. You're going to be second in charge of the whole show. Sir, who will be your first right hand man? Spartan 051 will. Even though you both will have the same rank, 
he will oversee the entire operation. Yes, sir, he replied. Good, Ackerson said. You have a lot of work to do, Lieutenant. You best get to it. Yes, sir, I will, Matt said as he got up and left the room to start his new assignment. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 13 Alpha Company. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 13 Alpha Company. Location Zeta Doratus System, Planet Onyx, Camp Kahi, December 27, 2531, 1950 hours. Matt and Kurt watched the incoming pelicans. The blocky jet-powered craft were so distant there were only specks against the setting sun. Matt hit the magnification on his faceplate and saw the lines of fire tracing their re-entry vectors. They would touch down in three minutes. In the last six months, they had developed a training regime tougher than the original Spartan program. They had created the obstacle courses, firing ranges, classrooms, mess halls, and dormitories from what had been jungle and scrub plain. Kurt had received every piece of equipment he had requested from NAVSPEC WEP Section 3. Guns, ammunition, dropships, tanks even samples of Covenant technology and weaponry had appeared as if by sleight of hand. All personnel were accounted for six dozen handpicked drill instructors, physical therapists, doctors, nurses, and the all-important cooks. All here except the most critical person who was now on the incoming transport's chief petty officer Franklin Mendez. Mendez, a dozen years ago, trained Matt, Kurt, and every other Spartan. He would be invaluable in preparing the new breed of Spartan EI, but he wasn't going to be the solution to all of Matt and Kurt's problems. After poring over every detail of new recruits' files, Matt and Kurt discovered that they didn't match the perfect psychological and genetic markers set in Dr. Halsey's original selection protocols. Colonel Ackerson had warned them they had to draw from a less statistic-robust group. These recruits wouldn't be like them, John, Kelly, or any of the original Spartanii candidates. And this would only add a long list of challenges. With the final target class four times larger than the Spartanii's, a severely truncated training schedule, and the need for these Spartans in the war increasing every month. Matt and Kurt, in fact, expected a disaster. The Pelican jet transport swooped down on final approach and angled their thrusters. The sod on the parade ground rippled like velvet. One by one, they gingerly touched down. Although Matt's Mjolnir armor was not designed to best rank insignia, he nonetheless felt the weight of his new lieutenant's bars. They pressed down on him as if they were a ton each as if the weight of the entire war and future or humanity rested squarely on his shoulders. Sirs? A voice whispered into his calm. The voice belonged to the artificial intelligence Eternal Spring. It was officially assigned to the planetary survey team stationed in the northern section of this peninsula. Matt wasn't sure why Colonel Ackerson had insisted Camp Kohi be built next to the facility. He was sure, however, there had been a reason. Go ahead, Spring. Kurt said. Updated details on the candidates available, the AI said. Thanks, Kurt said. Thank me after your so-called test, sir. Eternal Spring terminated transmission with a hiss of static that sounded like angry bees. Cajoled by Section 3 Brass, Eternal Soaring had agreed to devote 9% of its runtime to the Spartan AI project. The AI was of the smart variety, which meant there were no limits on its knowledge or creativity. Despite its theatrics, Matt was happy for its help. Matt blinked and accessed the candidate's data on his heads-up display. Each name had a serial number and linked to the background files. There are 497 of them, a collection of four, five P, and six-year-old children that he and Kurt had to forge into a fighting force unparalleled in the history of warfare. The hatch on the nearest pelican opened with a hiss, and a tall man strode out. Mendez had aged well. His trim body looked chiseled from ironwood, but the hair was now silver, and there were deep creases around his eyes and a set of ragged scars that ran brow to chin. Chief, Matt and Kurt said in unison. Matt resisted the urge to snap to attention as Mendez saluted. As odd as it felt, Matt and Kurt were now his commanding officers. Matt and Kurt returned the salute. Chief Petty Officer Mendez reporting for duty, sirs. After the Spartanii program, Chief Mendez had, at his request, been assigned to active duty. He'd fought the Covenant on five worlds, and been awarded two Purple Hearts. 
You were briefed on the flight, Matt asked. Completely, Mendez said. As he looked over Matt and Kurt in their Mjolnir armor, emotions played in his face awe, approval, and resolve. We'll get these new recruits trained, sirs. This was precisely the response Matt had hoped for. Mendez was a legend among the Spartans. He had tricked, trapped, and tortured them as children. They all hated and then learned how to admire the men. He taught them how to fight and how to win. Do they let Spartans drink now? Mendez asked. Chief, the two Spartans said in unison. A bad joke, sirs. We all might need one before this day is over, he said. The new trainees are, well, sirs, a bit wild. I don't know if any of us are ready for this. Mendez turned to the pelicans, inhaled, and yelled, recruits, fall out. Kids streamed off dropship ramps. Hundreds tromped onto the field, screaming, and throwing clumps of sod at one another. After being cooped up for hours, they went wild. A few, however, milled near the ships, dark circles under their eyes, and they huddled tighter. Adult handlers herded them onto the grass. Either of you read Lord of the Flies? Mendez muttered. I have, Matt said as he inspected the kids for the first time. As have I, Kurt replied. But your analogy will not hold. These children will have guidance. They will have discipline. And they have one thing no ordinary children have, motivation. Matt couldn't agree more with that statement. Kurt linked to the camp's PA system. He cleared throat and the sound rumbled over the field like thunder. Nearly 500 crazed kids shopped in their tracks, fell silent, and turned amazed at the two giants in the shining emerald armor. Attention, recruits, Kurt said and stood akimbo. I am Lieutenant Ambrose and beside me is Lieutenant Armstrong. You have all endured great hardships to be here. We know each of you has lost loved ones on Jericho 7, Harvest, and Baiko. The Covenant has made orphans of you all. Every kid stared at them, and in particular, Kurt. Some with tears now gleamed in their eyes, others with pure burning hatred. We are going you a chance to learn how to fight, a chance to become the best soldiers the UNSC has ever produced, a chance to destroy the Covenant. We are giving you a chance to be like us a Spartan. The kids crowded before them, close, but none actually dared to touch the shimmering pale green armor. We cannot accept everyone, though, Kurt continued. There are five hundred of you. We only have three training slots. So tonight, Chief Petty Officer Mendez, he nodded to the chief, have devised a way to separate those who truly want this opportunity from those who do not. Kurt handed him a tablet reader. Chief, to his credit, Mendez registered shock for only a split second. He opened tablet, frowned, but nodded. Yes, sir, he whispered. Mendez yelled at the children, you want to be Spartans. Then get back on those ships. They stood shocked, staring at him. No. Well, I guess we found a few washouts. You. He pointed to one child at random. You. And you. The chosen kids looked at each other, at the ground, and then shook their heads. No. Mendez said. Then get on those pelicans. They did so and did others, a slow shuffling procession. Drill instructors, Mendez said. Three dozen NCOs snapped to attention. You will find Falcon Wing aerial descent units on the field. Load them ASAP and make sure your trainees are properly fitted. Their safe deployment is now your responsibility. The DIs nodded and ran towards the bundled Falcon Wing backpacks. The chief turned to them. You're going to make them drop. He raised both eyebrows in surprise. At night. Don't look at me, chief, Matt said as he raised his hands in mock surrender. It wasn't my idea to drop them at night. I would have dropped them in daylight. I figured it wasn't your idea, the chief said. The Falcons are the safest drop units, Kurt replied. With respect, sir, some of them are only four-year-olds. Motivation, chief. If they can do this, they'll be ready for what we have to put them through. Kurt watched the pelicans fire their jets and scorch the grass. But just in case, he added, deploy all dropships to recover the candidates. There may be accidents. Mendez exhaled deeply. Yes, sir. He started for the nearest pelican. Chief, Kurt said. I'm sorry that order had to come from you. I understand, sir, Mendez replied. You're their COs. You have to inspire and command them. I'm their drill instructor. I get to be their worst nightmare. He, Kurt, and Matt a crooked smile and climbed aboard. It's good to see him again, Matt said to Kurt over a private comm channel. Yes, Kurt replied. Yes, it is. Shane clung to the plastic loops on the side of the pelican's hull. 
He stood shoulder to shoulder with the other kids, packed so close that he wouldn't have fallen if he let go. The roar of the pelican's jets was deafening, but he could still hear his own heart racing in his chest. This was the end of a journey that had started years ago. He'd heard jets like this when it started, the jets of the light freighter as it rocketed away from harvest. It had been crowded on that ship, filled with refugees trying to get as far away, as fast as they could, from the monsters. Only one in six ships had made it. Sometimes Shane wished he hadn't lived and seen the monster burn his family and home. When the Navy MEM had come to visit him in the orphanage and asked if Shane wanted to get even with them, he immediately volunteered. No matter what it took, he was going to kill all the Covenant. They had given him lots of tests, the written kind, blood tests, and then a month-long space trip as the Navy men collected more and more volunteers. Shane had thought the testing was over when they finally got to the Pelicans and came to this new place, but he'd barely touched the ground when they'd been shoved back inside and went back into the air. He'd gotten a glimpse of the two in charge. They wore armor like Shane had seen in fairy tale books The Green Knight Who Fought Dragons. That's what Shane wanted. He was going to wear armor like that one day and kill all the monsters. Check your straps, an old navy man barked at him and the other kids. Shane tugged at the black backpack that they'd put on him three minutes ago. It weighted almost as much as him, and the straps had been pulled so tight they cut into his ribs. Report any looseness, the men shouted over the roar of the engines. None of the twenty other kids said anything. Recruits, stand by, the men barked. He listened into his headphones and then a green light blinked on a panel near his head. The men punched numbers into a keypad. The back of the pelican hissed open, the ramp lowered, and a tornado screamed around Shane. He yelled, so did the other kids. They all pushed and shoved to the front of the pelican's bay. The old navy men stood by the open bay door, unafraid that only a meter to his rear was the open sky. He regarded the squirming kids with disgust. Behind him, a dusky orange band marked the edge of the world. Twilight and lengthening shadows slipped over snow-capped mountains. You will form a line and jump, the men shouted. You will count to ten and pull this. He reached up to his left shoulder, grasped the bright red handle there, and made a pretend pull motion. Some confusion will be normal. The kids stared at him. No one moved. If you cannot do this, the men said, you cannot be a Spartan. It's your choice. Shane looked at the other kids. They looked at him. A girl with pigtails and missing her front teeth stepped forward. I'll go first, sir, she yelled. Good girl, he said. Go right to the edge. Hang on to the guideline. She took the tiniest baby steps to the edge of the pelican, then froze. She took three deep breaths and then with a squeak, she jumped. The wind caught her. She vanished into the dark. Next the old navy man said. All the kids, Shane included, slowly formed a line. He couldn't believe they were doing this. It was nuts. The next boy got to the edge, looked down, and screamed. He fell backward and scrambled away. No, he said. No way. Next the men called and didn't give the kid cowering on the deck another glance. The next boy jumped without even looking. And the next. Then it was Shane's turn. He couldn't move his legs. Hurry up, loser, the boy behind him said and gave him a shove. Shane stumbled forward, halting only a half step from the edge. He turned and stopped himself from shoving this kid back. The kid was a head taller than Shane, and his black hair fell into his eyes, making it seem like he was missing his forehead. Shane wasn't afraid of this creep. He turned back to face the night rushing past him. This was what he was afraid of. Shane's legs filled with freezing concrete. The rushing wind was so loud he couldn't hear anything else anymore, not even his hammering heart. He couldn't move. He was stuck on the edge. There was no way he could jump. But now he was so scared he couldn't even turn around and chicken out, either. If he sat down, though, and then slowly inched back. Go, dumbass the creep kid behind him pushed. Hard. Shane fell off the ramp and into the night. He tumbled and screamed until he couldn't breathe. Shane saw flashes of the dimming sunset, black ground, the white caps of the mountains, and stars. He threw up. Some confusion will be normal. The red handle he had to grab it. He reached up, but there was nothing there. He clawed at his shoulder until two fingers found purchase. He tugged. There were a ripping sound and something unraveled from his pack. Shane jerked straight, his legs whipping after him, and his teeth snapped together from the sudden bone-jarring deceleration. The spinning world stopped. Gasping and blinking away his tears, Shane saw the last bit of amber light fade from the edge of the world, 
and the stars gently rock back and forth around him. Overhead the wind whistled and rippled through a black canopy. Ropes connected Shane to this wing, and his hands instinctively grabbed them. As he pulled, the wing turned and angled in that direction. The sudden motion made him dizzy again, so he let go. Shane squinted and made out shapes swimming around him black on black like the bats on harvest. Those had to be the other kids, gliding like he was. His face heated as he remembered how he'd chickened out at the last minute in the pelican, in front of everyone. Even that little girl had jumped. Shane never wanted to be scared like that again. Maybe if he imagined that he was already dead, then there would be nothing to be afraid of. It'd be like he died with his parents on harvest. He mustered this mental image, dead and nothing to fear, and to test it, he looked down. Past his dangling feet, there was a twocentimeter green square. After a moment, he realized it was the field where all the pelicans had landed. Tiny lines snaked from the field illuminated by tiny firefly pinpoints, nothing to be scared of, he whispered, trying to convince himself. He forced himself to pull the ropes, angle downward, and speed toward the green field. The wind whipped through the black silk wing and tore at Shane's face. He didn't care. He wanted down fast. Maybe if he was the first one down, he'd show everyone that he wasn't scared. Shane saw tiny people and scorch marks where the pelicans had burned the grass. And no other parachutes yet. Good. He'd be first, and he'd land right in front of the green knight. Shane hit the ground. His knees pistoned into his chest and knocked the wind out of him. The black wing caught a breeze, jerked him back on his feet, and dragged him across the grass and dirt. He gasped for air, but he wasn't scared. He was angry that he'd look so stupid having to wrestle with this parachute. The falcon wing hit the fence, and stuck there, fluttering. Shane got up and undipped himself from the harness. Something hot trickled down his legs. There was no way he'd been so scared he pissed his pants. With dread, he looked. It was blood. The skin on the back of his legs was raw. He took a tentative step and fire crawled up both thighs. He laughed. Blood or piss, what did it matter? He'd made it. Hey, dumbass. What's so funny? Shane turned and saw the kid who had pushed him. He lay on the grass, half tangled in his harness. Shane marched over to him, ignoring the pain in his legs. The kid got to one knee and held out his hand to shake. I'm Rob. Shane hit him square in the nose. Blood gushed from the kid's face and he keeled over. He was going to pay for shoving him. He was the only one who knew that Shane had frozen on the edge and chickened out. He'd have to pay for that, too. Shane started pounding him with right and left fists. The kid held up his arms to fend off the blows, but Shane landed a few good ones, skinning his knuckles. Robert headbutted Shane, and he fell off. Robert stood, shook off his harness, then growling, leaped onto Shane. They rolled on the grass, kicking and punching. Shane heard a loud snap and he wasn't sure if it was his or Rob's bone breaking, he didn't care. He kept hitting and hitting until blood spilled into his eyes and he couldn't see any more. Large hands grabbed Shane and pulled him off. Still swinging, Shane connected with one of the Navy men, bruising the bone over his eye. The men dropped him. Stand down barked a voice with godlike authority. Shane blinked and wiped the blood from his eyes. The silver-haired man who had given the order to jump stood between him and the other kid. The Navy man he'd hit pressed one hand to his swollen eye and said, Chief, these two were going to kill each other. I see that, the old man said. He nodded approvingly at Shane and then turned to Robert. Robert ignored the old man and took a step toward Shane with his hands raised. I said stand down. Robert dropped his hands and staggered back as if he'd been struck. I think you're right, Sergeant, the older Navy man said. They really might have killed each other. He smiled, only it wasn't a smile. It was more like he was baring his teeth. Very good. That kind of fight left in them after their first jump. A night jump. My God. I only hope the rest of them are like this. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 14 Special Assignment Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 14 Special Assignment Five years after Alpha Company indoctrination. Location UNSC Point of No Return. Location Classified. July 30, 2537. 0900 hours.
Lieutenants Armstrong and Ambrose and SCPO Mendez had been escorted to this catwalk through a series of corridors and high-security biometric vaults into the bowels of the stealth, cruiser point of no return. The security officers had then left them standing at attention on the catwalk and sealed the vault-like door behind them. Below the metal grating of the catwalk, the shadows swallowed all sound. Three meters to Matt's left was a slightly curved white wall. No door. Beyond was Odin's Eye, the high-security conference room where he'd first been told of the Spartan EI program by Colonel Ackerson. Think this is some Section 3 test? Mendez finally whispered. Or maybe someone doesn't like getting news about the lousy selection results for the beta company candidates. I don't know about you guys, Matt said, but I have a bad feeling about this. I'm not sure, Kurt replied. My requested upgrades for the Mark II SPI armor were over budget. Mendez raised an eyebrow. Where did you hear that? The new AI talks a lot, Kurt said. Deep Winter, muttered Mendez. I wonder if AIs pick their own names, or if some officer in Section 3 does it. Matt was about to offer his opinion when he noticed there now was a door in the curved white wall. Colonel Ackerson stood there. Gentlemen, join us. Ackerson then retreated into a brightly lit chamber. When they entered, Matt had to squint his eyes for a couple of seconds because of the bright light. Matt noticed that he hadn't met their eyes. That was always a bad sign. They entered, and as he crossed the threshold, Matt felt static crawl over his skin. The concave illuminated walls of the chamber were disorienting. Kurt focused on the center of the half-spherical room, on the black conference table. Two officers sat there, gazing at holographic screens that floated in the air over its surface. Ackerson waved them closer. A woman sat with her back to them, opposite her sat a middle-aged gentleman. The man was gray and balding. The woman appeared older than regs permitted before mandatory retirement. Her osteoporotic slump, slender frail arms, and thinning white hair indicated extreme age. Matt froze as he spotted the one and three star rank insignia on their collars and the trio snapped off a salute. Vice Admiral, ma'am, they said in unison. Rear Admiral, sir. The Vice Admiral ignored Mendez and scrutinized Matt and Kurt. Sit, she said, the three of you. Matt didn't recognize either of these high-ranking officers, and they didn't bother to introduce themselves. He did as he was ordered, as did Mendez and Kurt. Even sitting, though, his back was ramrod straight, his chest out, and eyes forward. We were reviewing the record of your Spartan EI since they went operational nine months ago, she said. Impressive. The rear admiral gestured at floating holographic panes that contained after-action reports, still shots of battlefields filled with Covenant corpses and ship damage assessment profiles. The insurrection of Memor, he said that nasty business at New Constantinople, actions in the Bonanza asteroid belt and the Fargon colony platforms, and half a dozen other engagements, this reads like the campaign record of a cracking good battalion, not a company of 300. Damned impressive. That was only a fraction of the Spartan EI program potential, Colonel Ackerson said. His eyes stared at some distant point. I'm sorry, ma'am, Matt and Kurt said in unison. Was. The vice admiral stiffened. It was clear that she was not accustomed to her junior officers asking questions. But Matt had to. These were his men and women they were talking about. He'd kept his eyes and ears open for news on Alpha Company, and had cultivated intelligence sources outside ONI, Section 3, and Beta 5. Being commandant of Camp Koi he had its privileges, and he had learned how to use them. He had managed to track his Spartans during the last seven months until his sources had mysteriously gone silent six days ago. Only the AI Deep Winter had given a clue as to their whereabouts Operation Prometheus. Tell me about the selection process for the next class of Spartan EIs, the Vice Admiral asked Kurt. Ma'am, Kurt said, we are operating under Colonel Ackerson's expanded selection criteria, but there are not enough age-appropriate genetic matches to meet the larger second-class target number. There are sufficient genetic matches, Colonel Ackerson corrected. His face was an impassive mask. What's missing are data to find additional matches. We need to prescribe mandatory genetic screening in the outer colonies. Those untapped populations are. That's the last thing we need in the outer colonies, the rear admiral said. We're just getting a handle on a near civil war. You tell an OC they got to register their kids' genes, and they'll all be reaching for their rifles. The vice admiral steepled her withered hands. Say it is part of a vaccine program. We take a microscopic sample as we inject the children. Inform no one. 
The rear admiral looked dubious but offered no further comment. Go on. Lieutenant, she said to Kurt when raised his hand. We have identified 375 candidates, Kurt said. Slightly less than we started with for Alpha Company, but we have learned from our mistakes. We will be able to graduate a much higher percentage this time. He nodded toward Mendez to give the chief and Matt the credit they richly deserved. Mendez sat completely still and Matt sat ramrod straight in his seat, his face impassive. Kurt saw that the chief wore his poker face. Matt's face was impassive. Every instinct Matt had screamed that something was wrong here. But, the rear admiral said, that's nowhere near the 1000 projection for the second wave. A brief scowl played over Ackerson's lip. No, sir. The vice admiral set her hands flat on the table and leaned closer to Kurt. What if we loosen the new genetic selection criteria? Matt took note of the we in her question. There was a subtle shift in the power structure at the table. With a single word, the vice admiral had made Kurt, Matt, and Mendez a part of their group. Our new bio-augmentation protocols target a very specific genetic set. Any deviation from that set would geometrically increase the failure rate, Kurt said. The thought of dozens of Spartans being tortured and ultimately crippled as they lay helpless in a medical bay filled him with revulsion. He managed to contain the feeling. The vice admiral raised one threadbare brow. You've done your homework, lieutenant. However, as our augmentation technology improves, Ackerson said, one day we will be able to expand the selection parameters, maybe to include the entire general population. But not today, Colonel, the rear admiral said, and sighed. So we're back to about 300 Spartan eyes. That will have to do then. Matt wanted to correct him. 300 new Spartans plus those in Alpha Company. Let's move on to the review of Alpha and Operation Prometheus, the Vice Admiral said, and her face darkened. Colonel Ackerson cleared his throat. Operation Prometheus occurred on the Covenant manufacturing site designated as K749. A holographic asteroid materialized drifting over the table, a rock with molten cracks that made a spiderweb pattern over its surface. K749 was discovered when the Prowler Razor's Edge managed to attach a telemetry probe on an enemy frigate during the Battle of New Harmony, Ackerson said. They then followed the craft through slip space, the first and only time this technology has actually worked, I might add. And they discovered this rock 17 light years past the UNSC outer boundary. The image magnified, revealing medaltitude images of factories on the surface that belched smoke and cinder, and showed that the volcanic fissures were canals of flowing molten metal. A gossamer lattice surrounded the asteroid, tiny lights winked on the filaments, and black specks drifted near. Spectral enhancement, the rear admiral said, showed us what they're using all that metal for. The view shifted closer. The lattice work girders were 100 meter wide beams, and the black specks appeared to be the bones of whales in orbit over K749, a dozen partially constructed Covenant warships. Matt had a difficult time believing what he was seeing. So many ships. How large was the Covenant fleet? And only 17 light years from the UNSC frontier. It could be nothing less than a prelude to an allowed assault. K749 is one large orbital shipyard, Ackerson explained. All the apparent volcanism is artificial, created by these. He tapped his tablet once more. Thirty infrared dots appeared on the surface of the asteroid. High-output plasma reactors that queefy metallurgical components, which are refined, shaped, and then transported via gravity beams for final assembly. The Prometheus op was a high-risk insertion onto the surface of K749, the rear admiral explained. 300 Spartans hit the dirt at 0700, July 27. Their mission was to disable as many of these reactors as possible, enough so the liquid contents of the facility would solidify and permanently clog their capacity to produce the alloy. Colonel Ackerson then tapped the holographic display. Star's system and team can recorded Alpha Company's process. A handful of the hot infrared points on the asteroid's surface flared and then cooled to black. Initial resistance was light. Ackerson tapped a button and a new window opened. On this display, Spartans in semi-powered infiltration armor systems moved, their camouflaged patterns shifting imperfectly against the molten metal and black smoke of the factory Kurt wished his suggested upgrades for the SPI armor software had been implemented before Alpha had graduated. There was a burp of suppressed submachine gunfire, and a pod of grunt salve workers fell dead. After two days, the admiral said, Seven rectors were rendered inoperative and a counterforce was finally organized by existing Covenant units. 
a new video feed appeared. The vulture-like jackals moved in squads through large courtyards and filed over archways. They were more organized than their grunt counterparts, and they worked in fire teams, methodically clearing section by section. But Kurt and Matt knew their Spartans wouldn't be cornered. They would be the hunters. Thirty jackals moved into a circular court, where engineers tended a churning pool of molten steel. The jackals cleared every hiding spot, and then started to cross, warily scanning the rooftops. Flagstones exploded and sent the jackals sprawling. Sniper fire took out the stunned aliens before they could get their shields in place. The Covenant counter-response was neutralized, the rear admiral continued, and over the next three days, Alpha Company destroyed 13 more reactors. The large infrared asteroid wide view changed. Two-thirds of the surface had cooled to dull red. But, the rear admiral said, a massive counterforce appeared in orbit and descended to the surface. Colonel Ackerson opened three more holographic windows Spartan eyes engaged elites on the ground, trading fire from cover. Banshee flyers swooped down from building roofs, two Spartans fired shoulder-launched surface-war missiles and stopped the air assault cold. On day seven, the admiral said, additional Covenant reinforcements arrived. The video from a helmet camera showed a dozen Spartan eyes limping and falling on a smoldering landscape of twisted metal. There was no unit cohesion. No Tuman teams covering one another. In the heat-blurred background, elites took up superior positions with good cover. By now, the rear admiral said, 89% of the reactors had been destroyed. Sufficient cooling had occurred to permanently shut the operation down. Alpha Company was cut off from their Calypso exfiltration craft. The window showing the Spartan eyes tilted sideways as the owner of the helmet cam fell. Ackerson rotated the holographic display 90 degrees to rectify the image. Three Spartans remained standing, firing suppressing bursts from their MA-5KS behind a crashed Banshee flyer. Then they broke from the cover and sprinted, a second before the flyer was destroyed by an energy mortar. IFF tags at the bottom of the screen identified these Spartans as Robert, Shane, and, carried between them, Jane. She had been the first candidate to jump that first night of indoctrination. Team BIO appeared in another window. Robert's and Shane's blood pressure was close to the hypertensive limit. Jane's biosigns were flatlined. Seeing them like this, it felt like someone had driven a metal spike into Matt's chest. A pair of hulking Covenant hunters blocked the Spartans' retreat. They raised their tumeter long fuel rod arm cannons. Robert unloaded his assault rifle at them, which hardly made the pair flinch as it sponged off their thick armor. Shane switched to his sniper rifle and shot through one hunter's unarmed midsection and then pumped two rounds into the other's vulnerable abdomen. They both went down, but still moved, only momentarily incapacitated. Elite fire teams, meanwhile, popped up on either side and unleashed a volley of needles and plasma shot. Robert caught a blot of plasma in the stomach, it stuck there, burning through his SPI armor-like paper. Screaming, he managed to reload and spray his MA-5B on full auto at the elite who had shot him. Team BIO showed his heart in full arrest, but he still grabbed a grenade, pulled the pin, and lobbed it at the enemy fire team, and then he fell. Shane paused to look at Robert and Jane, then turned back to the elite fire team, and shot in three-round controlled bursts. More elites appeared, surrounding the lone Spartan. Shane's rifle clacked, empty. He pulled out his M6 pistol and continued to fire. An energy motor detonated like a small sun two meters away. Shane tumbled through the air and landed prone, unmoving. And that's all we have, Colonel Ackerson stated. Matt continued to stare at the screen of static, his heart racing, half expecting the feed to go live again and show Shane gather up Robert and Jane, and together they'd limp off the battlefield, wounded, but alive. Seven years Matt and Kurt had trained them and grown to respect them. Now they were dead. Their sacrifice had saved countless human lives, and yet Matt still felt like he'd lost everything. He wanted to look away from the screen, but couldn't. This was his fault. He had failed them. His training hadn't prepared them. He should have rectified the flaws in their Mark I PR suits and fixed them faster. Mendez reached over and tapped the colonel's tablet. The display mercifully blanked and faded away. Ackerson shot the chief a glare, but Mendez ignored him. Recent drone recon shows the entire complex cold, the rear admiral said. No more ships will be built at K749. Just to clarify, Kurt whispered, and then he paused to clear his throat. There were no survivors of Operation Prometheus. It is regrettable. 
the vice admiral said with the slightest softness now in her voice, but we would do it again if presented with a similar opportunity, lieutenant. Such a facility within two weeks' journey of the UNSC outer colonies. Your Spartans prevented the building of a covenant armada that would have resulted in nothing less than the massacre of billions. They are heroes. Ashes. That's all Matt felt. Matt saw Kurt glance at Mendez. There was no emotion on his face. The men held his pain well. I understand, ma'am, Kurt said. Good, she said. All trace of pity had now evaporated from her tone. I've put you in for a promotion. Your Spartans performed well above the program's projected parameters. You are to be commended. And you Lieutenant Armstrong are also being given a promotion, the Vice Admiral said. Matt felt the only thing he deserved was a court-martial, but he said nothing. Now I want you to focus and accelerate the training of the Beta Company Spartans, she said. We have a war to win. Matt, Kurt, and Mendez got up to leave the room, but a voice called back to them. Lieutenant Armstrong, will you stay for a minute? The Vice Admiral said. Yes, ma'am, he replied. Matt turned and mouthed to Kurt and Mendez, wait for me outside. I'll come when I'm finished. They nodded and walked out the door. Matt walked back and sat down in the chair he had occupied minutes earlier. You wanted to see me, ma'am? He asked. Yes, she said. We have approved a request for you to participate on an extremely classified mission. What's the mission, ma'am? He asked as he sat straighter in his seat. You will be going on a mission to assassinate a black arms dealer by the name of Vladimir Zemo, she said. You will be leaving this ship directly after this talk and going to the hangar bay where an ONI prowler is waiting for you. Ma'am, how long will this mission take? And will I be back in time to meet the Beta Company candidates? He asked. This mission should only take about two weeks, and yes, you will be back in time to meet the candidates. Yes, ma'am, he said. All mission details will be sent to your datapad as soon as this talk is completed, she said. Is there anything else you'd like to ask? Yes, ma'am, he said. I was wondering who requested me. The one and only Captain Jack Pravdin, she replied. You must have made quite an impression on him for him to pick you over all the other ONI specialists trained in long-range combat. He picked me over everyone else, ma'am. Yes, she said. And his exact words were, none of these guys are good enough to hit a shot at this range. I want the best and I know exactly who that is. Matt sat even straighter in his seat and he could feel his chest filling with pride. He would be able to see his old mentor again. Matt didn't have the heart to tell the vice admiral that Captain Pravdin was his former mentor. If you don't have any more questions, then this talk is over, the vice admiral said. Yes, ma'am, I have just one more question. Go ahead. You mentioned something about a promotion, ma'am, Matt asked. Yes, I did. Here you go, the vice admiral said as she slid a datapad across the small space between them. Matt picked it up and glanced at it. He saw his personal file pop up and he saw his rank change from lieutenant junior grade to lieutenant. Congratulations. You earned it, the vice admiral said. Matt didn't feel like he deserved a promotion at all. He felt like he deserved a court-martial or hell even a demotion, but in the end, he replied, thank you, ma'am. Now with that out of the way, is there anything else you wish to know? Matt shook his head. No, ma'am. I think that's all I need to know for now. Good, she said. You're dismissed. Godspeed and good hunting, Lieutenant. Thank you, ma'am. He said as he stood up, saluted, and walked out the door. Kurt and Mendez were waiting outside. What did the Vice Admiral want to talk to you about? Kurt asked. Well apparently, I'm being sent on an extremely classified assassination mission. Oh, Kurt said. When will you leave? Right now. I'm heading to the hangar to get on an ONI prowler that's currently waiting for me, he replied. Good luck then, Kurt said. Will you be back in time to meet the new candidates? Yes I should, he said. The mission should take about two weeks, then I'll be back at Camp Kirahi. Well, Mendez said. Good luck and Godspeed. Thanks, Chief, he said as he shook Mendez's hand. Good hunting, Kurt said as he held out his hand. Matt shook Kurt's hand and said, I'll be back before you know it. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 15 Mission is a go. Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, 
I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 15 Mission is a Go Location UNSC Red Horse, en route to Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Earth, August 3, 2537, 0600 hours. Matt snapped his eyes open and looked around the room. He was lying on his bed on board the ONI Prowler. Strangely, he didn't have a nightmare last night. He had been on board the Prowler for four days now, and he was getting restless. He wanted to get the mission started, but it would take about a week to reach Earth and then he would see his old mentor again for the first time in 18 years. He had been ecstatic to learn he had heard that Jack had selected him for a mission. He always enjoyed being around Jack because he was a friendly man. Matt sat up and swung his legs to the floor. He reached over to the table by his bed and grabbed onto the table until he was resting on top of it. After he had pressed his finger to the biometric, the pad turned on and immediately looked at the details of the mission he had already looked at many times before. Vladimir Zemo was born on June 7, 2494, on Earth. In particular, he was born in Voi, Africa. He had a normal childhood growing up, but after he completed school, he joined the insurgents in the fight against the United Earth government. After a few years, he left the insurgents and became a black market arms dealer. According to intelligence reports, the city of Mombasa, Africa was being used as a trading point for Zemo to trade gold and spent uranium rods that he had somehow acquired to give to the insurgents in exchange for weapons and nuclear materials. The city of Mombasa had a nuclear accident 10 years ago. It was caused by the nuclear power plant there, exploded, and radiation leaked out into the air. The event was called the Mombasa Disaster or more simply, Mombasa. Now after 10 years, the place was a ghost town. There were still pockets of radiation all of over the area around Mombasa. The least likely place for a spent uranium rod and gold exchange to take place. Matt supposed to rendezvous with Jack at space station Cairo above Earth, grab his equipment, make final mission checks, and then head to down to the city of Mombasa by Pelican to start the mission. Once on the ground, they would make their way to the abandoned Hotel Policia, go to the top floor, wait and eliminate Zemo when he came for the meeting, which was only three days away. Matt turned the pad off, got up and stretched. After dressing, he walked down the long and narrow corridors to the mess hall on board the ship to get some breakfast. After piling his plate scrambled eggs, bacon, sausage, and toast he found an empty table near the back of the room, sat down and began eating. As he was eating, Matt kept thinking about what Jack would look like after 18 years. He was pretty sure he'd age quite a bit and look older now. No matter how old Jack was, Matt would always be happy to see him. After finishing his food and putting his dirty tray in a bin, he headed to the gym to work out. He began with some simple arm curls, push-ups, and curl-ups. He then walked over to a punching bag and suspended it from the ceiling by a chain. He got into a fighting stance and began punching the bag. After about an hour, he stopped, grabbed the towel he had brought with him on the floor, and wiped the sweat from his face. He walked back to his room and laid down on his bed and fell asleep for a few hours. When he woke, he saw that the time read 1,400 hours. He heard a tapping on his door. He got up, made sure he was presentable and said, Come in. The door opened and an ONI sergeant stepped into the room. Lieutenant, sir, we are about to exit slip space. Thank you, sergeant. Please tell the captain I'll be up to the bridge shortly, he said. The sergeant nodded and left the room to do as instructed. Matt quickly dressed and headed to the bridge. When he entered, the captain turned in his seat and said, Ah, oh, there you are, lieutenant. We will be exiting slip space in about. Suddenly, the ship exited slip space, interrupting whatever the captain was going to say. Or we will be exiting slip space now, the captain said. Matt saw the space station Cairo in the distance. Is there a pelican ready to take me to the Cairo, captain? He asked. No, we will be docking soon on board the Cairo, then you may exit the ship, the captain said. Did you enjoy your stay? Yes, sir, I did. Thank you. He replied as he spun around and headed for the door. I shall leave you now, captain, to go pack my stuff. Very well, the captain said. Good luck on your mission. Thank you, sir. Matt exited the room and walked back to his room to collect his possessions that he had brought with him, which weren't much. He only brought his bag with clothes, toilets, extra uniforms, and his cookery knives. As he was finishing up, he heard the ship dock with the Cairo. He grabbed his bag and headed to the boarding ramp to exit the ship. 
Once he got there, he saw men unloading cargo off the ship. He waited a few minutes until most of the cargo was unloaded, then started walking down the ramp. When he was got off the ramp, he saw Jack standing near the cargo that had been unloaded. Jack looked older. His hair now had a shade of silver showing and face looked aged. Matt started walking towards him. Captain, Sir Matt said as he saluted. Jack returned the salute. At ease and you know you don't have to salute me. Matt simply shrugged. Old habits die hard. Indeed they do. Matt, it's good to see you again, Jack said as he held out his hand. It's good to see you too, Jack, he said as he shook Jack's hand. I assume you were briefed on the details of the mission. He asked. Yes, I was, he replied. Good. Follow me. Jack said as he turned and started walking out of the hangar. They walked down several corridors, then turned right at an intersection and stopped at a door. This is my office, Jack said as they entered. Inside was a desk with a woman sitting behind it. The woman had blonde hair and brown eyes. There were also several chairs pushed in a line along the right side of the room. The woman looked up when she heard them enter. Janice, this my old protege, Matt, Jack said as he introduced him. And Matt, this is my assistant, Janice. Pleasure to meet you, ma'am, he said to her as he held out his hand. You too, she replied with a smile on her face. So, you're the young man the captain trained when you were eight years old. He hesitated then said, yes, I am. He turned to Jack and asked, you told her who I was. Jack shrugged and said, I only told her a little bit. I should have this paperwork done in five minutes, Captain, Janice said. Thank you, Janice, Jack replied as he motioned for Matt to follow him. We'll be in my office. You just knock before you enter. Yes, sir. Matt followed Jack back to another room. Inside was a desk with several picture frames and a chip on either side of the desk. Jack went behind the desk and sat down. Sit, he said as he gestured to the seat in front of the desk. We have much to discuss. Matt took his seat as instructed. So, how have you been? Jack asked. Good, he said. I was reassigned as I'm pretty sure you remember. Of course. I remember everything you told me when you called me five years ago. Can you tell me anything about this assignment you were doing? Unfortunately, no. I'm afraid that's classified, Matt said. Jack blew out a breath. I'll find out, eventually. You know I have a lot of resources, Matt sighed. I know you do, but as I said, it's classified. Well, orders are orders, Jack said as he sighed. So what weapons will we be using on the mission? Matt asked. Jack opened his mouth to reply, but a knock on the door interrupted him. Come in he called. The door opened and Janice stepped inside. She had a stack of paper in her hands. I have all the paperwork down, sir, she said as she stepped toward the desk. Good. Thanks, Janice. Jack replied as he stood up and reached for the papers Janice was holding. Janice handed him the papers, turned around and walked out. What's on those papers? Matt asked. Your signed request orders and firearm orders, Jack replied as he put the papers in a folder. Which reminds me, I have to ask you something, Matt said. Oh I know what you're going to ask, he said with a small smile on his face. You're going to ask, what weapons will we be using on the mission, right? Yes, Matt said. Don't sound so surprised, Matt, Jack replied. I know you too well. Yeah, you do, Matt said as he chuckled. Jack chuckled as well. Well, back to your question. We will be using M392 DMRs and the SRS-99 to make the kill. Matt remembered the M392 DMR well. It was a bullpup, gas-operated firearm that fired 7.62mm rounds. It was a single-shot, semi-automatic firearm. The M392 DMR went into service in 2512 and it served as the Army Marksman primary weapon and it was also used by reconnaissance teams. A single M392 DMR clip held a 15-round box magazine. The M392 DMR was a good weapon at medium to long range, but it sucked in close quarters combat because it was a single-shot, semi-automatic weapon. For the mission, they would be using suppressors on their DMRs so that, that they could get to the Hotel Policia safely. Once they made the shot, they would most likely be compromised and wouldn't need the suppressors any longer. Who's going to make the shot? Matt asked. You are, Jack said as he pointed at him. I will ID the target and confirm the kill once you shot. Who's carrying the big gun? He asked. You are, Jack said again. Matt smiled and nodded. All right. 
That sounds like a plan, he said. Good. Follow me, Jack said as he stood up. Where are we going? Matt asked. The armory. We're going to prep our gear, then take a pelican down to the surface. Jack said as he stood up and started walking towards the door. Matt followed him. They walked down three corridors until they reached a heavy metal door that read armory above the door. They entered and started collecting the necessary weapons for the mission. Jack pointed to a pair of bags on a nearby table. Put your weapons in the bag on the left, he said. Matt nodded and began picking up his gear and putting it in the bag Jack had told him to. I'll be right back. I'm going to get a pelican ready for takeoff, Jack said as he started walking out of the armory. Got it, Matt replied. If you don't mind putting my gear in my bag, that would be nice, he called back. No, I don't mind at all. Good, he said. I'll be back in a few. Matt watched him leave, then finished packing his gear. He just finished packing Jack's gear before he walked back into the armory. Finished packing? Jack asked. Yep, we're all set. He replied as he picked up his bag and sling it over his shoulder. He then picked up Jack's and handed his bag to him. Thanks, Jack said. Matt nodded. Green light for the mission. Affirmative, the mission is a go. They walked out of the armory and headed towards the hangar bay. Once they got to the hangar, they saw a pelican waiting for takeoff. They walked over and saw the pilot standing outside the pelican, waiting for them. Captain, it's good to see you again. Lieutenant, sir, he said as they approached. They returned the salute. Corporal, they said in unison. We will be departing in five mics. We just have to make some last minutes checks in the pelican and then we'll get you to where you need to be. The pilot said as they walked past him. They boarded the pelican and sat down. Do you know these guys? Matt asked. This crew had flown me to many places. I trust them. Jack replied as he stored his bag in an overhead compartment. Well if this crew has people you trust, I trust them. Matt as he also stored his bag in an overhead compartment. Jack laughed. I figured you'd say that. Matt cracked a small smile. What does Claire think about you going on this mission? He asked. She doesn't like it, as always. Then again, she's never liked me going on missions because I might get killed, he replied. Matt nodded in understanding. I can see why. How is she doing? How are the kids doing? Jack sighed and leaned back against the headrest behind him. They're all doing fine. They all miss me, though. Well, you are her husband and their father. Of course, they're going to miss you, Matt said. I guess you have a point, he said. Is this pelican taking us to the drop-off point and extracting us? Matt asked. Yes. The call sign is Delta 24, aka Big Bird. And before you ask, the ride to the surface should take about 30 minutes. Jack replied. Matt nodded and leaned his head back. Will you wake me up when we're almost to the surface? Sure. Will do. Thanks. Remember, stay alert, stay alive. Matt chuckled and said, always. He then closed one eye and fell asleep. Approximately 25 minutes later, Jack nudged him awake. We're almost at the drop-off point. Grab your gear, he said. Matt got his bag down from the overhead compartment and opened it. He then started to check to make sure all of the weapons were loaded and his cookery knives were in their holsters. The pelican hit the ground five minutes later and ramp lowered. Before they got off, the pilot came out of the cockpit and said, We'll be on station ready to pick you up. Just give us a holler when you need us. Understood, Jack said they started walking down the ramp. Good luck, sir, and good hunting, the pilot said before he hit the switch to close the ramp. Thank you, Jack said. They watched as the pelican took off and returned to the nearest UNSC base. We'll walk for a bit then set up camp for the night. Tomorrow we'll start making our way to the hotel where we're going to make the assassination. Jack said. Matt nodded. Roger that. They walked for about seven miles through the tall grass before they made camp for the night. They made camp in the woods around Mombasa. They made a small fire, ate miseries, after and took two-hour watches on and off. Matt took the first watch. Hopefully, this mission won't be that hard. Then again, not a single mission should never be called easy, he thought. After his first two-hour watch, Jack took over. Matt leaned back against a nearby tree, closed one eye, and fell asleep. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 16 All Gillied Up.
Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 16 All Gillied Up Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Earth, Outskirts of Mombasa, August 4, 2537, 0, 0500 hours. Matt snapped his one eye open and grabbed for one of his two cookery knives and jumped to his feet, anticipating an attack. He saw a person standing in front of him and tackled him. He then put his knife against the man's throat, ready to kill the man, but he then remembered where he was. He was on a mission to assassinate a black arms dealer. They were on the outskirts of Mombasa. He looked and saw Jack under him holding his hands up in mock surrender. Easy Matt, it's just me. Here, he said as Matt helped him up. I was only bringing you some foliage. Start making your ghillie suit. We move out in an hour. Sorry about almost killing you, Matt said. Hey don't mention it. It's fine. I know it's just because of the stuff I taught you, Jack replied. Anyway like I said, start making your ghillie suit. Matt nodded, stretched, then got to work making his ghillie suit. He reached into his bag and pulled out netting and burlap straps. He then took the burlap and wove it into the netting, then he added the foliage on top. Once he was finished making the ghillie suit, for this mission, he wasn't wearing his Mjolnir armor. He was wearing a modified ODST uniform. It was modified to fit him since the largest size uniform didn't fit him. He put it around his uniform and started to gather his weapons. He took out his DMR and slapped a fresh clip in the rifle, then he took out his two M6 sidearms with suppressors and holstered them on his either side of his hips. He then took his Kukri knives and strapped them to shoulder holsters on either side. He took out the SRS-99 sniper rifle and put it on his back. He looked up when he heard Jack approaching. You ready to get this done? He asked. Matt nodded. Ready as I'll ever be, he replied confidently. Good. Let's move out, Jack said. They began walking north-northwest until they saw a shack in the distance. Get down, Jack said as he went prone. They began crawling their way toward the shack until they were ten meters away from the shack. Too much radiation. We'll have to go around, Jack said as he studied the area and pulled out his DMR. Matt crouched and pulled out his own DMR. Follow me, and keep low, Jack said as he came out of the tall grass. Careful. There are pockets of radiation all over this area. If you absorb too much, you're a dead man. They moved up to the shack and prepared to enter. Jack held up his hand in a fist, indicating that Matt freeze. Stand by. They moved through the shack and reached the exit. Jack stopped at the exit and said, Contact. Enemy patrol dead ahead. Stay low and move slowly. We'll be impossible to spot in our ghillie suits. They went prone and started to crawl their way through the grass. Take one out when the other's not looking, Jack said quietly. Matt raised his DMR to his face and looked through the Avad 3X scope. He aimed at the guard that was walking to the left. He steadied his breathing and squeezed the trigger slowly. The bullet left the gun and hit the insurgent in the head. He's down, Matt reported. A second later, Jack fired. Good night. Move. They moved up to another shack by an old-looking house. Hold up, Jack said as he took cover behind the wooden planks in front of them. He scanned the area then said, there's more cover if we go around. They moved left around the shack since the right side was wide open and provided little to no cover at all. They moved towards the house and peeked through the small window. Inside, they saw four insurgents playing some sort of card game and two dogs were sleeping on the couch. Jack pointed to his own eyes, then at the insurgents inside the house. Four tangos inside. Don't even think about it. Not a chance would I think about blowing our cover like that, Jack. I'm not that stupid. Matt thought to himself. They moved a short distance to the side of the house and hid behind a corner. Jack peeked out and said, wait there. Tango by the car. He pointed to a position nearby. Matt went to where Jack told him to and waited. He raised his rifle when he saw the insurgent by a very beat up car. There was a tree next to the car and Matt saw a clear angle he could shoot through. The tree had a small gap through the branches that looked like a V. Take him out quietly or just let him pass. Your call, Jack said. Matt fired and killed the insurgent through the gap in the tree. He's down, he reported. Okay, go move up, Jack said. They traveled past the dead insurgent, jumped over a fence and headed towards a church. Suddenly, Jack stopped and got behind a tree. Matt followed. Don't move. We've got a lookout in the church tower, 
and a patrol coming in from the north. Let's move up for a better view, Jack said. They slowly moved up to the next tree. Do you have a shot on the lookout? Jack asked. Aye, Matt said as he shot and killed the lookout in the church tower. He's down. Beautiful. Target approaching from the north. Take him out quietly or just let him pass. Your call, Jack said. Well, I already killed the lookout in the tower. If that patrol to the north goes inside the church and sees the body, we'll be compromised. I'll have to drop him, and fast, Matt thought to himself. Matt raised his DMR and easily took the patrolling insurgent. Tango down, he said. Go Jack said as they moved up and hid behind a blue car. Forward area clear. They moved to the door to the church. Jack slowly opened the door and inspected the area for any hostels. Matt covered their six. At the end of the hallway was a side door that led to a cemetery. Jack peeked out and checked the area. The coast is clear. They walked through the cemetery and were about to exit when they heard the distant sound of a UH-144 Falcon in the distance. You hear that? Matt asked. I, I do. Enemy Falcon, get down, Jack said as they quickly ran to a wall that could hide behind. Stay in the shadows, Jack advised. The enemy Falcon flew past them. Phew, that was close, Matt said. Indeed, Jack said. Let's keep moving. This way. They moved through the cemetery and up to a road. They approached an open field with a destroyed and burnt out scorpion tank and high grass. They jumped over the fence and started making their way through the field. Matt heard a rumbling sound in the distance. Get down, now Jack said. They both immediately went prone and began crawling through the grass. They saw a convey of scorpion tanks and insurgents approaching them, but the two UNSC soldiers went unseen. Easy lad. There's too many of them, let them go. Keep a low profile and hold your fire. Jack said quietly as they crawled through the grass. Try to anticipate their paths. If you have to maneuver, do it slow and steady, no quick movements. They stopped moving and let the convoy pass by them, unaware of their presence. As the convoy was passing by, Matt could hear his heart beating a million miles a minute. Okay, let's move. Nice and slow. Jack said as the convoy passed by them. They moved clear of the convey and approached a junkyard. Jack stood up. Follow me, he said. Matt stood up and followed him. They saw two soldiers up ahead throwing dead bodies into a river. They could see a conversation going on between the two soldiers, but the two UNSC soldiers ignored them for the time being. They would come back to them later. Matt was sure they would come back and take them out soon enough. Matt looked towards the two insurgents throwing the bodies into the river. Looks like they've already eliminated the men they couldn't buy out, he said as they took cover behind a scorpion tank. Jack nodded in agreement and said, yeah, unlucky bastards. Let's move up for a better view. As they moved closer, they saw two insurgents patrolling the area. Jack spotted another group sitting around a table inside a container. They moved behind a yellow tractor for cover. Taking M out without alerting the rest isn't going to be easy. But then again, neither is sneaking past them. Your call, Jack said. Matt took aim at the insurgent that was further away and dropped him with an easy headshot. Target eliminated, he said. Jack shot the other one before he could notice his friend was dead. Topped him. Don't fire on the two by the truck. We'll have to take them out at the same time. Wait for me to get into position. Jack crawled a short distance to a nearly destroyed tank. I'm in position. He said as he moved to a crouch stance. Take the shot when you're ready. Matt raised his DMR and shot the insurgent on the right side of the truck. Jack took out the other one a split second later. Good night, Jack said. They ordered to move further into the junkyard. Stay in the shadows, Jack said as they moved behind a crate that had some shade. Stay back, Jack said as he held up his hand in a fist for Matt to stop. Jack spotted a guard up ahead. Stay low, he's mine. Jack snuck up behind the guard. Oi, Susie he said. The guard turned around at the sound of the voice, but Jack ran up to him and hit the guard in the head with the butt of his DMR. That's how it's done, Jack said with a smile. Let's go. They moved up to another set of containers. They heard a guard approaching. Hold up. Wait here, Jack said as he quickly and quietly moved behind a near container across from Matt. We should wait a bit, let's see if the guard makes another pass. Patrol coming this, stay back, he warned. The guard walked into an open container. Jack easily killed him. Tango down. Forward area clear. Go, Jack said. 
They advanced, sticking to the shadows. Around another container, they saw a group of three insurgents. Two were having a smoke and the third was taking a nap in a metal chair propped up on its back legs. Shoo, Jack hissed. Stay hidden. Move up. This way. Let's go. Matt saw a laptop nearby. Jack, I see intel, he hissed. If you can grab without alerting the guards, go for it, Jack replied. Matt managed to sneak behind the three guards quietly and snag the intel. When he returned to where Jack was standing, he nodded in approval and smiled. I'll say one thing, you certainly got the minerals. They then moved through a shipping container. Jack quietly nudged the shipping container open. It's a bloody convention out there. Get ready to move in my signal. Stay right behind me, Jack said. Hold. Okay, go. They quickly sprinted through the convey and hid behind some jeeps. Then they went prone and crawled under the vehicles. Let's go. There's a truck coming, we'll use it for cover. Keep moving, Jack said. As they kept crawling under the jeeps, the truck stopped and parked behind the jeeps. So they crawled further in, they saw another convoy approaching. Just wait for a moment. When they leave, crawl out and stay low, Jack said. Patience. Don't do anything stupid. As the soldiers left, Jack said, stand by. Stand by. Go. They crawled out from under the cover of the trucks. Ready. Go Jack said as they sprinted away from the convoy and hid behind another shipping container. Hold fast, Jack said as peeked out to see if any insurgents had spotted them. No one saw us, let's keep moving. This way. They came up to a large brick wall as they approached Mombasa. There was a four-story apartment building right in front of them. Suddenly, a sniper appeared at the top of the apartment building. Don't move. Sniper. Fire escape. Fourth floor. Dead ahead. Jack said as he pointed to the sniper. Take him out, or he'll give away our position. Matt took aim once more and blew the sniper's head off. The force of the shot caused the sniper to fall off the fire escape and he hit the ground with a sickening thud. Tango eliminated, Matt said softly. Beautiful, Jack remarked. Move out. Go. The two UNSC soldiers moved up and entered the apartment building. Area clear, Jack said as moved through the building. They came to a hole in the wall and jumped down and onto the street. They continued moving through the city of Mombasa to reach the hotel. Don't let your guard down. We're not there yet, Jack said. I'm always on guard for anything, Jack. It's what one of the many things you taught me, wasn't it? Matt thought. As they approached a building, they saw a wild dog up ahead that was feeding on a dead body. Jack held his hand in a fist. Stop. Leave it alone. It's a wild dog. Pooch doesn't look too friendly. Keep your distance. No need to attract any unnecessary attention, he said. They started to move past the dog. The dog saw them and started to bark and growl when it saw them, but it didn't attack them, much to Matt's relief. As they entered what appeared to be to a school at first glance, but it wasn't a school. It was the Palace of Culture. Jack peeked around the corner and said, Clear right. Go. They moved up to another wall, in which Jack did the same thing. Move up, he said when he saw no one. They walked up a set of stairs and moved through the building. As they proceeded through the Palace of Culture, Matt could hear the ghostly sounds of children playing. He also had a clear view of some abandoned buildings across Mombasa. Look at this place. 50,000 people used to live in this city. Now it's a ghost town. I've never seen anything like it, Jack remarked, astonished. Holy shit. 50,000 people used to live here and now they're all gone, Matt thought sadly. They stuck close to a wall. They approached a stairwell. Jack once again peeked around the corner and said, move. They continued to move through the building. This way. Let's go. Jack said as they walked down some stairs and approached the exit. They exited the building and saw the hotel in the distance. They stopped for a second to study the hotel. There's the hotel. Jack pointed. We should be able to observe the exchange from the top floor up there. Let's move. After observing the hotel for a few more seconds, the duo began making their way to the hotel. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 17 One Shot, One Kill. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 17 One Shot, One Kill.
Three days later, Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Earth, Mombasa, August 7, 2537, 0900 hours. Captain Jack Pravdin and Lieutenant Matt Armstrong were lying prone and waiting at the top floor of the hotel. Jack was looking through a set of spotting binoculars, while Matt was assembling the SRS-99 sniper rifle. After Matt had finished assembling the rifle, he set up the bipod and grabbed his own set of binoculars. Suddenly, Jack saw that the meeting was starting. Lieutenant Armstrong, the meeting in is underway. Enemy transport sighted entering the target area, he said as he motioned Matt to mend the sniper rifle. Matt put his binoculars away, checked the rifle for what seemed like the thousandth time to make sure it was loaded, then got behind the rifle and looked through the sniper scope. Once he put his eye to the scope, he saw the electronics inside the rifle turn on. The electronics said, Target Vladimir Zemo, distance to target 896.7 M, bullet travel time 1.05 S. Matt saw a pack of vehicles, crates, and several tables. One table had assault rifles on it. A second table had shotguns on it. A third had a rocket launcher on it. A fourth had three magnums. And a fifth had a mixed assortment of assault rifles, pistols, anti-personal mines, and rocket launchers on it. The wind's getting a bit choppy, Jack said as he studied the meeting. You can compensate for it or wait it out, but he might leave before it dies down. It's your call. Remember what I taught you. Keep in mind variable humidity and wind speed along the bullet's flight path. At this distance, you'll have also have to take the Coriolis effect into account. They saw another vehicle rolled up. It had an insurgent flag on it. Shortly after, their target appeared coming out of the vehicle that just pulled up, with a briefcase in his hands. Okay. I think I see him. Wait for my mark. Jack said as he started to acquire a lock on the target. Target acquired. I have a positive ID on Vladimir Zemo. Matt looked at the men he was ordered to kill and steadied his breathing. Steady, keep an eye on that flag, Jack said. Watch for any change in wind speed or direction. Zemo walked up to a set of crates, put the briefcase on it and opened it. The case was filled with gold. The flag by the vehicle kept flapping in the wind. Matt decided to wait until the wind died down. Once the wind had died down, he prepared to fire. Unfortunately, when he was about to squeeze the trigger, a falcon moved in front of his scope, blocking his view of the target. Ack, where did he come from? Matt asked, agitated. Patience laddie, wait for a clear shot, Jack said. The falcon flew away. Matt continued to aim at Zemo. Matt saw Zemo still talking with his dealers. Zemo raised his arms in frustration as if there was something wrong with the deal. Matt saw the wind die down and saw the flag gradually become still. Matt saw his chance, and maybe his last chance, to take the shot. It's now or never, take the shot Jack said. Matt fired the rifle. After 1.05s of flight time, the high caliber bullet hit Zemo in the chest. The man's body jumped slightly in the air from the impact of the bullet hitting him as though someone had scared him, spun around, and in the process, tore his left arm completely off his body. Target down. I think you blew off his arm, Jack said. Shock and blood loss will take care of the rest. A falcon suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Shit, they're onto us, Jack said. Take out that falcon, it'll buy us some time. Matt aimed at the cockpit. He saw the pilot inside. He aimed and quickly shot the pilot in the head. The bullet hit the man in the head, killing him and his blood and brain matter splattered all across the headrest behind him. The falcon spun out of control and exploded in a ball of fire. Great shot, Lieutenant. Jack commented. Now let's go they'll be searching for us. Matt and Jack both stood up and grabbed the rest of their gear. It's time to move Jack said as they finished grabbing the gear. They started running to a nearby window behind them. We'll have to take a shortcut follow my lead Jack said as he took out some rope. They tied their rope to the railing by the window and hooked up to the rope. They jumped over the railing and started to rappel down just as a second falcon showed up and blew up the top floor of the hotel. Once they reached the bottom, they unhooked and pulled out their DMRs. Lieutenant Armstrong, follow me Jack said. They started moving towards the LZ, which was near the Mombasa Ferris wheel. Delta 2-4, this is Alpha 6, Jack said. We have been compromised, I repeat we have been compromised, now heading to extraction point 4. Alpha 6, Big Bird is en route. ETA, 20 minutes. The pilot said, don't be late. We're stretching our fuel as it is. Out. Copy that, 
Big Bird, Jack said, we won't be late. A timer popped up on their HUDs showing 2000.00 and counting down by seconds. As they moved to the street they encountered a lot of insurgents. They took cover as the insurgents began firing on them. The UNSC duo began firing back. They would kill one, but two more would take his place. It seemed like there were endless amounts of insurgents. Forget these guys, we're going to get left behind let's get to the extraction point Jack said as they kept pushing forward. We've got to reach the extraction point before we run out of time. Keep moving. Go. They managed to take out enough insurgents and ran past the remaining insurgents, then they made a run for an apartment building. We'll lose them in that apartment come on Jack said. They moved quickly moved through the apartment. They climbed out of a window and landed in a small alley to reach another apartment. A dog suddenly appeared and ran towards them, but a fence stopped him. Matt raised his rifle and shot and killed the dog to shut it up. Dogs, he muttered. I hate dogs. They moved through the next apartment and when they reached the end, they saw enemy troops outside. Stand by. Jack said. Quick, plant an anti-personal mine by the door up ahead. Matt snuck to the door and planted a mine by the door as Jack instructed him to. One enemy started walking towards the door and then walked past the threshold. The mine triggered and killed him. Matt and Jack then started to engage the remaining insurgents outside the apartment. They moved out into an alley filled with tall grass and enemy troops started coming out of the apartment across from them. More behind us Matt cried out. They turned and started to engage the insurgents that had come out of the apartment behind them. Once all the enemies were taken out, they heard the familiar sound of a falcon approaching. Incoming falcon snipe the bastard Jack shouted. Matt, shoot the falcon's rotors we'll take it down together. They began shooting the falcon's twin tilt rotors and destroyed the rotors. The falcon started to spin around. Good night, you bastard, Jack said. Suddenly, the falcon hit the apartment, firing its missiles, and crashed towards the duo. Ah, fuck Matt cried. Run Jack shouted. They turned around and began hightailing it out of the area, hoping to not get killed by the crashing falcon that was coming towards them. As they were running, Matt saw Jack fall to the ground out of the corner of his eye. Jack fell, injuring his leg. Matt turned back to help his mentor and watched in horror as the falcon crashed to the ground and stopped just inches away from Jack. The craft's right tilt rotor was spinning slowly, nearly trapping the captain under, but Jack raised his arm and stopped it. Phew! At least I don't have to go to Claire and tell her that her husband died and she's now a widow, he thought. Matt ran over to him and asked, are you all right? Jack coughed violently. Shit my legs all messed up. I can't move. He said as he looked up at Matt. Sorry mate, but you're gonna have to carry me. Matt helped him up and started to carry him on his back. If we run into trouble, you'll have to find a spot to put me down so I can over you, Jack said. You got it, Matt replied. The extraction point is to the southwest, Jack said. We can still make it if we hurry. Then let's not waste any time, Matt said. Damn it, Jack murmured. Claire's gonna kill me. She's not gonna kill you, Matt shot back. If you say so, Matt, he said. If we get out of here alive, drinks are on me. Matt chuckled. I figured you'd say that. I know you too well. Jack laughed. Yeah, I suppose you do. As Matt carried Jack through the streets of Mombasa, they could hear insurgents coming towards them. Hostels coming in from the west. Enemies closing in, Jack said. Put me down in a good spot where I can cover you. Matt set Jack down by an old, rusty, and very beat up car. As most was setting him down, Jack said, careful. I'll call out target CI them, Jack said. Copy that, Matt replied. Okay, here they come. Stay down. Movement. Northwest. Matt looked up from behind a trash can that he was taking cover behind and saw a half dozen hostels. Matt and Jack raised their weapons and killed them quickly. Contact Southwest. Hostels closing in for the west. More coming in from the north. Jack called out. Once all the targets were eliminated, Jack said, it's time to move, give me a lift. Matt went and picked Jack up again. As Matt was picking him up, Jack said, easy now. Does it hurt? He asked, a little, but I can handle the pain. As the pair continued on, they encounter light resistance from the insurgents. I figured there'd be more resistance than this, Matt said. Oh, there will be. You just wait and see, Jack replied. They headed for an apartment. Head for that apartment, Jack pointed. We'll try to lose them in there. Oh, that's just great, Matt muttered. 
I take you don't like apartments, Jack said with a laugh. No, I'm just getting tired of apartments today, Matt replied. They entered the apartment and moved to the second floor. Set me down, here, Jack said. You go clear the rooms. Matt compiled and pulled out one of his M6 sidearms and one of his cookery knives. Still have those? Jack asked. Yeah, they've served me well so far. He nodded. Good. Now, go clear the rooms. I'll wait here. Matt nodded and advanced into the first room. He entered and checked every corner. Seeing no one, he moved to the room. When he entered, a dog burst out of a nearby closet and charged him, barking and growling loudly. The dog managed to tackle him to the ground and tried to rip his neck open. Matt struggled to defend himself and finally managed to grab hold of the barking dog's mouth, close it shut, and snap the dog's neck. Matt got up and retrieved his fallen weapons. As he approached the third room, it burst open and an insurgent wielding an assault rifle opened fire, spraying rapidly. Matt shot him twice in the head, once between the eyes and the second through the man's forehead. Surprisingly, none of the bullets the insurgent fired hit him. Matt then finished clearing the second floor of the apartment. Looks like we're clear, Matt said as he returned to where Jack was. Matt saw that he was in pain and asked, Are you sure you're all right, Jack? Jack nodded. Yes, I'm sure. We should get moving. Matt started to pick Jack up when he said, Easy now. I thought you said you were okay, Matt demanded. What happened? I swear to God, Matt I'm fine. Now we should get moving. Matt nodded and sighed. If you say so, Jack. Matt carried Jack through the apartment and they continued on to the extraction point. In the distance, they could hear an insurgent talking on a loudspeaker. Jack pointed to the building in front of them and said, We're almost there. The extraction point is on the other side of the building. They moved through the building and they saw a swimming pool. At the deep end of the pool, they saw four dogs feeding onto a dead body. The UNSC soldiers ignored the dogs. Outside, they saw two guards. Matt set Jack down and then killed the two guards. Then he picked Jack up again and carried him towards the Mombasa Ferris wheel. The pilots crackled to life over the comm. Alpha 6, this is Big Bird. Standing by for your signal, over. Our pelican is standing by at a safe distance, Jack said. Put me down behind the Ferris wheel where I can provide sniper support. Matt moved towards the back of the Ferris wheel. This'll be fine, Jack said as he pointed to a spot on the ground. Matt put Jack down in the spot that he had indicated. Jack pulled out his anti-personal mines and said, Take the rest of my mines, now is the time to use them. And if you have any mines left, now's the time to use them. The enemy is bound to enter this area, so find a good sniping position. I'll signal the pelican in 30 seconds. Matt took Jack's anti-personal mines from him, then took out his own mines and started to place them around the area. After planting the mines done, he looked around for a good sniping position. Find a good spot to snipe and go prone, Jack ordered. A few seconds later, Matt found a spot to hide behind the ferris wheel. Found one, he said. Good job, Matt. All right, lad. I've activated the beacon, Jack said. Good luck. Alpha 6. We have a fix on your position, the pelican pilot said. Hang tight. Big bird, out. A few minutes later, the UNSC soldiers saw enemies approaching them from the building they exited earlier. Tango's in sight, Jack said. Let them get closer. The enemies kept moving closer. Stand by to engage, Jack said. Open fire. Both men opened fire with their DMRs. The insurgents scattered when the bullets began flying towards them. Several insurgents ran into the mines that Matt had put down earlier. The four dogs in the pool entered the fray and attacked the insurgents. Once all of the enemies all the dogs ran away, several falcons appeared. Enemy falcons incoming Jack said. The falcons began dropping troops. The duo continued firing. Big bird we are heavily outnumbered, where are you? Jack said. Copy that. Alpha, will be there ASAP. Hold tight, the pilot said. The insurgents kept coming. It seemed like there was an endless amount of them. Finally, after holding their ground for an excruciating long four minutes, Big Bird showed up. Alpha team, this is Big Bird. Get your ass on board, over, the pilot said. For ODSDs exited the rear of the pelican and started to provide covering fire. Alpha team, we're at bingo fuel. You got 30 seconds, the pilot said. Matt quickly ran over to Jack and said, Time to go, old man. Jack snorted as Matt picked him up. Old man. 
Looks who's the old man carrying me around Mombasa. Shut up, Captain. Matt ran to the pelican, carrying Jack on his back. They entered the pelican and Matt set Jack down. Matt then turned and pulled out his DMR and started providing cover fire for the four ODSDs. The ODSDs got in the pelican and the ship took off. Well, mission accomplished, Matt said as they flew away from Mombasa. Jack nodded. Good work. The shot on Zemo was excellent, as always. When we get back to base, you're buying, Matt said, reminding Jack of his previous statement. Hey, yeah I did say that, didn't I? Yeah, you did, Matt said as he leaned back against a seat and closed one eye. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 18 The Lost Sibling Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 18 The Lost Sibling Location Zeta Doradus System, Planet Onyx, Camp Kahi, August 15, 2537, 0, 0900 hours. Two weeks after the mission to assassinate Vladimir Zemo, Matt returned to Camp Kahi on Onyx to welcome the Beta Company Spartan EI recruits. He was riding a pelican down the surface of Onyx to meet with Kurt and Mendez after being gone for a couple of weeks. When the pelican landed, the back hatch lowered and Matt stepped out. He saw Kurt and Mendez walk up to him. Welcome back, Matt, Kurt said. Thanks, Kurt, he said. Welcome back, Lieutenant, Mendez said. Thanks, Chief, he replied. So the new recruits are coming tonight? Yes, they are, Kurt answered as the three of them began walking away from the platform. The Chief and I have everything ready to go for tonight so you don't have to set up anything. Thanks, Kurt. I owe you one, he said. No, you don't owe us anything, Mendez said. You ready to get back to work, Kurt asked. Yep, Matt replied. They walked into Camp Kirihi and Matt went and put his stuff away. How was the mission? Kurt asked. The mission went well. It was a complete success, Matt answered. Tell us about it, Kurt said. Well, you guys might want to get comfortable. This is gonna take a while, Matt said. Well we have plenty of time to waste, Kurt said. So take your time. Once the two of them got settled, Matt began telling the tale. After he was done, they both looked shocked. Holy shit, Kurt said. You shot his arm off. Yep, Matt said. I'm surprised you didn't miss with the wind being that strong, Matt, Mendez said. Then again, you never miss a shot do you? Matt chuckled. No chief, I never miss. They sat around and talked for a while about what was going to happen once the Beta Company recruits arrived at Camp Kirihi and they had a meeting with all of the staff and told them what was going to happen once the recruits arrived. After they went to the cafeteria and got some lunch. After finishing lunch, everyone went their separate ways. Everyone had to meet back at the cafeteria at 1800 hours for dinner, then they had to get ready for the pelicans to bring the recruits in. Matt went back to his assigned room in the camp and fell asleep for a few hours, but this time he made the mistake of closing both of his eyes. Matt was having a nightmare. He could see his parents and his sister Rachel, sitting in chairs in front of him. They all had their hands tied behind their backs. He looked at his sister. She turned towards him. He could see that she had dark eyes and her face looked angry and filled with hatred. This is all your fault she shouted. He heard a gunshot and a second later, her head exploded in a shower of blood and brain matter. No, it wasn't my fault he cried. He then looked at his mother and she turned towards him. This is all your fault she repeated. Then another gunshot was heard and her head exploded. No, it's not my fault he said. He then looked at his father. He turned towards him. This is all your fault he said. Then his head also exploded. And no it is not my fault he yelled. He saw the bodies of his parents and sister topple over onto the ground. When the bodies hit the ground, their bodies immediately erupted into flames. Matt saw their spirits rise up from their dead bodies and started chanting. This is all your fault, this is all your fault, this is all your fault, this is all your fault. And no, it is not my fault, he shouted at the top of his lungs. Matt wake up, he heard someone say. Matt, Matt wake up. Matt snapped his eyes open and looked around his room. His body and face was covered in sweat. He looked up and saw Kurt standing over him. What happened? He asked. I heard you screaming and I came to check on you, Kurt replied. I came into the room to see you screaming and thrashing around everywhere. 
Matt sat up on his bed. What time is it? He asked. 1800 hours, Kurt said. It's time for dinner. Okay, good, Matt said. You okay? Kurt asked. Yeah, I'm good. Just, give me a minute. Matt looked over at his small table beside his bed. He saw his canteen on the desk, grabbed it and chugged down half of the canteen within a few seconds. You okay now? Kurt asked. Yeah, I'm better, he said. Kurt shuffled his feet. You want to talk about what happened? Matt hesitated. He never told anyone about the nightmares that he'd been having, not even Jack. Promise me something, Kurt, he said. Anything, Kurt said. I'm going to tell you something that I've never told anyone before, he said. Anything I'm about to say cannot be said outside this room. Promise me you won't tell anyone what I'm about to tell you, not even Mendez. Kurt put his hand over his heart. I swear on my life that I won't tell anyone. Matt nodded. I was having a nightmare about when I was six years old before I was kidnapped to become a Spartan. I had a family. A father, a mother, and two wonderful younger sisters. One night, I was awoken from my sleep, dragged downstairs by a mysterious man and tied to a chair. My parents and one of my two sisters were also tied to chairs. Wait, why were you, your parents, and one of your sisters tied to chairs and how old were your sisters at the time? Kurt asked. My two sisters were three years old and one year old at the time. The one tied to the chair was the older sister, Matt explained. The men didn't want to leave any witnesses. Okay, I understand now, Kurt said. Go on. Matt continued. The mysterious man was someone who my father apparently knew. He wanted to kill my father so he could take his place as a colonel. The man was a major and rank below my father. The man shot my sister in her forehead, killing her instantly. He then shot me in my stomach, my back, and then my leg. He shot my mother in the leg and then in her forehead, killing her. After he killed my mother, he killed my father, threw our bodies on the floor, put lighter fluid on us, then finally burned our bodies to make sure no evidence was discovered. Holy, shit, Kurt muttered. You were still alive while you were burned. Matt nodded. Yep. What happened to your other sister? Kurt asked. I don't know, Matt answered. What do you mean you don't know? Kurt demanded. What I mean is that I don't know what happened to her. I haven't even seen her since that very night. I'd rather not think or say that she's dead, but I'm holding out hope that she's still alive, somewhere out there, Matt said. What I want to know now is how the hell are you still alive then? Kurt asked. When I woke up several days later in the hospital, a doctor explained to me that I had been given special medications to help me heal from the three degree burns that I had all over my body, he said. Kurt's mouth made a small O. Oh. I understand now. You sure are damn lucky to be alive. I'm sorry for your loss. I promise to keep this a secret. Thanks, Kurt, but I don't want your pity, Matt said. Anyway, if you're done with your story, do you want to go eat? Kurt asked. Yeah, let's go eat, Matt said as he stood up. When they exited, they saw Chief Mendez standing out, leaning against the wall. The lieutenant commander and I heard you screaming and we came to investigate, Mendez explained as they walked up to him. You okay? Yeah, chief. I'm okay now, Matt answered. I just had a bad dream, that's all. Bad dreams are never good, Mendez said. Let's go eat, shall we? The trio began walking through the base until they reached the cafeteria. When they entered, all of the military personnel in the room rose and saluted. At ease, everyone, Kurt said. The military personnel sat down and resumed what they were doing previously. The trio walked to the line, got their food and found their table. They sat down and started to eat. You want to talk about what happened to make you yell out in your sleep? Mendez asked. No thanks, chief. I'd, uh, rather not talk about it, Matt said. Mendez nodded. I understand. After they had finished eating, they started to prepare for the arrival of the Beta Company recruits. So what's the plan? Matt asked. I decided that we're going to do the thing as last time like what we did with Alpha Company. We're going to have them drop, Kurt replied. Matt nodded. Are we wearing out armor? He asked. I decided to not wear mine, Kurt said. If you don't mind me asking, why? He asked. I feel like I shouldn't wear it because of what happened to Alpha Company, Kurt replied. Matt nodded. I understand. Are you going to wear yours? Kurt asked. I might, Matt said. All right, you have a few hours before the recruits arrive here. You might want to make up your mind soon, Kurt said. A few minutes later, Matt had made up his mind. Actually, 
I made my decision, Matt said. I'm going wearing it. Kurt smiled. I had a feeling you'd say that. Later that night, 1930 hours, Matt, Kurt, and Chief Mendez were waiting for the Pelicans to arrive that were carrying 418 candidates for Beta Company. Wanna know what's bothering me? Kurt asked. What is it? Matt asked. Why'd you decide to wear your armor? Kurt asked. Matt shrugged. Something in my gut told me that I would need to wear the armor. Kurt chuckled. I know the gut feeling all too well. In the distance, they heard the sound of pelicans approaching. You guys ready for this? Matt said. It's showtime. Kurt and Mendez nodded. Let's get this introduction over with, Kurt said. The pelicans landed the rear hatches dropped and the 418 candidates spilled out. Many looked tired and some looked a bit scared. Matt was scanning the crowd of kids, looking for possible candidates to train. Suddenly, Matt saw a little girl with brown hair and brown eyes. The little girl looked exactly like his youngest sister. Matt's face slightly drained of color behind his helmet. No. No way, he thought. That can't possibly be who I think it is, can it? You all right, Matt? Kurt whispered quietly. I have a feeling that something isn't right. Yeah. I'm all right, he whispered back. No, you're not, Kurt countered. Something's wrong. Even though I can't see your face, I can tell something is not right. Well. I'll talk to you about it later, okay? He said. All right, Kurt said. You better. You ready for this, Kurt? Matt asked. Yeah, Kurt replied. Come on, let's get this part over with, Mendez said. Kurt connected his comm to the camp's PA. Attention recruits. I am Lieutenant Commander Ambrose, Kurt announced. And to my right is Lieutenant Armstrong. As you can see, he is a Spartan. We are going to offer each of you a chance to become a Spartan. The kids moved closer, none of them daring to touch the giant in the shimmering green armor. But we cannot accept everyone, Kurt continued. We only 300 slots available. While Kurt was talking, Matt zoned him out and focused on the little girl that looked exactly like his youngest sister, Sarah. She was standing right in the middle of the group of 418 candidates. Matt saw that her attention was focused solely on Kurt. Do you want to be Spartans? Do you want to be like him? Kurt demanded as he pointed to Matt. Then back get back on those dropships recruits. Matt watched as the candidates filed back double time onto the pelicans. He kept his eyes glued to the little girl that he swore on his life that was his sister the whole time. Don't you think that was a bit harsh? Matt asked. Like I said before, Matt. Motivation, Kurt replied. Kurt then turned to Mendez. Chief, you know what to do. Mendez nodded and saluted. Yes, sir. Matt and Kurt returned his saluted then watched Mendez walk off towards the pelicans. When the pelicans took off, Kurt told Matt to follow him. The two men walked toward their offices. Come into my office, Kurt said. They entered and Matt took off his helmet. Kurt went behind his desk and sat down. Matt sat in front of the desk. Okay while we have some quiet time alone, what did you see? Kurt said. Matt took a deep breath and then let it out slowly. I swear to God, I saw my youngest sister in that crowd of kids. Wait, what? Kurt said. I thought you said you that you didn't know what happened to her. That's true, I don't know what happened to her, but I do have a very good memory, Matt snapped. I could recall everything that was said that night if I wanted to, but I don't want to because it'll bring back memories I'd rather not have, especially now. Kurt nodded. I understand completely. And I'm sorry for being harsh and snapping at you like that. I shouldn't have and I'm sorry. Matt waved his apology off. It's okay, Kurt. So, what are you going to do with her? Kurt asked. I'm going to work up some information from the tests and see if it is indeed her, then I'm going to train her, Matt replied. You don't have a problem with that do you? Of course I don't, Kurt said. Ackerson said you could train whoever you wanted and I'm going to let you do just that. Thanks, Kurt. I'm glad to say that I'm your friend, Matt said. Kurt laughed. Same here, Matt. Same here. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 19 Training the Lone Wolf. Author's note thanks to everyone for all the support you've been great with inspiring me and I am highly appreciative of your input. If you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, 
I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 19 Training the Lone Wolf For years after Spartan EI Alpha Company Operation Prometheus, Location Zeta Doratus System, Planet Onyx, near Camp Kahi, August 24, 2541, 1620 hours, Matt, Kurt, and Chief Mendez watched the Beta Company candidates perform an exercise where they had to ring a bell in the center of an open field. This was similar to an exercise that Spartanias did back in training. Team Foxtrot shouldn't have walked out into the open like that, Matt observed. If that happened in real-life combat, they would have been wounded or dead by now. You're right, Kurt said. That was a bad move by Tom to do that. He needs some more leadership training, Mendez said. I can take care of that, Matt thought. I'll have to help him get some better leadership skills and battlefield tactics. Lucy also could use some help on fighting skills as well. What's the point of exercise, Lieutenant? Deep Winter asked as he looked at Matt. The AI projection of an old man took a step towards the bank of monitors and touched the screen showing a boy and a girl pinned down by machine gun fire. A crackle of ice spread over the plastic. The point is to have them fight together to survive. They have to learn to become more like family than a fire team, Matt said. Well I do sure hope this won't backfire sir because this was your idea, the AI said. Trust me, I know, Matt replied. And for the record, it won't backfire. I hope you're right. Chief Mendez stood, and swatted at a mosquito, frowning as he glanced back and forth among the two dozen displays in Camp Kui's control center. The air conditioner had broken and all three of them were soaked with sweat. Kurt said, our candidates are doing well in their studies. Deep Winter turned his glacier blue gaze to the lieutenant commander. You have seen my reports. You know they are. Since you announced their grades were a factor in the selection process, they practically kill themselves every night to learn everything before they pass out. Frankly, I don't see. I suggest, Kurt said, you do not worry about seeing the point of my battlefield drills and focus on keeping the candidates on track with their studies. What? Could an AI possibly know what it was like on a real mission? Bullets zinging so close over your head that you didn't so much as hear them hut felt them pass. Or what it was like to get hit, but still have to keep going, bleeding, because if you didn't everyone on your team would die. Alpha Company had lost its team cohesion on Operation Prometheus. Matt and Kurt vowed that would not happen with Beta Company. Deep Winter ruffled his cape, and a flurry of illusionary snow swirled about the control room. The AI was likely programmed with human safety protocols, so it was natural for it to be concerned. We don't know what they're capable of, Kurt finally told Deep Winter. Stick with the bite book drills and we'll never find out, either. But put them in an impossible situation, and maybe they'll surprise us. Short definition of a Spartan, Mendez remarked. That's what people had said about the Spartanii's who were the genetic cream of the crop and wore Mjolnir armor. They could do the impossible, and do it alone. The Spartanii's, though, would have to work together to survive. Be more family than fire team. Still, Deep Winter whispered. This is cruel. They will break. I'd rather break them, Kurt said, than let them go out into the field without ever experiencing an intractable tactical situation. Personally I don't think these kids can be broken, Mendez said more to himself than to Kurt or Deep Winter. His gaze now firmly fixed on Tom and Lucy. Ten years old and these two have so much grit they scare the bejesus out of even me. Look, Deep Winter said. What are those two doing now? Kurt smiled. I think, the impossible. Matt saw Tom and Lucy throw rocks to distract the turrets then the two broke from cover and run towards the automated turrets while the torrents were distracted. Good play, Matt said. They watched as Tom got behind one of the turrets and disabled its automatic setting. He managed to rip the turret off its holder. The bell was on a tall pole so Team Foxtrot created a human ladder and rung the bell in the center of the field. They're learning fast, Matt noted. Tom then motioned for Adam and Min to take up scouting positions. Eventually, all of the Spartans' teams joined Foxtrot. What are they doing? Mendez asked. They're drawing them out, Kurt said. Who? Mendez asked again. The DIs, Matt answered. The rest of the Spartan trainee teams took up positions in the trees and grass, watching and waiting. The DIs came 15 minutes later. Tom signaled his scouts to fall back. Matt, Kurt, and Mendez watched the DIs come closer. They don't know what they're walking into, Matt said. They need to be careful. The DIs approached the trainee trams with their camo active. 
Tom and Lucy spotted them and shot the D.I.s with their turrets at leg level. The D.I.s screamed and when it was all over, the Spartans dragged their very dazed D.I.s to the center of the field and tied them up. As night started to fall, five more waves of D.I.s came after, but they were all subjected to the same fate as the first three. After eliminating all of the D.I.s, the entire Spartan trainee defense team was fully equipped and well armed. The Spartan trainees of Beta Company tied them to the pole and used them as hostages. Let's go get them out, shall we? Matt asked. Kurt nodded. I agree. Matt set up a distraction. You got it, he replied. They walked down to the area where all the trainees were. Matt picked up a rock and threw it around the area where Tom was. When Tom heard the noise, he turned and sprayed the area with stun rounds from the turret. Matt went flat to the ground as the stun rounds whizzed over his head. Mendez then clamped a hand on the young Spartan's shoulder and growled. Even from a distance of 20 meters away, Matt could still hear what he said, clear as day. I think that's quite enough, Mendez said while Kurt wretched the machine gun from Tom. Kurt then leaned down and whispered, good work, son. Matt started to walk towards them when he heard a sound behind him. He felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up and he froze, put his hand on the sidearm on his hip and stiffened. Don't move, someone said from behind him. He quickly turned and saw the young girl with brown eyes and brown hair staring at him with an M6 pistol gripped in her hands. Matt lunged forward with lightning quick speed. He wrestled the gun from the girl and said, I think that's enough for today, B312. She gasped. Lieutenant Armstrong, sir she said and saluted. My apologies, sir. We thought you were D.I.s. I didn't know that it was you, Lieutenant Commander Ambrose, and Chief Mendez coming. Again, my apologies, sir. It's all right, trainee, Matt said. Next time, just make sure to take the safety off. It was still on. Yes, sir, she said. Now run along to mess hall with the others and get some dinner. Then hit the sack. Yes, sir. She started to walk away, but Matt called back to her. Wait, B312. She turned around to face him. Yes, sir. Tomorrow morning after breakfast, come to see me in my office. I only want to talk to you. You are not in any trouble. I'll put in a request to Lieutenant Ambrose to let you skip the warm-up. I have something else planned for you to do. Now, run along. Yes, sir, she said as turned and ran off. Matt then walked over to where Kurt and Mendez were standing. Kurt, can I talk to you for a second? He asked. Of course, Kurt replied. They walked a short distance away from Mendez. I'd like to put in a request for B-312 to skip warm-up tomorrow after breakfast, he said. Why? Kurt asked. I have something else in mind for B-312. Kurt nodded. All right, it's approved. Just tell me what you see in her after you finish. Matt nodded. I will. Location Zara Doradus System, Planet Onyx, Camp Kirahi Firing Range. August 25, 2541, 0900 hours. Matt was waiting for Spartan B-312 to arrive. Over the last four years that he'd seen her, he had started to look up details about her early life, but he couldn't find any. It was like all the data was erased. The door opened behind him and Spartan B-312 stepped into the room. Sir, Spartan B-312 reporting as ordered she said and saluted. At ease, Spartan, he said. She lowered her hand and stood at ease. Now on to why I called you here. I will be giving you special training. Special training, sir? She asked. Yes, Spartan, special training. I will be training you to fight alone, to not rely on your teammates. You will be a support soldier in the field, he said. Support, sir? A long-range support where you will be far away from your teammates. You can't trust your teammates to watch your back for you in these situations. You have to watch your own back, he explained. I still don't understand, sir, she said. What I'm trying to tell you is that I'm going to train you to be a lone wolf, Matt clarified. A lone wolf, sir. A lone wolf is someone who goes on the most dangerous missions. They go in alone to complete the mission and they have no backup. I have a feeling that you would be the perfect soldier for that role, Matt said. Oh, yes sir. I understand now, she said. Matt nodded. Good. Now I want to give you a few rules before we start. 1. When we're in this kind of environment, don't call me sir. I don't like formalities. Call me lieutenant. 2. You don't have to salute me when we're alone like this. Do you understand? Yes, lieutenant, she answered. Matt nodded again. Good, now follow me. 
he said as he mooned her to follow him. Matt led her a short distance to the armory. Once there, Matt walked over and pulled an SRS-99 sniper rifle off of a rack. Do you know what this is? He asked. That is the SRS-99 sniper rifle. It is an anti-material rifle that is semi-automatic and gas-operated, which fires 14.5 by 114 mm rounds. The rifle has a four-round detachable box magazine. This is a very powerful rifle and this is also the sniper used by the UNSC Defense Force, she said. Good, I see that you paid attention in your classes, Matt said as he nodded in approval. He then grabbed several clips of ammunition and led Spartan B-312 back out to the training range. Matt had set up several plastic targets at different ranges. Some were stationary and some were moving. Set up here, he pointed to a spot on the ground and handed her the clips of ammo. Set up the bipod and load the rifle. She set the rifle on the ground and loaded the rifle. Then set up the bipod and got behind the rifle. Do you remember the advantages and disadvantages to the SRS-99? He asked. Yes, Lieutenant, she answered. Good, now I will call out targets, he said. Get ready to fire. Ready, Lieutenant, she said. First target, 500M, 11 o'clock. Matt called out, hit excellent shot. B-312 waited for another bullet to cycle through the rifle. Next target, 750M, 12 o'clock, Matt said, hit again. B-312 waited for the LT to call out the next target. Next target, 900M, 2 o'clock, the LT cried out, hit. B-312 hit the remaining seven targets with incredible accuracy. Holy shit, Matt muttered. What is it LT? She asked. Jack turned the datapad towards him and Matt saw that he had hit all ten targets dead center and got a bullseye every shot. Spartan, I think you've got best goddamn sniping skills I've ever seen in my entire life, Matt said with a big smile on his face. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 20 Back to the Battlefield. Author's note thanks to everyone for all the support you've been great with inspiring me, and I am highly appreciative of your input. If you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 20 Back to the Battlefield Three years later Location Zeta Doratus System, Planet Onyx, Camp Kahi, May 17, 2544, 0800 hours After eating breakfast, Matt headed to his office at Camp Kahi. He figured that the training of the recruits of Beta Company was going along well and he taught everything that the Beta Spartans he had trained. He knew that they wouldn't need much more training. He was going to gather his belongings because he put in a request to Kurt to let him go back to active duty. He wanted to go back to active duty after what happened to Alpha Company. He felt sad every time he thought about what he saw that day three years ago and he felt like he couldn't train anymore because of it. Kurt had told him last night that he had gotten a decision back from Ackerson. He was going to tell Matt the decision this morning before training started. Matt entered his office and started to pack up the remaining things he had to pack, then he headed for Kurt's office across the hall. Once he was standing just outside, he raised his hand and knocked twice. Come in, Kurt called out from the other side of the door. Matt opened the door, walked in and sat down in the chair in front of Kurt's desk. You told me last night you had a decision, he said. Yeah, I do, Kurt said as he shuffled some papers around. Well, what is it? Matt asked. The decision was approved, Kurt announced with a smile. I can tell you've been wanting to get back into combat for years, am I right? Yeah, you're right, Matt said. I feel like I'd be better in combat than stuck somewhere training military recruits all day and I get restless if I'm not experiencing any action. Also, what you proposed to Ackerson about Gamma Company feels wrong to me, no offense intended. Kurt waved his concern away. None taken. I understand completely. When do I ship out? Matt asked. Tomorrow, Kurt replied. You'll be taking a quick flight to the UNSC Marathon where you'll be reunited with Spartan Tus. Do you know which Spartans I'll be meeting? Matt asked. Unfortunately, no I don't, Kurt replied. Matt nodded. All right. Kurt stood up and held out his hand. The chief and I will miss having you around here to help us train more Spartans. Matt stood up and shook Kurt's hand. I'll miss training these Spartans but it's time for me to move on. Kurt nodded. I understand. 
I'm sure the chief would understand as well. Good luck out there. Don't get yourself killed. Matt laughed. Thanks, Kurt, and don't you remember the old saying? Kurt arched an eyebrow and tilted his head slightly to the side. What old saying? You haven't heard it. Matt said with a small grin on his face. Don't you know? Spartans never die. Kurt threw back his head and laughed. Agreed. Location Zeta Doratus System, Planet Onyx, Camp Kahi, May 18, 2544, 0600 hours. Matt, Kurt, and Chief Mendez stood around talking by the long sword that was going to take Matt to the UNSC marathon. So, I guess this is it then, Matt said. Mendez chuckled. Yes, this is it, for now, but it ain't over yet, Lieutenant. There's still a war to war to fight out there. Matt nodded. Indeed. Make sure you kill some Covies for us, Kurt said. Matt chuckled. I'll most definitely do that, Kurt. Good, Kurt said and held out his hand. Good luck and stay safe out there. Oh, and remember their old saying. Spartans never die, they're only missing in action. Matt nodded and shook Kurt's hand. Thanks, Kurt. I'll stay safe. Mendez stepped forward and held out his hand. Good luck, Lieutenant. Thanks, Chief, Matt said as he stepped forward and shook Mendez's hand. Matt then stood straight and saluted Kurt and Mendez. They saluted him back. Matt turned to Kurt and gave him the Spartan smile. Kurt nodded back. Matt leaned down and picked up the bag that was lying on the grass. He then turned around and headed up the ramp and onto the ship that would take him to the marathon. Location Beta Delphi System, Long Sword en route to UNSC Marathon. May 18, 2544, 1,200 hours, a knock on his door awoke him. Matt sat up on the bed and let his eyes adjust to the dim light in his room. Who is it? Matt called out. Lieutenant, the captain would like to see you on the bridge, a voice said from the other side of the door to his room. Matt pushed off from the bed and walked over to the door and unlocked. On the other side stood a young male ensign. When the young ensign saw him, the man's eyes widened in either shock fear, or his height. Matt wasn't sure which. Thank you, Ensign. Tell the captain I'll be there shortly. The Ensign gulped and nodded. Yes, sir, Lieutenant, he said and walked off. Oh, an Ensign. Matt called out as the men started walking away. Yes, sir. What's your name if I may ask? Matt asked. The young man seemed surprised for a split second by the question but answered Ensign Thomas McClurg, Lieutenant. Well, one sign McClurg, Please don't feel obligated to call me, sir. I'm not your commanding officer and I'm not a fan of formalities. Lieutenant is just fine. Oh, and don't like scared. I'm not going to hurt you. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean yes, Lieutenant. Thank you. Matt gave the young man a small smile. You're dismissed, Ensign. Thank you, Lieutenant, he said quickly and walked away. The men more jogged than walked away, but Matt couldn't tell which the young Ensign was doing. For some reason, he had a feeling he'd see the young Ensign McClurg again in the future. Matt then quickly turned around, shut the door to his room, and got dressed. Once he finished dressing, he headed toward the bridge to see what the captain wanted him for. When he reached the entrance to the bridge, he paused before he entered. For a moment he felt the hairs on the back of head stand up, indicating that something was going to happen soon. He didn't like that feeling, but he muscled up his strength and walked through the doors of the bridge. He saw men at their stations working and the captain was sitting in the captain's chair. You wanted to see me, captain? He asked. Ah, Lieutenant Armstrong, there you are. I was beginning to wonder where you were. To answer your question, yes I did want to speak with you, the captain answered as he got up from his chair. Follow me, the captain said as he motioned Matt to follow. Matt followed the captain to his office just outside the bridge. Once they entered, the captain waved him toward the seat in front of his desk. Sit, he said but said it is more of an order. Matt hesitated and looked at the chair in front of him. Ah, uh, Captain. I don't think these chair will be able to support my weight. Nonsense, the captain waved his hand dismissively. It'll be able to support you. I had the chair specially ordered for you. Now, sit. If you say so, Captain, Matt replied as he reluctantly sat down. The chair was actually very comfy and was surprisingly able to support his weight. Now, onto the reason why I wanted to talk to you, the captain leaned forward in his seat, put his elbows on the desk in front of him, and squeezed his hands together. I wanted to tell you that we will be coming out of slip space in about 10 minutes and will be docking at the UNSC marathon. Matt nodded indicating he understood. 
When we dock, we will then continue on our way to Miradam to extract all personnel at the ONI facility down there and burn all data. You'll be going in with Spartans to help with the evacuation and torch and burn off the data. Are you following me so far? Matt nodded again. Yes, sir. Good, the captain said as he stood up and stuck out his hand. You'll be meeting some Spartans who are already on board when we land and they'll take you to where you'll stay on the marathon. With all that said, do you have any questions? No, sir. I don't have any. Matt shook his head. Good to hear then. It was a pleasure to have you on board, the captain said as he stood up and stuck out his hand. Matt stood up and shook the captain's hand. The pleasure is all mine, captain. Thanks for having me on board. You're dismissed, lieutenant. Go back and gather your belongings. Yes, sir, Matt said as he returned the salute. Matt then walked out of the room and headed to his quarters to pack his things. Location Beta Delphi System, UNSC Marathon, May 18, 2544, 1,300 hours. When the longsword landed inside the hangar of the marathon, Matt gathered his bags and headed toward the exit ramp. At the bottom, he saw two Spartan twos in Mjolnir armor. He began walking toward them. When Matt reached them, he studied them for a second and he could tell it was Fred and Linda standing in front of him. He chuckled then said, well, aren't you two a sight for sore eyes? Matt. Linda asked as she tiled her helmeted head. I didn't think it was really you until I heard your voice. It's me, Red, he responded. He turned to Fred and said, how you been Fred? Fred chuckled. You look like you haven't changed a bit, Matt. Well. You're right because I haven't changed at all, Matt replied as he glanced around the hangar. Now, are we going to get going? I feel kinda naked out in the open like this with everyone looking at us. Of course, Linda said as she and Fred turned and motioned for him to follow. So, what have you been doing for the past 13 years, Matt? Fred asked as they walked through the hallways of the marathon. I heard that you were reassigned. Matt nodded. I was reassigned and before you guys get all excited, I'm going to tell you that I'm not allowed to tell you what I was doing. That's classified. Well, it was worth a shot to ask, Linda sighed as they continued walking. Typical ONI bullshit. So what have you guys been up to? Fighting the Covenant. Pretty much, Fred answered and shrugged. But we can't tell you the details. It's classified. Matt snorted. Classified, my ass. We'll tell you all about when we reach the barracks, Linda said. I assume you brought your own armor on board. Fred asked as he looked over his shoulder at Matt. Yes, I did, Matt answered. Good, Fred nodded. We have a locker ready for you inside the barracks. When is the mission supposed to launch? Matt asked. In three days' time. You'll have time to rest and prepare for the mission, Linda answered as they turned a corner and ran into some Marines. After letting the Marines pass, the three Spartans continued on their way. I assume you have been briefed on the mission objectives, Linda asked. Yes. Go down to the planet Miradem, extract all ONI personnel at the base down there, and burn all the data before the Covenant can get their hands on the data. Linda nodded. That's pretty much it. We just have a few more things to work out before we down there, but other than that, that's it. Which team will I be on? Matt asked. Fred smiled. You're on blue team with Linda, John, Kelly, and myself. Unless you have any problems with that. None at all. It'll be just like the good old times, eh? It'll be pretty much like that, yeah, Linda chuckled. It's good to have you back. Matt shrugged. It's good to be back. I missed all the action and I wanted to get back into it. You ready to be put back into action again? Fred asked. Ready as I'll ever be, Matt responded confidently. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 21 A New Discovery Authors note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 21 A New Discovery Location Beta Delphi System, UNSC Marathon, in orbit above Miradem. May 22, 2544, 0, 0300 hours. It was supposed to be a simple extraction mission, that's all, Matt kept thinking as he was wheeled down the hall on a gurney. Matt was in and out of consciousness, he was in a great amount of pain and his whole world was turning black. Where did all go wrong? Seven hours earlier. 
Location Beta Delphi System, Pelican en route to Miradem, May 21, 2544, 2000 hours. Matt was, technically speaking, the highest ranking Spartan on this mission, but he considered John to be the de facto leader. Okay, listen up, said the Master Chief as he went over the plan during their descent to the surface. Miradem isn't a very large colony world, but O and I has some top secret research going on there so we have to make sure the Covenant doesn't get their hands on it. We'll defend the installation until we can evacuate all the personal and data, then destroy facility with its self-destruct. On this mission, Blue, Green, and Gray teams were going in. Matt checked his weapons and equipment once more before they landed. When he felt the Pelican make contact with the landing platform the Chief popped the hatch and Gray team swept the platform before giving the all clear. Blue and Green teams disembarked and Matt had a look around. It was the middle of winter on Miradem and all the buildings in the ONI complex were covered in a layer of snow and it was also the middle of the night. The whole base was illuminated by stadium lights positioned through the complex, the whole scene was peaceful as light snow began to fall, but soon it probably wouldn't be. Blue team, form up, said the chief. Gray team, hold the platform. Green team, I want you on the perimeter assessing our defenses. The Spartans flashed their acknowledgement lights and Matt followed his teammates down the stairs to the road below. A warthog was parked next to the stairs and a corporal was waiting next to it. Master Chief, sir, the Marine said as he saluted. I have orders to bring you to Complex G, someone wants to see you. John and Kelly got in the warthog with the corporal. Another warthog rolled up to carry the rest of Blue Team and after driving through the snow-covered base. Taking detours due to the snow banks they arrived outside a small building labeled Complex G. This doesn't look like it's big enough for a whole lab complex, Linda said to Matt over a private comm. You never know with O&I, Matt said to her. Sometimes you don't need a big lab complex. The corporal swiped his card on the reader and the double doors opened to a small lobby. The Spartans went inside and the Marine sitting behind the desk saluted as they passed. Their escort brought them to an elevator and he punched in a code on the keypad. The doors opened and they entered the car, the lift ascended only a couple of levels before coming to a stop. The Marine escorted them through the main lab complex until they came upon a big double door. Once again, he was forced to enter a code, but as the doors opened the Spartans came to a halt and were a bit surprised at who was on the other side. Dr. Halsey, said Kelly. It's good to see you all again, she said. Please come in. The Spartans entered the large room and Halsey led them to the main screen. We've been conducting some top-level research here that we can't afford to let fall into Covenant hands. Doctor, I don't need to remind you that orders are to evac the facility, said the chief. I am very well aware of ONI's standing orders, John, she replied. But we need time to transfer all the data to portable drivers. We'll give you as much time as we can, said the chief. Let's go back to the surface. They all turned and headed for the elevator that would bring them up to the surface. The next five hours passed uneventfully and the snowstorm had died down a bit to just a light powdering as Matt sat on his overwatch position on the roof of one of the smaller buildings near the perimeter fence. He had his mind preoccupied with thoughts of Linda. For some reason, she was growing on him, and he the life of him he couldn't figure out why. Something on your mind? Linda asked as she arrived to check on him as part of her rounds. Ah. Ah, uh, nothing, Matt replied. Like hell, Linda retorted. I may not have seen you in years, but I sure as hell have known you too long so I can tell when something is bugging you. She placed a hand on Matt's shoulder and sat down next to him. She then raised the reflective portion of her visor so he could see her face. Matt looked at her but didn't raise his visor for fear that she would see him blush. He couldn't get her out of his head and if Jack found out he was royally fucked. Just tell her, his mind kept screaming at him. Well there is something I've had on my mind for a while now, he blurted without thinking. His mind made up, he was just going to say it. You see I, but he was cut off as there was an explosion at the other end of the compound. Linda put a hand on his shoulder. You can tell me later. Yeah, later, he muttered. All teams regroup at the south wall, it looks like the Covenant decided to crash this party a bit early, said the chief over the radio. Matt and Linda leaped off the roof and landed in a snowbank below. They quickly dug themselves out and sprinted towards the south wall. When the duo arrived they found the chief, Fred, and Kelly pinned down in a makeshift pillbox. Gray and green teams were nowhere in sight. Jackals and grunts were pouring through the hole in the fence. Cover me, Matt said to Linda. 
She winked her acknowledgement light and starting providing cover with her SRS-99 CS-2 AM. Matt raced to a fallen guard tower and eyed the chain gun lying in the debris. He dodged plasma and needler fire and he reached the chain gun and broke it free of its tripod, spooled it up and let loose a hail of 12.7 mm AP rounds against the Covenant forces. After a minute of firing though, Matt had exhausted the gun's ammo and the Covenant began their onslaught again. Matt dropped the chain gun and brought out his MA-5B, but he didn't need to fire a shot. A pair of rockets screamed over his head and hit the Covenant line, then another pair. When the dust had settled the Covenant lay dead and Matt got an acknowledgement light from Grey 2. Chief, Grey 1 said. The Covenant are breaching the northeast corner and reports are that they're bringing in wraiths. How's the evac? The chief asked. Most of the personnel are out, but we're still waiting on complexes F and G, said Grey 1. Okay, here's what we'll do, said the chief. Matt, you and Linda will meet Green Team outside Complex G and get Dr. Halsey out. Fred and Kelly, you'll be with me and Grey Team. We'll clear out Complex F then set the self-destruct. Matt flashed his acknowledgement light as he and Linda sprinted off towards Complex G. When they arrived they found a few barricades rigged at the other end of the road. The four Spartans of Green Team was waiting outside, Malcolm 059, Isaac 039, Cassandra 076, and Sheila 022. About time, said Sheila, the team's leader. It's nice of you two to join us. Hold this position, Matt ordered. I'll go down and get the doctor. Better be quick, Linda said. The Covenant could hit this place at any moment, and Matt. Be careful. I won't be long and I'll be careful, Linda, Matt replied as he started for the complex's entrance. I always am. He heard Linda sigh, then quietly say, that's what I was afraid of. Matt went inside and the marine guard wasn't at his desk but thankfully he memorized the code from the first guard and in seconds he was down the lift and into the complex. He walked over to the set of double doors and banged on them, lacking the keycard to open it. Thankfully, the doors opened and Matt quickly entered to find the room empty of all the technicians he'd seen earlier. Dr. Halsey was at the main console dumping information onto a portable drive. Doc. We need to leave. Just another minute, Matt, she replied calmly. No, Doc. Now Matt snapped as he grabbed her hand away from the keyboard. Enter the erase code. We need to get out of here, he said as he let her go. She stared up at him for a minute before typing in the code then getting up. Suddenly, there was a rumble and part of the ceiling collapsed. Matt's lightning-fast reflexes pushed Dr. Halsey out of the way and he allowed the debris to pin him to the floor. Matt Halsey screamed as she watched him collapse under the right of the section, but he was able to lift it off himself with ease. Are you okay? Halsey asked. Fine, Matt replied as they left the lab. The rest of the complex was in ruins as they made their way to the elevator, but Matt picked up two contacts on his HUD and was relieved when they were marked green. Around the corner came Cassandra and Sheila, both of their armor was scorched in some places, no one else followed them. What happened? He asked them. The Covenant came in full force, grunts, jackals, ghosts, banshees, and a couple of those wraith tanks, said Sheila. What about Linda? Matt asked. I think they got her, said Cassandra. Matt immediately froze, his mouth dried up and his stomach started to twist in knots. She can't be, it's just not possible, he thought to himself. The banshees strafed us with their fuel rod guns, Cassandra continued, I think they got Isaac too, but I didn't see Malcolm get hit. Did you see Linda get hit? He asked. All I saw was the banshee fire and then I heard the explosion next to me, said Sheila. When I looked over Linda and Isaac were gone. I had Cassandra follow me inside and we just managed to get into the elevator before they took out the whole building. Okay, is there another way out? Matt asked Halsey in a slightly shaky voice. Yes, this way, she said as she led them down a corridor. It leads to a service tunnel that'll us to the motor pool. As they walked through the debris-strewn corridors, all Matt could think about was Linda. He tried pinging her comm but no luck, either the signal couldn't penetrate through the ground or there was nothing to receive it. Matt's vision began to turn a bit blurry from the gathering of tears at the thought that Linda might be dead. Hang on, I've got a contract, said Cassandra. It's weird. Define weird, said Sheila. It's there one moment then gone the next, said Cassandra. Interesting, said Halsey. That startling statement brought Matt out of his grief. Where is it? He asked. Around the corner, replied Cassandra. 
Matt crept along the wall until he reached the corner then he leaned his head out a bit and caught a glimpse of a ripple in the middle of the passageway. Shit, back up, he hissed. The two other Spartans got up against the wall and slowly moved out of range of the target. What was that? Cassandra asked. I don't know, but it's definitely not friendly, Matt said. He then turned to Halsey and said, is there another way to the mortar pool? No, that's the only way, she replied. Okay, Sheila, Cassie, with me, said Matt as he brought them back to the corner. I saw something in the middle of the passageway. Just aim for the center and don't let up, he ordered. He got two acknowledgement light on his HUD. Now he screamed as he into the corridor with Cassandra and Sheila at his side. Matt pulled his MA-5B's trigger and let loose a volley of 7.62 by 51 mm rounds into the cloaked creature standing in the middle of the corridor. His cloak failed after a few hits and was soon turned into Swiss cheese under the combined firepower of the three Spartans. Dr. Halsey came around the corner and looked at the dead creature. No time, said Matt as he grabbed Halsey by the arm and he and the others continued on their way. They entered a concrete tunnel that was slowly inclining upwards towards the surface. Suddenly, Matt got a broken transmission on his comm from the chief. Green team, Advis, U, 4, in its, destruct, get, now. Chief repeat your last, Matt said. Shit we gotta go he said realizing what the chief was trying to tell them. What is it? Cassandra asked as they broke into a run with Sheila carrying Halsey. We've got less than four minutes before this place blows, said Matt as they reached the end of the service corridor. He forced the door open and they found one warthog still parked in the garage. I'll get the door, said Sheila as she set Halsey down in the passenger seat. She then sprinted over to the garage door and opened it with her sheer strength. Outside, the snowstorm had picked up a butt. Sheila stepped out into the winter wonderland and did a quick look around. All clear, she said. Matt was about to turn away when suddenly a blue ball of plasma landed right on top of her. Sheila seemed to melt under it as it consumed her and exploded on the ground. Matt, Halsey, and Cassandra were forced to watch helplessly as she was killed. Cassie, we got to go said Matt as he jumped into the driver's seat. She hesitated for a moment before getting behind the gun. Doc, stay down said Matt as he gunned the engine, racing out of the garage and through the snow. They narrowly avoided another hit from the wraith waiting outside and plasma fire washed across the screen as Matt plowed over jackals and grunts then finally breaking through the perimeter fence. Cassandra fired at the Covenant trying to pursue while they drove high speed through the snow. There was a thunderous boom followed by a massive fireball as the facility behind them was consumed by the self-destruct. Matt kept driving until they entered an open area before stopping. He looked down at Halsey who was crouched in the passenger seat shivering. She was only wearing her lab coat. I think we're in the clear, said Cassandra. No sooner had she said that when the warthog was rocked by plasma fire. Matt tried to start the engine, but it had taken a direct hit. Get out he yelled as he and Halsey dove out of their seats and scrambled away from the hog. Matt looked back to see a ghost driven by an unknown creature firing on the warthog. Cassandra was still on the turret as she brought it about and peppered the ghost with bullets. The creature dove out of the vehicle and it collided with the hog causing an explosion which destroyed both vehicles. Cassandra was ejected from the blast and she landed a few feet away, her Mjolnir armor was smoking. Run he screamed to Halsey. She complied and got up then disappeared in the storm. Matt turned back to the creature standing over Cassandra with his energy sword drawn. Matt brought out his assault rifle and charged at him firing, the bullets pinged off the creature's shields but it was enough to draw his attention. The creature charged at Matt who continued firing until he was out of ammo. The creature raised his sword and prepared to strike, Matt brought up his MA-5B and the sword sliced it in two but it gave Matt enough time to draw his sidearm and put two in its chest. He followed up with a blow to its head and the creature toppled over. Matt walked over to Cassandra, but before he got to her side he felt a stab of pain and an odd tingling sensation. He looked down in horror as he saw the two tips of the energy sword sticking out of his lower chest there was another stab of intense pain as the sword was withdrawn. Matt staggered forward and collapsed face first in the snow. He felt a strong hand flip him over and onto his back and he saw the creature standing over him with his sword raised, ready to strike. This is it, he thought to himself as the creature made a growling sound. He closed his eyes and waited for the end to come, it never came. His suit's alarm went off indicating a massive heat and pressure strike, and he heard a boom. When Matt opened his eyes he saw what was left of the creature scattered around in tiny pieces. 
His whole body was cold and he was getting dizzy. The first signs of shock. The snow around him was red with blood, his blood, and if he was seen correctly, he saw a hint of silver mixed in with his blood. Matt saw a light heading for him, is that light at the end of the tunnel, he thought as it got closer. It turned out to be the headlight of a Mjolnir helmet, it was a Spartan holding smoking jackhammer. The Spartan dropped the launcher and rushed over to Matt's side, he recognized the outline of Spartan in his blurry vision. El Linda, he muttered as she knelt down next to him. Over here she cried out to someone else. A few seconds later Halsey appeared next to him and the chief was standing over them both. I found Cassandra. She's still alive, he heard Fred say from next to him. Matt's vitals are fading, said Linda. I'll call a pelican, said the chief. Stay with us, Matt, Linda said. Location Beta Delphi System, UNSC Marathon, in orbit above Miradem. May 22, 2544, 0300 hours. Matt was on the gurney being wheeled through the halls of the marathon to sickbay. Linda and Halsey were keeping pace as the med tech assessed his injuries on the fly. We need to flash clone replacement organs ASAP, he heard one of them say. He's lost too much blood. We need to hurry. Hey, Linda, Matt croaked. I'm here. Shoo, don't talk, she replied. Just take it easy. I told you I'd be careful. You'll have to wait outside. One of the doctors said to Linda and Halsey. Matt turned to Linda and said, I'll see you soon, as the doctors wheeled him into the oar. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 22 Secret Thoughts Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again. I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 22 Secret Thoughts Location UNSC Marathon, in Slip Space May 22, 2544, 0330 hours Linda had been sitting at Matt's bedside for the past 30 minutes. The crew had managed to find a chair that would support the weight of her Mjolnir armor so she could sit down. Matt had been given a sedative shortly after the doctors wheeled him into the oar and four line was feeding him own negative blood. Matt was lucky compared to Cassandra, she was currently in a neutral buoyancy tank due to the extent of her injuries. Dr. Halsey said she would most likely be partially paralyzed and therefore couldn't continue active duty. Linda wasn't as concerned for Cassandra as much as she was for Matt, she watched in horror as he got stabbed by the creature then collapse. By the time she got to him and saw all the red snow around him, she thought it was too late, but Linda was relieved when Matt said her name. She had noticed a strange feeling then, she felt it before but couldn't quite describe it. The doctors on board were about to start operating on him to replace his organs with flash cloned ones, but they noticed something and they were currently in a back lab room on the marathon trying to figure out what they found. Dr. Halsey had been with her up until a few minutes ago when the doctors had called her back to show her what they had found. What have you found, Dr. Clark? Halsey asked. We don't know, but it looks like his body repairing itself, said the astounded doctor. Did you take a blood sample? She asked. No, but if he... Dr. Halsey she heard Linda cry out. He's awake. I'll go ask him now, said Halsey as she left the lab and headed towards Matt's room. When she entered, she saw Linda trying to get him to lay back down. Don't move, Linda warned. You're still injured. Matt looked up and saw Halsey standing in the doorway. Hey, Doc. What's going on? Nothing, but I came to ask you a few questions. If you don't mind. No, Linda said. You should be resting. No, it's fine. Knock yourself out, Doc. Halsey let out a breath then said, Do you remember ever seeing anything? Matt's brow furrowed. What do you mean? Do you remember seeing anything in your blood, like a different color perhaps? Matt thought about that for a second. I think. I think I remember seeing what looked like a silver tint in my blood but my vision was blurry at the time so I can't tell you for certain if that's what I saw. Halsey saw his eyelids start to flutter and knew he was about to go unconscious. She had to hurry. Do you mind if I take a blood sample? No, go for it, Doc, Matt replied groggily. But can you give me the answers after you're done? Of course, Halsey said as she quickly grabbed a syringe and got the blood sample she needed. While she was getting the sample, Matt passed out. She then turned to Linda and said, stay with him. I will, doctor, she replied. 
Halsey returned to the lab and put the sample under the computer and inserted it into the test pad. A few seconds later the computer displayed the results. Well, that's interesting, Halsey said. The results revealed that Matt had nanites in this bloodstream. What is it? Dr. Clark asked. I think I found the source of the problem, Halsey replied. He has nanites in his bloodstream. Wait, nanites. How? Halsey motioned Dr. Clark over. She pointed to the computer. I asked him if he saw anything in his blood and he said he saw a silver tint and nanites give off a silver tint. That would explain how his body is repairing itself, Dr. Clark muttered. I think we should flash clone some organs just in case. I agree, Halsey replied. But I think we should wait it out a bit first to see what happens. Okay, Dr. Halsey. We'll go with your suggestion, for now, Clark said. Halsey then went over to a small section of the room that she claimed as her own, grabbed a data pad and pulled up Matt's medical records to confirm her suspicions. After she looked over his records, she saw she was indeed correct. Linda continued to sit in the chair next to Matt's bed. She took her hand in his. A few minutes later, Dr. Halsey appeared. How's he doing? She asked. No change after you left, doctor, she replied. He's lucky. Another few centimeters and the sword would have severed his spine, said Halsey. None that we can tell. We're still trying to figure out what we found. Linda then remembered that funny feeling she had earlier. Hey doctor, can I ask you something? She said. It's kind of personal. Of course, the scientist replied. What is it? Well, I've been getting this feeling lately and I don't know what it is, but I only feel this way around Matt. Halsey looked at her for a moment before she cracked a small smile. I think I know, could you come with me? She asked. Of course, Linda replied as she got out of her seat and followed Halsey out of the room. Please wake up soon, she said to him as she left. Linda followed Halsey to the med lab what she instructed Linda to sit at the foot of the bed. Linda sat down at the foot of the bed as Dr. Halsey finished drawing blood. There, she said as she removed the syringe. Linda then replaced the arm section of her armor. Halsey took the sample of blood over to the computer and placed it into the test pad. A few moments later the computer displayed the results. I'll be damned, Halsey said under her breath. The results were positive, there were sexual hormones present in Linda's system, the very same hormones the platinum pellet in her thyroid was supposed to suppress. Well that's what we get from testing the augmentations on chimps, Halsey thought to herself. Linda's sex drive remained unaffected even after all these years. How many more Spartans had the anomaly, she wondered. Well, Linda asked. What does the computer say? Oh nothing, said Halsey. But I figured out that funny feeling you've had around Matt. I think you're in love. What? Said a bewildered Linda. Think about it, said Halsey. This feeling you have is basically a strong attraction, am I right? Yes, Linda said. But how could I be in love with him? You like being around Matt, you're attracted to him, said Halsey. What other explanation is there? I heard that the augmentations prevent feelings like this, said Linda. Halsey was surprised. They had deliberately not told the Spartans about their repressed sex drives for this exact reason. Technically, yes, said Halsey. But I scanned the blood I took from you and it showed traces of hormones in your system that allows you to feel this way. Linda sat there taking in what Halsey had told her. She finally accepted the fact that she loved Matt all this time and never knew it. But what really concerned her was what to do now. Do I tell him, she wondered. Hey, doctor. Linda said she got up and headed for the door. You won't tell anyone, right? My lips are sealed, Halsey replied. Linda gave her a nod and then left the med lab and returned to Matt's room. She sat down in the same chair and continued to watch him. She began to ponder her newly discovered feelings. Linda looked at Matt and began to notice how handsome he actually was. Linda did something even she didn't expect as she removed the gauntlet of her armor and she held Matt's hand in her own. Linda got the feeling she had done this before. Please wake up, she whispered. Please wake up and let me know you're all right. I, I need you. About ten minutes later, she felt his hand start to move in hers. She looked at his face and saw his eyes flutter open. His eyes scanned the room then they landed on her. She saw how beautiful his brown eyes were. She was about to say something but Halsey appeared in the doorway suddenly. How are you feeling? Halsey asked. Like I've been stabbed with a hot knife, he replied. The other doctors and I think we found the answers to the questions I asked you earlier, said Halsey. Can you give them to me now? Yes, but Linda, 
I hate to say this, but you're going to have to leave the room. This is personal stuff. Think about it as a doctor-patient confidentiality agreement. This stays between me and him, Halsey said regretfully. Oh, of course, doctor. I understand, Linda replied as she got up and headed for the door. I'll see you in a bit, she said to Matt. Okay, he replied. I'll see you soon. Once Linda left, Matt turned to Halsey. All right, doc, what did you find? Do you being a hospital when you were around six years old? A. Hey. A little bit, it's fuzzy. What can you tell me? She asked. All I remember is waking up in a hospital and the nurse said that had severe injuries and they had to give me some special medication, he responded. What does this have to do with anything? Halsey shuffled her feet. Well, we think the special medication was something called nanites. Do you know what those are? She asked. Can't say I know what they are, Doc, he answered. You remember that silver tint you told you saw? Asked Halsey. Matt nodded. Those are nanites. Nanites are small robots injected into your bloodstream. They go through a process of self-replication. Let's say for instance that you're injured like you are now. The nanites would self-replicate and help close the wound. Nanites also help your body heal wounds at a faster rate than normal. Is that why I didn't need to have flash clone replacement organs? Matt asked still shocked by this discovery. Yes, exactly, Halsey replied. You should also be aware that nanites make your body become stronger, fast, and allow your mind to process information faster meaning you are smarter than an average human. Doctor, Matt asked after a minute of complete silence. You won't tell anyone about this right? My lips are sealed shut, Halsey responded. As I said, this is between me and you. That's why I asked Linda to leave. Okay, thanks, Doc. I think I need some time to think. This, over, Matt replied as he felt a wave of drowsiness sweep over him and he closed his eyes once more. Author's note did you love that chapter? Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 23 Complete Disclosure Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 26 Complete Disclosure Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, Military Reservation 01478B, May 21, 2547, 1100 hours. Matt's eyes popped open and he took a second to get a bearing on his surroundings. He was sitting crisscrossed on a rock, meditating. He enjoyed meditating in the outdoors. He felt a lot calmer when he was meditating outdoors instead of indoors. Matt got to his feet, stretched his arms and looked down at his wrist as he headed for the showers. The time said 1,100 hours. Since he'd been back in the field, Matt had received two promotions. One in 2545 to the rank of lieutenant commander and the other on the first of the new year to the rank of commander. Blue Team had been recalled to reach a week ago for Section 2's decision to go public with the Spartan program to try and boost morale. For this they wanted a few Spartans for the press to drool over. So that's how they ended up back on reach, Matt wasn't complaining though as he started to make his way back to the bunk rooms. When he arrived he found it practically empty, at the other end of the room was equipment set up for their Mjolnir armor. There were two suits still there, one was Matt's and the other must belong to whoever was using the shower. He heard someone say could you hand me a towel. He removed a towel from the rack outside the showers and went inside. Matt figured that John or Fred was inside but he wasn't prepared for this, standing in the shower was Linda, completely naked thankfully. She had her back to Kyle and the steam obscured most of her features, but that didn't stop Matt's face from turning as red as a tomato. Ah shit, I didn't see you there he said as he quickly turned away and handed her the towel. Thanks she replied as she took it and wrapped it around her waist. Matt left the showers and returned to the bunk room. Get a hold of yourself, Matt. You didn't see much, he told himself. Matt, said Linda from behind him. He spun around and she was standing there wearing the towel, her damp, shoulder-length red hair was patted against her head and neck. Is something wrong? She asked. Your face is all red. Ah. I just got back from meditating, he said. I'm just a bit exhausted. What, were you sweating while meditating? She chuckled. Can you give me a hand with my armor? She asked. Sure, Matt replied. Linda went over to a locker and removed one of the skin-tight undersuits that they wore under the armor. Matt looked the other way as she removed the towel and donned the suit. Matt also changed into one then proceeded to help Linda with her armor. 
Do you really think this press release will boost morale? She asked. Well up until now we've been the talk of legend, it gives people hope to know that a legend actually exists. And right now everyone could use a little hope, said Matt. Linda pulled the chest section over her head and Matt secured the back plate, they then got the arm plates on in record time. Linda didn't put her helmet on because her hair was still damp, instead, she gave Matt a hand with his armor. Have you given any more thought as to what we'll do after the war? Linda asked. It's hard to think about anything else but the war, Matt replied. Would you ever consider spending your time with someone? Linda asked as she attached Matt's chest plate. Matt looked into her face only a few inches from his and without even realizing it his face started inching closer to hers. But before their lips could meet someone said, are you two ready yet? They both looked to see the chief standing in the doorway. The brass wants us down there ASAP, the chief said. We're coming, hang on, said Matt as he snapped his chest plate into place then Linda helped him get his arm and leg sections on. Neither of them talked about what Matt almost did and Matt started to wonder if she ever realized what he was going to do but he noticed her cheeks turn a little red as she put her helmet on. Location Epsilon Eridani System, Planet Reach, UNSC Military Complex, May 21, 2547, 1,200 hours. The Spartans stood backstage in one of the amphitheaters at Reach HIGHCOM. Admiral Stanforth was standing on the other side of the curtain giving a speech to the mountain of press seated in the seats. The feed from the cameras was displayed in the Spartans' HUD so they got to watch the whole thing go down. Thank you all for coming, said Stanforth as he took his position behind the podium. We have called you here to address certain rumors that have surfaced over the past few years about an elite group of soldiers in the Navy that have quote special abilities. I am here today to tell you that these rumors are absolutely true. There was a wave of whispers followed by an assault of questions against Stanforth. People please, he yelled into the mic I will take a couple of questions but I must ask the rest of you to hold your comments until the end. The crowd became silent and Stanforth picked one of the female reporters. Admiral, Sarah Jane Smith, New Olympia Times. Could you tell me the name of the project and how long has this project been going on for? It's called the Spartanii program and officially it started when the first group of Spartans graduated in 2525 shortly before the events at Harvest. What about unofficially? Smith asked. That information is classified, Stanforth replied. But Admiral there have been rumors that this program started as early as 2515. Like I said, Miss Smith, that information is classified, said Stanforth. Next question. Yes, Admiral, Alan Heyer. Jupiter Lunar Post. My sources inform us that these Spartans have undergone illegal experimentations to make them programmable soldiers, any comment on that? Mr. Heyer, I don't know where you get your information, but there are no psychological changes involved. Yes, Stanforth said to a man with black hair, glasses, and a three-piece suit. Admiral, Stephen Colbert, The Colbert Report. Is it true that these Spartans wear some kind of powered exoskeletons that give them superhuman abilities? Yes they do, and I think it's about time I introduced you to them. The curtain raised and the five Spartans walked forward and stood at attention next to Stanforth. Matt's faceplate polarized due to all the strobes from the various cameras. He looked across the audience and his eyes settled on the military VIPs, seated in the front row. Most of them were in navy uniforms but one man wore a green army uniform, he also bore the eagles of a colonel. Matt recognized him instantly. Colonel Ackerson. These are the Spartans, Stanforth continued, the armor they wear enhance their already augmented strength, which makes them our most valuable asset in this war. Do they have names? Colbert asked. They do, Stanforth replied. These five are called John 117, Frederick 104, Linda 058, Kelly 087, and Matt 038. Matt noticed Colonel Ackerson crack a smile when Stanforth said his name. Can they survive without the suits? Another reporter asked. Yes, the armor is simply a tool they use, said Stanforth. Admiral, were these Spartans responsible for putting down the rebellion on Memor ten years ago? A reporter asked. No, as the report stated that rebellion was suppressed by the 318th ODST Division, said Stanforth. Now I'm afraid the Spartans must leave us but I'll continue to answer what questions I can. As Stanforth was assaulted by a new wave of questions the Spartans marched off stage and walked down one of the corridors. Suddenly, someone called out Commander Matt, a moment. 
Matt turned around and standing behind him a few meters away was Colonel Ackerson. Hey, Chief, I'll catch up, said Matt as he walked over to the Colonel. Walk with me, he said. Yes, sir, Matt replied. It's good to see you again, Matt, said Ackerson as they walked out into a courtyard. Perhaps we could talk about a few things. Of course, sir, said Matt. Do you remember what we talked about before? Asked Ackerson. About the Spartan EI program, sir? Yes, about that. Suddenly several ODSDs appeared and surrounded Matt. Will you keep quiet like you said you would or do I have to silence you? Asked Ackerson with a hint of venom in his voice. Before Matt could reply one of the hell jumpers moved behind Matt with a neural inhibitor and prepared to place it on his head. Matt quickly reacted and kicked the ODSD in the chest and sent him flying into the wall. He then grabbed Ackerson by the collar and pulled him up to face Matt. The other ODSDs raised their weapons at Matt. Now listen up, Colonel, if you try this shit again you'll get a result a lot less pleasant than this one. Now tell your boys there to chill. How would you explain gunfire with all the press still around? DDO as he says, said Ackerson, his voice trembled with fear. The ODSDs dropped their weapons and Matt put Ackerson down. Think twice before trying to take down a Spartan. And for the record, I haven't said a word nor will I ever utter a word about the Spartan EI program, unless I have to, Matt said as he shot the colonel an evil glare and walked away. Ackerson collected his ODSD strike team and left the courtyard. When they were gone a figure wearing Mjolnir armor walked out from one of the doors. Who is he? said John as he turned around and headed back inside. Author's note did you love that chapter? I hope you did show your support for the author by simply clicking the little vote button to the bottom left or top right of your screen. Have a wonderful day. Votes and comments slash feedback most enthusiastically welcome. Chapter 24 by Dawn's Early Light. Author's note if you have any tips writing tips, please feel free to comment. Again, I gratefully accept constructive criticism as a means to help me develop my skills further as a writer. Chapter 24 by Dawn's Early Light. Location Sigma Octonus System, Sigma Octonus 4, Grid 19 by 37, July 18, 2552, 1800 hours. Chief, you better get up here, the Pelican pilot called out. In the back of the dropship sat three teams of Spartans, blue, red, and green. Their objective to eradicate the Covenant in the city of Cote d'Azur. Bad news, said the chief after he returned from the cockpit. The Marines' base is history. So much for plan A, said Matt. There's a signal flare from the base so there might be survivors, we're going in anyway. Get your gear together, said the chief. The Spartans quickly got out of their seats and scrambled around the pelican getting their weapons and equipment. Matt grabbed a case from the front of the pelican and inspected its contents, his job was to safeguard their havoc nuke. He took out the small half-sphere-shaped device and inspected the weapon for any signs of damage. He felt a little uneasy as he held the device. This was an honest-to-God nuclear weapon after all. Matt put it back in its case and secured the latch, then Linda came overhand handed him his drop bag. Inside were his modified MA-5B and several extra clips, a combat knife, an M7 submachine gun with two spare magazines and finally a single Lotus anti-tank mine. Strapped to either of his shoulders were his cookery knives. He deliberated on bringing his SRS-99CC2AM, but he decided against it at the last minute. The mission he would be embarking on would be more close quarters instead of long-range combat, so he brought the M7 as a substitute. Nervous. Linda asked Matt as he finished sorting out his gear. How would you feel if you had protected something that would eventually be used to destroy an entire city? Matt replied. Good point, said Linda. The pelican touched down inside the ruined base and the Spartans disembarked. The chief took the lead and walked over to a marine who just emerged from a fire bunker. Master Chief, sir, said the Marine as he snapped off a salute. Corporal, at ease the Chief replied. Get your men together and we'll get to work, sir, the Marine asked. I've got a lot of wounded here. What work will we be doing, sir? We've come to take back Sigma Octonus IV from the Covenant, the Chief said calmly. To do that we're going to kill every last one of them. Inspiring words, Linda said to Matt over a private comm channel. We're going to need more than words to win this, said Matt. Post a guard on the dropship and put three on patrol, the chief said to Kelly. Take the rest and secure the LZ. Yes, Sir Kelly replied. She made three quick hand gestures and red and green teams dispersed. Kelly signaled to Matt and the rest to follow her. 
They searched through the remains of warthogs and the ruined buildings for any sign of survivors. All they found were the bodies of Marines and Covenant alike. Blue Team, RV at the bunker for orders, said the chief over the comm. Before Matt could take a step, he saw Linda grab his arm. She wouldn't be coming with Blue Team because she was the leader of Green Team for this mission. Promise me you'll be careful, she said over a private comm channel. I'll be careful, Linda. I always am. Linda nodded and swiped the two-finger Spartan smile gesture over his faceplate. Matt was surprised for a split second because Linda had never done that before. He returned the gesture. Matt, Kelly, Fred, and James double-timed back to the chief's position where he explained the plan. Blue 2, you're carrying the medical gear, the chief said to Kelly. Blue 5, you have the nuke. Matt nodded. Who will have the detonator, sir? Kelly asked. I will, the chief replied. Blue 3, you have the explosives. James, you'll take our extra comm gear. They finished loading up their equipment and moved into the jungles with James in the lead. They were about a quarter of the way there when the chief told them to hold their position. Matt assumed that James had found something, but he didn't know what. Blue team, enemy contact confirmed, said the chief after he got his status report from James. Matt gripped his MA5B tighter. Let's take them out, blue team, said the chief. They crept into the brush and watched the Covenant patrol as it approached their position. The chief waved blue team back a bit so the patrol wouldn't notice them. They're 70 meters from this depression, said the chief. A NAV marker appeared on Matt's HUD indicating its location. The chief went over his ambush plan. James would be their scout while Kelly took the overwatch position. Matt and Fred would follow the chief in with their silencers on their rifles and hopefully catch them off guard. They took their positions with Matt trailing the chief and Fred. The chief went ahead and took out the point men and Matt saw a couple of strobe flashes, then the rear grunts dropped dead. Hit them the chief barked over the comm. Matt and Fred leaped out of their cover and hosed the grunts with 7.62mm rounds, shattering their methane tanks. In less than two minutes, the patrol was dead. Kelly policed their weapons and handed each of the Spartans a plasma pistol. They moved out and inside an hour they reached the rice paddies on the edge of the city. They crawled through the mud of the paddies to try and reduce their profile so the troop ships hovering over the city wouldn't notice them. Matt had to stop three times to clean the muck off his faceplate. They arrived on the beach outside the city and made their way into the sewer system then deeper into the city. Blue team wadded through the hip-deep sewage, single file due to the cramped tube. Thankfully the MKIV's air scrubbers filtered out the stench, otherwise, Matt would have collapsed from the smell. Blue team continued through the maze of tunnels until they arrived under downtown. The chief climbed one of the manholes and snaked his fiber optic probe through the cover to have a look around. Matt and the others stayed there until he returned and got an update from red and green teams. Matt listened in on the feed, apparently, Linda's team had found survivors at the docks and the chief gave the order to evac them to the LZ. When he was finished he turned to Matt. Blue 5, break out the nuke and arm it. Matt complied and took out the small half-sphere from his pack and carefully removed the adhesive strips from the back of the device, then he stuck it to the concrete. Matt removed a small glass card with a keypad on it, he entered the arming code but hesitated for a moment before sliding it into the device. When he finished with the nuke the chief briefed them about the covenant in the museum. Master Chief, Kelly whispered, Our orders, sir. We're going in he replied over the comm. Use silencers. Don't engage the enemy unless absolutely necessary. This place is too hot. We'll just poke our noses in, see what they're doing then bug out. Matt and the others quickly threaded the silencers on their MA5BS then followed the chief until they were right under the museum. Fred burned through a service hatch and the Spartans climbed through and into the museum. Picking up motion sensor signals, said Kelly. Jam them, ordered the chief. Done, but they may have gotten a piece of us though, she replied. Spread out, the chief ordered. Get ready to jump back into the hole if things get too hot. Otherwise, initiate standard search and destroy. Matt quickly flashed his acknowledgement light then blended into the shadows just as four jackals entered the room with their shields on. They began looking around the room and one of them looked right at Matt but thankfully didn't see him. Matt didn't have a shot because the jackals were using their shields but this wasn't a problem as John came up behind one of them and slid its throat. The other three jackals spun around to face the chief, which exposed their unshielded backs to Matt. There were several muffled coughs from silenced MA5BS and the remaining jackals were down. 
The chief retrieved the shield generators from their arms and passed them out to the team. Matt didn't take one when he was offered it and insisted that he give it to James. Kelly took point and signaled it was clear ahead. The rest of the Spartans followed her up and into the main floor of the museum. As they walked along the floor they didn't come across any more jackals, but then Fred waved them over to something. They went over to his position and saw a jackal that had apparently been crushed by a giant boot. Talk about roadkill, Matt said. The chief led them over to the geology section and he snaked a fiber optic probe around the corner and then quickly retrieved it. He motioned for the team to join him at the entrance when they were in position he stepped into the room with Matt and Fred on his left and Kelly and James on his right. Matt hesitated for a moment out of pure fear because standing in the room were two vaguely man-taped creatures. They stood two and a half meters tall. It was difficult to make out their features, they were covered from head to toe with a dull blue-gray armor, similar to the hull of a Covenant ship. Blue, orange, and yellow highlights were visible on the few patches of exposed skin the creatures sported. They had slits where their eyes should be. The articulation points looked impregnable. On their left arms, they hefted large shields, thick as starship battle plate. Mounted on their right arms were massive, wide-barreled weapons, so large that the arm beneath seemed to blend into the weapon. Matt quickly pushed his fear aside and opened fire with the rest of the team, but their bullets didn't do a thing against their armor. One of them raised their right arm and green light began to form at the tip. Get down Matt screamed into the calm, but it was too late, the creature fired right at Kelly and James. Kelly managed to dodge it just in time but James was nowhere to be seen. The other creature's cannon was charged and pointed it at the others. John and Fred raised their shields and Matt dived out of the way just as the high-intensity plasma shot over him and hit John's shield which set him flying out of the room.